An Adventure in the Fourth Dimension by Farnsworth Wright From Weird Tales, October 1923 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman An Adventure in the Fourth Dimension by Farnsworth Wright the thought of meteors terrifies me they have a disagreeable habit of coming down and killing people at the most inopportune times that is why i was so startled when i saw a large object hurtling toward me out of the sky as i was walking along the lakefront recently in my city of chicago i shivered this was the end i began to say my prayers to my astonishment the onrushing missile struck the grass beside me without the slightest jar i gasped thousands of singular objects began to detach themselves they bounded from the mass and suddenly increased in size from one inch to three feet in diameter they were entirely round and covered with teeth on each tooth were ten ears constantly in motion each ear carried a quizzical eye the dwarfish creatures rolled rapidly on the ground the ears serving as legs hands tentacles and what not propelling them with incredible speed sometimes they stood on only four or five of their ears then suddenly pressed hard against the ground with a half a thousand ears at once thus bounding high into the air they lit without jar for the ears acted as shock absorbers and broke their fall surely these are explorers from mars or venus i thought as the funny bounding creatures filled the air you are wrong they are jupiterian said a voice behind me i recognized the voice it was professor nutt you probably know him ahem <clears throat> he said ahem ahem and once more he repeated ahem interesting if true i remarked and what might jupiterians be they might be men but they're not he snapped they are people from the planet jupiter out of your ignorance you thought they were martians or venusians but you are wrong for mars and venus have people of three dimensions like ourselves jupiterians are entirely different there are six hundred thousand of them in this jupiterian airship i was so overjoyed at finding someone who could tell me about them that i didn't think to ask him how he knew all these startling facts where is the airship you speak of i asked there it is he answered rather grandiloquently and pointed to the empty spot on the grass i looked carefully and made out a vast transparent globe apparently of glass which was rapidly becoming visible because of the chicago dust that was settling upon it i approached and touched it with my hand it gave forth a metallic ring ah laughed the professor you thought it was glass but it is made of jupiterian steel look out i sprang back at his warning and the last hundred thousand leapt out of the globe passing right through the transparent metal of which it was composed nom de mademoiselle i exclaimed in astonishment this is a swear word i had learned in france when i was in the army nom de mademoiselle i repeated for i like to show off my knowledge of language how can they pass through the glass without breaking it through the jupiterian steel you mean said professor nutt severely i told you before that it is not glass jupiterian steel has four dimensions and they pass through the fourth dimension that's why you can't see the metal for your eyes are only three-dimensional are the jupiterian people four-dimensional i said awed certainly said nutt rather irritably then how can i see them I exclaimed triumphantly you see only three of their four dimensions he replied the other one is inside I turned to look again at the Jupiterians who now covered the whole waterfront 
One of them sprang lightly, fifty feet into the air, extended a hundred ears like tentacles, and seized an English sparrow. He crushed the sparrow with some score or more of his teeth, which, as I have said, covered his whole body. In less than a minute the poor bird was chewed to pieces. I looked closer and saw that the Jupiterian had no mouth. Nom de mademoiselle, I exclaimed for the third time. How can it get the bird into its stomach? Through the fourth dimension, said Professor Nutt. It was true. The chewed-up pieces of the bird were suddenly tossed into the air, and the Jupiterian sprang lightly after them. In mid-air he turned inside out, caught the pieces of the bird in his stomach, and lit on the grass again, right side up with care. "'Did you see that?' I exclaimed in a hushed voice. "'Why can't I turn inside out that way?' "'Because you are not four-dimensional,' replied the professor, a trace of annoyance in his voice. "'It is a beautiful thing to have four dimensions,' he rhapsodized. "'Your Jupiterian is your only true intellectual, for he alone can truly reflect. He turns his gaze in upon himself.' and sees what he had for breakfast i gasped and what his neighbors had too your questions are childish said the professor wearily a jupiterian of course can look into the soul of things and see what his neighbors had for breakfast as you so vulgarly expressed it but jupiterians turn their thoughts to higher things the creatures now surrounded me their ears turned inward as if they were supplicating what do they want i asked the professor they want something to drink he replied they are pointing their ears toward their stomachs to show that they are thirsty oh i said and pointed toward the lake there is the fresh cool water of the lake if they're thirsty don't be fantastic said professor nutt it isn't water they want he turned his stern pitiless gaze on my hip pocket I turned pale, for it was my last pint. But I had to submit. If you have ever had Professor Nutt's cold, accusing eyes on you, you will know just how I felt. I drew the flask from my pocket and handed it to the chief Jupiterian, who waggled his ears in joy. Immediately there was pandemonium, if you know what I mean. Ten thousand times ten thousand ears seized the cork and pulled it out in a resounding pop. One thirsty Jupiterian passed right through the glass into the bottle in his eagerness to get at the contents, and nearly drowned for his pains. "'You see how useful it is to be four-dimensional?' remarked the professor. "'You can get into any cellar in the world merely by passing through the walls, and into any beer keg in the same way.' "'But,' I argued, "'how did this—' this insect get through the glass into the whiskey bottle the glass is only three-dimensional like everything else in this world don't call him an insect nut sharply reprimanded me he is a jupiterian and as such he is infinitely superior to you and me he passed through the glass because he is four-dimensional even though the glass isn't if you had four dimensions you could untie any knot by merely passing it through itself. You could turn inside out, or pass through yourself until your right hand became your left hand, and change into your own image as you flee it in the looking glass. No, de mademoiselle, I exclaimed for the fourth time. A distant noise of barking was borne to my ears by the breeze. All the dogs in the city seemed to have gone wild. They are disturbed by the talking of Jupiterians, explained the professor. It is too high pitched for clod hopper human ears to hear, unless they have unusual range, but the dogs can hear it plainly. I listened and finally made out a very shrill humming, higher than any sound I had ever heard before in my life, and infinitely sweet and piercing. Ah, I am hearing four dimensional sounds, I thought aloud wrong as usual exacerbated the professor with much heat 
sound has no dimensions it proceeds in waves and bends back upon itself until it meets itself at an infinite distance from the starting point there are three reasons you can't hear the music of the spheres first because it is bent away from the earth by the force of gravity as it passes the Sun second because your ears are not attuned to so shrill a sound and third because there is no music of the seers the first two reasons are really unnecessary in the light of the third but a scientific mind such as mine is not content with one reason when three can be adducted just as easily shades of sir oliver lodge i ejaculated sir oliver is alive the professor corrected me a man does not become a shade until after his death then he becomes a four-dimensional creature like the jupiterians only different nom de mademoiselle i commented say something sensible he reprimanded me for the love of einstein how do you know all these things about the jupiterians i ask a sudden suspicion flashing across what i am pleased to call my mind ah einstein yes exclaimed nut greatly pleased my mother's father's name was einstein then you are related to no i am not related he interrupted but my mother's father is a sort of fourth dimensional relationship i suppose i replied sarcastically at that moment the air became vibrant with an invisible sound the jupiterians came rolling from all directions as if they had suddenly heard the dinner bell they bounded through the jupiterian steel of the globe and immediately shrank in size from three feet to one inch the jupiterian assembly call just blew explained the professor notice how the passengers draw into themselves six hundred thousand are now packed into that globe our elevated railroads miss a great opportunity by not having four-dimensional creatures to deal with they pack us in just as tight i ventured to remark the globe had begun to shoot into the air when there came from behind me a high-pitched wail of distress a shriller and higher sound than had ever before been heard by human ears so the professor assured me the chief jupiterian had been left behind he it was who had passed into the whiskey bottle not content with getting the lion's share of the contents he had surrounded the bottle in his pleasant four-dimensional way and now he could not get rid of it why doesn't he turn inside out and drop the bottle i asked watching the jupiterian with interest because your whiskey has paralyzed him answered the professor he is quite helpless i looked at the globe which had alighted again each jupiterian suddenly resumed his full size in a brave attempt to bound to the assistance of his chief but the creatures could no longer pass through the four-dimensional metal of which the globe was composed so thick a layer of chicago dust had settled upon it that to all intents and purposes it had become three-dimensional the sudden impact of six hundred thousand bodies caused it to burst with a roar as of a hundred peals of thunder exploding simultaneously the air was filled with dead and dying jupiterians a dark cloud settled over the landscape composed by the flying dust shaken from the jupiterian globe by the explosion long streamers of electric fire shot from the fragments of the airship and seemed to curve in upon themselves everything ran in curves the darkness the cloud the sounds the shaft of light as if bent by the force of gravity i put up my hands and fought the cloud that was settling down upon me i seemed to be covered with falling feathers when the cloud began to lift i found myself in my own parlor the air was full of flying leaves which i was madly tearing from the book and throwing toward the ceiling the book was a treatise on einstein theory of space which i had borrowed from a friend that afternoon i had read nearly a page in it before i fell asleep 
Only twelve men in the world understand the Einstein theory, it is said. If I had read the book, I would have been the thirteenth, and that would have been unlucky. So it is just as well that it is destroyed. But what excuse am I going to give my friend for tearing up his book? The End of An Adventure in the Fourth Dimension By Farnsworth Wright Lost Art by G. K. Hawk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins. Lost Art by G. K. Hawk. Stiff fingers of icy wind driven snow beat a tattoo on the hull of the cargo ship filtered through the jagged tears in the metal skin, sifted down over the useless control board with its dead gauges and bank upon bank of push-buttons. A midship, a wind-thrashed branch, screechingly scraped a reverberating hull, and the sound, like the rasp of sliding hatch covers, echoed through the ship. Dazedly, Allison watched the sifting snow settle on the buttons, each one acquiring a grotesque, lopsided, conical hat which grew as he stared. He reached forward an already stiffening finger and brushed one of the hats away and almost idly watched another form in its place. Come on, Allison. Come on, snap out of it. Endicott came out of the passageway into the control room, returned from his inspection of the machinery. You hurt in the landing? Allison didn't answer. He shivered and pushed another inquisitive finger at the control board. The finger selected a certain button and pushed it steadily. There was no click of a hidden relay, no whir of little mortars springing to life. You can push that button or any of the others from now until... It won't do any good. We're dead. The plume of Endicott's frozen breath drifted over Allison's shoulder, merged with the sifting snow. Dead? Allison echoed in a sleepwalker's voice. Dead? He repeated and jabbed the button again and again. In a manner of speaking... Endicott's white sandy brows drew together in a frown. We're off the power cast, our receiver, I guess. No power? Allison was following better, was waking up. That means... Can't you fix it, Chief? Nope, I tried, but something in its guts has burned out. No power. Endicott beat his old blue-veined hands together. Allison's frost-numbed hands picked at the straps of his reclining G-seat. He stepped to the light metal deck. He shivered and pushed the buttons on the control board again. He was seized by a spasm of uncontrollable shaking. No power means no heat. Panic crept into his voice. Endicott said nothing, but looked at the tier upon tier of buttons, functionalist now. Allison looked at the board, too, his narrow shoulders hunched. They've never failed before, he muttered through chattering teeth. What? Endicott seemed to be mused. The buttons. Punch them, and you always get what you want. Except now. Now, now, Endicott said soothingly. Panic isn't going to help us any. All we have to do is sit tight and wait. They'll send a relief ship out. When? In the morning. Morning, sure. They had us on the viewer, don't forget. They'll know exactly where to look. They won't be able to locate us in all this white stuff. I tell you, they know precisely where we are. And anyway, the scan viewer will pick it up. I don't think they'll ever find us. Allison slumped down in his transverse G-seat, stared wide-eyed at the drift forming slowly inside the torn metal of the windward side of the control room. This white stuff scares me. He shivered, then got up hastily, his boots slipping slightly on the snow-slick decking, and punched the button again. It's got to work, he cried, and beat on the board with his fist. Stop that, Endicott said sharply. There was a crack of a slap on the control room, then silence. In a moment, Endicott said in his soothing voice, Sorry, Allison, everything will be all right. Don't you worry. If you say so, Chief, Allison stood in the center of the control room, his arms slack by his sides. We'll be all right, Endicott said. We have food capsules. Sure, Chief. 
We'll be all right, except... Endicott peered through the rents in the hole into the storm outside. All we have to do is sit tight, he added hastily. We'll freeze tonight without heat. Allison's voice was still breathless with panic. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that. There's something way down deep in my mind, something I can't quite get. Endicott still looked out at the storm-thrashed trees, a puzzled expression wrinkling his face. Something from my childhood. I was born a long time before you. You know, before they set up state conditioning homes for children, long before they set up this everything-from-buttons business. Lived with my own people, I did. And I seem to remember, seem to remember. That puzzled expression became a frown of concentration. Or maybe it was something I read a long time ago, he mused. Did what? Allison perked up. Read. You wouldn't know what that was. Everything comes from buttons now. Entertainment, food, light, heat, everything. No, it was from my childhood, I'm sure. I remember my people used to take me out in the country. Endicott mused on while a cloak of snow grew on the shoulder of his jacket and the light began to fade. Out in the country? What for? Nobody goes out there. Allison's eyes gleamed slightly in the growing dusk. For picnics and... Endicott's eyes brightened and one hand clenched. For what? Allison's head thrust forward. What? Endicott snapped, irritated at having his train of thought broken. What did your people take you in the country for? A picnic. Yes, yes, that's it. I remember now. Endicott's words poured out. You know it's forbidden to think of the old days. Shut up. Let me think. You want heat, don't you? It's forbidden to think of the old days, Allison repeated stubbornly. You'll get heat when I report this. In a different way. Shut up. Look, you want to keep from freezing tonight? Endicott glared. All right, come with me and do as I say. Without a backward glance, Endicott crossed the slippery deck and entered the passageway. At the midship cargo hatch, he stopped. How are you going to open it without power? Allison's breath plume shot over Endicott's shoulder. It's locked and unlocked by a button on the control board. Remember, Chief? Stop gloating, Allison. This is for your benefit as well as mine. There's an escape hatch in the control room. That's controlled by power, too. Yes, but in these old models, the hatch also has a manual control, as I remember. Endicott moved off toward the control room. Allison hesitated, then followed, and joined Endicott as he began to search the control board. Endicott found the emergency lever for the escape hatch and tugged on it, turning his head to watch the hatch in the side of the hole, back to his seat. The hatch, big enough for one man to pass through at a time, popped, crackling with frost and stirred slightly. Now, Allison, my boy, let's put our shoulders to it. Endicott was in high spirits again. As soon as the hatch swung open, Endicott put his head and shoulders through the opening, squirming his eyes against the icy snow which swirled past him. He grabbed a handhold on the outside of the hull and pulled his legs through and dropped into the snow alongside the ship. Allison's head and shoulders appeared in the opening, and in a moment he was beside Endicott. Now what? Allison yelled above the wind. Endicott looked toward the clearing in which they had landed, then turned to face the trees around the disabled ship. He waded through the snow to the nearest one and reflectively took a hold of a dry branch over his head, tugged it several times as though judging its resilience before snapping it off. Now, Allison, you see what I did? Well, you did the same, only gather an armload of branches. When you have them, bring them to me at the ship and keep gathering them until I tell you to stop. Allison stood in deep snow, peering suspiciously at Endicott through the snow swirl. Is this something from the old? Never mind that now, Allison, Endicott said patiently. Let's not worry about all that twaddle. You want to be warm, don't you? So just do as I say. Allison's eyebrows shot up and lowered instantly, and his face set in stubborn planes. If this is from the old days, I'm not sure I want any part of it. He looked furtively over his shoulder at the gloomy woods. There's no conditioning committee here, Allison, Endicott said testily. Get on with it. Allison took a few reluctant steps towards the nearest tree. Endicott started back to the ship with his branch, looking back over his shoulder. No, no, Allison, see those green needles? It won't do at all. Dry branches, Allison, dry branches. 
The whipping wind carried Endicott's words over the few yards. I can't see how these branches are going to keep us warm. Seems like a lot of useless trouble getting them, Allison said sulkily, suspicion and fear unabated. Endicott didn't answer. Instead, he went to the side of the ship away from the wind and began tamping the snow down into a flat, hard floor. He broke his branch into short lengths over his knee. Then, in a nearly forgotten gesture, slapped at his uniform until he remembered that he had no pockets. For a moment, he stood still, his eyes roving over the side of the ship until it came to one of the jagged terrors. With a little self-congratulatory chuckle, he began scraping one of the lengths of wood over the torn metal, catching the splinters and shavings in the palm of one hand. Allison dropped his armload of branches by the ship, waged an inner battle between fear of the unknown and curiosity, in which curiosity won, and stood watching Endicott arrange the branches in a crib around the neatly piled shavings. Endicott, on one knee by the crib, worked steadily, laying the pieces of wood with care and a returning sense of sureness, with only a brief pause to flex his freezing fingers. Finally, with a smile of satisfaction on his face, Endicott got to his feet and the nearly forgotten gesture at the pocketless uniform was repeated. Slowly, Endicott's lined face altered. He looked hastily at the watchful Allison and hastily looked away. He looked at the completed crib and his tongue licked his lips. He looked along the side of the damaged ship and his eyes narrowed thoughtfully. Finally, he looked into the swirl of the icy snow and he shivered. His hands ceased their pawing fell slowly to hang slack by his sides. He was not smiling as he turned away. What were you looking for? Allison asked curiously. I just remembered something else, said Endicott. His voice was very soft with the stillness. We used to have something called a match to start those fires. End of Lost Art by G. K. Hawk Recorded by James Jenkins, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania The Altar at Midnight by C. M. Cornbluth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Rogers. The Altar at Midnight by C. M. Cornbluth. He had quite a rum blossom on him for a kid, I thought at first. But when he moved closer to the light by the cash register to ask the bartender for a match or something, I saw it wasn't that. Not just the nose. Broken veins on his cheeks, too. And the funny eyes. He must have seen me look, because he slid back away from the light. The bartender shook my bottle of ale in front of me like a Swiss bell ringer, so it foamed inside the green glass. You ready for another, sir? he asked. I shook my head. Down the bar, he tried it on the kid. He was drinking scotch and water or something like that, and found he could push him around. He sold him three scotch and waters in ten minutes. But when he tried for number four, the kid had his courage up and said, I'll tell you when I'm ready for another, Jack. But there wasn't any trouble. It was almost nine and the place began to fill up. The manager, a real hood type, stationed himself by the door to screen out the high school kids and give the big hello to conventioneers. The girls came hurrying in, too, with their little makeup cases and their fancy hair piled up and their frozen faces with the perfect mouths drawn on them. One of them stopped to say something to the manager, some excuse about something, and he said, That's all right. Get in the dressing room. A three-piece band behind the drapes at the back of the stage began to make warm-up noises, and there were two bartenders keeping busy. Mostly it was beer, a midweek crowd. I finished my ale and had to wait a couple of minutes before I could get another bottle. The bar filled up from the end near the stage because all the customers wanted a good close look at the strippers for their 50-cent bottles of beer. But I noticed that nobody sat down next to the kid, or, if anybody did, he didn't stay long. You go out for some fun, and the bartender pushes you around, and nobody wants to sit next to you. I picked up my bottle and glass and went down on the stool to his left. He turned to me right away and said, What kind of place is this, anyway? The broken veins were all over his face, little ones, but so many, so close, that they made his face look something like marbled rubber. 
The funny look in his eyes was it, the trick contact lenses. But I tried not to stare and not to look away. It's okay, I said. It's a good show if you don't mind a lot of noise from. He stuck a cigarette into his mouth and poked the pack at me. I'm a spacer, he said, interrupting. I took one of the cigarettes and said, oh. He snapped the lighter for the cigarettes and said, Venus. I was noticing that his pack of cigarettes on the bar had some kind of yellow sticker instead of the blue tax stamp. Ain't that a crock, he asked. You can't smoke and they give you lighters for a souvenir. But it's a good lighter. On Mars last week, they gave us all some cheap pen and pencil sets. You get something every trip, huh? I took a good long drink of ale and he finished his scotch and water. Shoot. You call a trip a shoot. One of the girls was working her way down the bar. She was going to slide onto the empty stool at his right and give him the business, but she looked at him first and decided not to. She curled around me and asked if I'd buy her a little drink. I said no, and she moved on to the next. I could kind of feel the young fellow quivering. When I looked at him, he stood up. I followed him out of the dump. The manager grinned without thinking and said, Good night, boys, to us. The kid stopped in the street and said to me, You don't have to follow me around, pappy. He sounded like one wrong word and I would get socked in the teeth. Take it easy. I know a place where they won't spit in your eye. He pulled himself together and made a joke of it. This I have to see, he said. Near here? A few blocks. We started walking. It was a nice night. I don't know this city at all, he said. I'm from Covington, Kentucky. You do your drinking at home there. You don't have places like this. He meant the whole Skid Row area. It's not so bad, I said. I spend a lot of time here. Is that a fact? I mean, down home a man your age would likely have a wife and children. I do. To hell with them. He laughed like a real youngster, and I figured he couldn't even be 25. He didn't have any trouble with the broken curbstones in spite of his scotch and waters. I asked him about it. Since the balance, he said. You have to be tops for balance to be a spacer. You spend so much time outside in a suit. People don't know how much. Punctures. And you aren't worth a damn if you lose your point. What's that mean? Oh, well, it's hard to describe. When you're outside and you lose your point, it means you're all mixed up. You don't know which way the can, that's the ship, which way the can is. It's having all that room around you. But if you have a good balance, you feel a little tugging to the ship. Or maybe you just know which way the ship is without feeling it. Then you have your point and you can get the work done. There must be a lot that's hard to describe. He thought that might be a crack and he clammed up on me. You call this Gandy Town, I said after a while. It's where the stove-up old railroad men hang out. This is the place. It was the second week of the month before everyone's pension check was gone. Oswiax was jumping. The grandsons of the pioneers were on the juke singing, Man from Mars Yodel, and old Patty Shea was jigging in the middle of the floor. He had a full seidel of beer in his right hand, and his empty left sleeve was flapping. The kid balked at the screen door. Too damn bright, he said. I shrugged and went on in, and he followed. We sat down at the table. At Oswiax, you can drink at the bar if you want to, but none of the regulars do. Patty jigged over and said, Welcome home, Doc. He's a Liverpool Irishman. They talk like Scots, some say, but they sound almost like Brooklyn to me. Hello, Patty. I brought somebody uglier than you. Now what do you say? Patty jigged around the kid in a half circle with his sleeve flapping and then flopped into a chair when the record stopped. He took a big drink from the sidle and said, Can he do this? Patty stretched his face into an awful grin that showed his teeth. He has three of them. The kid laughed and asked me, What the hell did you drag me into here for? Patty says he'll buy drinks for the house the day anybody uglier than he is comes in. Oswiak's wife waddled over for the order, and the kid asked us what we'd have. I figured I could start drinking, so it was three double scotches. After the second round, Patty started blowing about how they took his arm off without any anesthetics, except a bottle of gin, because the red ball freight he was tangled up in couldn't wait. That brought some of the other old gimps over to the table with their stories. 
Blackie Bauer had been sitting in a boxcar with his legs sticking through the door when the train started with a jerk. Wham! The door closed. Everybody laughed at Blackie for being that dumb in the first place, and he got mad. Sam Fireman has palsy. This week he was claiming he used to be a watchmaker before he began to shake. The week before, he'd said he was a brain surgeon. A woman I didn't know, a real old boxcar Bertha, dragged herself over and began some kind of story about how her sister married a Greek, but she passed out before we found out what happened. Somebody wanted to know what was wrong with the kid's face. Bauer, I think it was, after he came back to the table. Compression and decompression, the kid said. You're all the time climbing into your suit and out of your suit. Inboard air is thin to start with. You get a few red lines. That's these ruptured blood vessels. And you say the hell with the money. All you'll make is just one more trip. But God, it's a lot of money for anybody my age. You keep saying that until you can't be anything but a spacer. The eyes are hard radiation scars. You like that all over? Asked Azuak's wife politely. All over, ma'am, the kid told her in a miserable voice. But I'm going to quit before I get a bowman head. I don't care, said Maggie Rorty. I think he's cute. Compared with, Patty began, but I kicked him under the table. We sang for a while, and then we told gags and recited limericks for a while, and I noticed that the kid and Maggie had wandered into the back room, the one with the latch on the door. Azuak's wife asked me, very puzzled, Doc, why they do that flank by planets? It's a damn government, Sam Fireman said. Why not, I said. They got the Bowman Drive. Why the hell shouldn't they use it? Serves them right. I had a double scotch and added. Twenty years of it, and they found out a few things they didn't know. Red lines are only one of them. Twenty more years, maybe they'll find out a few more things they didn't know. Maybe by the time there's a bathtub in every American home and an alcoholism clinic in every American town, they'll find out a whole lot of things they didn't know. And every American boy will be a pop-eyed, blood-rattled wreck, like our friend here, from writing the Bowman Drive. It's the damn government, Sam Fireman repeated. And what the hell did you mean by that remark about alcoholism, Patty said, real sore. Personally, I can take it or leave it alone. So we got to talking about that, and everybody there turned out to be people who could take it or leave it alone. It was maybe midnight when the kid showed at the table again, looking kind of dazed. I was drunker than I ought to be by midnight, so I said I was going for a walk. He tagged along, and we wound up on a bench at Screwball Square. The soapboxers were still going strong. Like I said, it was a nice night. After a while, a pot-bellied old auntie who didn't give a damn about the face sat down and tried to talk the kid into going to see some etchings. The kid didn't get it, and I led him over to hear the soapboxers before there was trouble. One of the orators was a mush-mouthed evangelist. And, oh, my friends, he said, when I looked through the porthole of the spaceship and beheld the wonder of the firmament? You're a stinking Yankee liar, the kid yelled at him. You say one more damn word about can shooting and I'll ram your spaceship down your lion throat. Where's your red lines if you're such a hot spacer? The crowd didn't know what he was talking about, but where's your red lines sounded good to them, so they heckled Mushmouth off his box with it. I got the kid to a bench. The liquor was working in him all of a sudden. He simmered down after a while and said, Doc, should I have given Miss Rorty some money? I asked her afterward. She said she'd admire to have something to remember me by, so I gave her my lighter. She seemed to be real pleased with it, but I was wondering if maybe I embarrassed her by asking her right out. Like I told you, back in Covington, Kentucky, we don't have places like that. Or maybe we did and I just didn't know about them. But what do you think I should have done about Ms. Rorty? Just what you did, I told him. If they want money, they ask you for it first. Where are you staying? YMCA, he said, almost asleep. Back in Covington, Kentucky, I was a member of the Y, and I kept up my membership. They have to let me in because I'm a member. Spacers have all kinds of trouble, Doc. Woman trouble, hotel trouble, family trouble, religious trouble. I was raised a Southern Baptist, but where's heaven anyway? I asked Doc Chitwood last time home before the red lines got so thick. Doc, you aren't a minister of the gospel, are you? I hope I didn't say anything to offend you. No offense, son, I said, no offense. I walked him to the avenue and waited for a fleet cab. It took almost five minutes. 
The independents that roll drunks stent the fenders of fleet cabs if they show up in skid row, and then the fleet drivers have to make reports on their own time to the company. It keeps them away. But I got one and dumped the kid in. The Y Hotel, I told the driver. Here's five. Help him in when you get there. When I walked through Screwball Square again, some colleagues were yelling, Where's your red lines? at old Charlie, the last of the Wobblies. Old Charlie kept roaring, The hell with your bread lines! I'm talking about atomic bombs! Right up there! And he pointed at the moon. It was a nice night, but the liquor was dying in me. There was a joint around the corner, so I went in and had a drink to carry me to the club. I had a bottle there. I got into the first cab that came. Athletic club, I said. In a doghouse, huh? The driver said, and he gave me a big personality smile. I didn't say anything, and he started the car. He was right, of course. I was in everybody's doghouse. Someday I'd scare a hell out of Tom and Lee's by going home and showing them what their daddy looked like. Down at the Institute, I was in the doghouse. Oh dear, everyone at the Institute said to everybody. I'm sure I don't know what ails the man. A lovely wife and two lovely grown children, and she had to tell him, either you go or I go. And drinking? And this is rather subtle, but it's a well-known fact that neurotics seek out low company to compensate for their guilt feelings. Places he frequents. Dr. Francis Bowman, the man who made spaceflight a reality. The man who put the bomb base on the moon. Really, I'm sure I don't know what ails him. The hell with them all. End of The Altar at Midnight by C.M. Kornbluth Read by Jeff Rogers Watch the Sky by James H. Schmitz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sebastian Levine Watch the Sky by James H. Schmitz Uncle William Bowles war-battered old geest gun gave the impression that at some stage of its construction it had been pulled out of shape and then hardened in that form. What remained of it was all of one piece. The scarred and pitted twin barrels were stubby and thick, and the vacant oblong in the frame behind them might have contained standard energy magazines. It was the stock which gave the alien weapon its curious appearance. Almost eighteen inches long, it curved abruptly to the right and was too thin, knobbed, and indented to fit comfortably at any point in a human hand. Over half a century had passed since, with the webbed, boneless fingers of its original owner closed about it, it last spat deadly radiation at human foemen. Now it hung among Uncle William's other collected oddities on the wall above the living room fireplace. And today, Phil Bowles thought, squinting at the gun with reflectively narrowed eyes, some eight years after Uncle William's death, the old war souvenir would quietly become a key factor in the solution of a colonial planet's problems. He ran a finger over the dull, roughened frame, bent closer to study the neatly lettered inscription, Gunderland Battle Trophy, Anno 2172, Sergeant William G. Bowles. Then, catching a familiar series of clicking noises from the hall, he straightened quickly and turned away. When Aunt Beulah's go-chair came rolling back into the room, Phil was sitting at the low tea table, his back to the fireplace. The go-chair's wide, flexible treads carried it smoothly down the three steps to the sunken section of the living room, Beulah sitting jauntily erect in it for all the ninety-six years which had left her the last survivor of the original group of earth settlers on the world of Roy. She tapped her fingers here and there on the chair's armrests, swinging it deftly about, and brought it to a stop beside the tea table. "'That was Susan Feeney calling,' she reported. "'And there is somebody else for you who thinks I have to be taken care of. Go ahead and finish the pie, Phil. Can't hurt a husky man like you.' Got a couple more baking for you to take along. Phil grinned. That'd be worth the trip up from Fort Roy all by itself. Beulah looked pleased. Not much else I can do for my great-grandnephew nowadays, is there? Phil said after a moment, Have you given any further thought to moving down to Fort Roy? Beulah pursed her thin lips. Goodness, Phil, I do hate to disappoint you again, but I'd be completely out of place in a town apartment. Dr. Fitzsimmons would be pleased, Phil remarked. Oh, him. Fitz is another old worrywart. What he wants is to get me into the hospital. Nothing doing. Phil shook his head helplessly, laughed. <laughs> After all, working at Tupa Ranch, nonsense. The ranch is just enough bother to be interesting. The appliances do everything anyway, and Susan is down here every morning for a chat and to make sure I'm still all right. She won't admit that, of course, but if she thinks something should be taken care of, the whole Feeney family shows up an hour later to do it. There's really no reason for you to be sending a dozen men up from Fort Roy every two months to harvest the Tupa. Phil shrugged. 
No one's ever yet invented an easy way to dig up those roots. And the CLU's glad to furnish the men. Because you're its president? Uh-huh. It really doesn't cost you anything? Beulah asked doubtfully. Not a cent. Hmm. Been meaning to ask you, what made you set up that colonial labor union? Phil nodded. That's the official name. Why did you set it up in the first place? That's easy to answer, Phil said. On the day the planetary population here touched the 40,000 mark, Roy became legally entitled to its labor union. Why not take advantage of it? What's the advantage? More Earth money coming in, for one thing. Of the 1,200 CLU members we've got in Fort Roy now, 76% were unemployed this month. We'll have a compensation check from the territorial office with the next trip coming in. He smiled at her expression. Sure, the boys could go back to the Tupa ranches, but not everyone likes that life as well as you and the Feenies. Earth government lets you get away with it? Beulah asked curiously. They used to be pretty tight-fisted. They still are, but it's the law. The territorial office also pays any CLU president's salary, incidentally. I don't draw too much at the moment, but that will go up automatically with the membership and my responsibilities. What responsibilities? We've set up a skeleton organization, Phil explained. Now, when Earth government decides eventually to establish a big military base here, they can run in a hundred thousand civilians in a couple of months, and everyone will be fitted into the pattern on Roy without trouble or confusion. That's really the reason for all the generosity. Beulah sniffed. Big base, my eye. There hasn't been six months since I set foot here that somebody wasn't talking about Fort Roy being turned into a Class A military base pretty soon. It'll never happen, Phil. Roy's a farm plan, and that's what it's going to stay. Phil's lips twitched. Well, don't give up hope. I'm not anxious for any changes, Beulah said. I like Roy the way it is. She peered at a button on the go chair's armrest, which had just begun to put out small, bright blue flashes of light. Pies are done, she announced. Phil, are you sure you can't stay for dinner? Phil looked at his watch, shook his head. I'd love to, but I really have to get back. Then I'll go wrap up the pies for you. Beulah swung the go chair around, sent it slithering up the stairs and out the door. Phil stood up quickly. He stepped over to the fireplace, opened his coat, and detached a flexible box-shaped object from the inner lining. He laid this object on the mantel, and turned one of three small knobs about its front edge to the right. The box promptly extruded a supporting leg from each of its four corners, pushed itself up from the mantel, and became a miniature table. Phil glanced at the door through which Beulah had vanished, listened a moment, then took the geest gun from the wall, laid it carefully on top of the device, and twisted the second dial. The odd-looking gun began to sink slowly down through the surface of Phil's instrument, like a rock disappearing in mud. Within seconds it vanished completely. Then, a moment later, it began to emerge from the box's underside. Phil let the geest gun drop into his hand, replaced it on the wall, turned the third knob. The box withdrew its supports and sank down to the mantel. Phil clipped it back inside his coat, closed the coat, and strolled over to the center of the room to wait for Aunt Pula to return with the pies. It was curious, Phil Bowles reflected as his air car moved out over the craggy, plunging coastline to the north some while later, that a few bold minds could be all that was needed to change the fate of a world. A few minds with imagination enough to see how circumstances about them might be altered. On his left, far below, was now the flat ribbon of the peninsula, almost at sea level, its tip widening and lifting into the broad, rocky promontory on which stood Fort Roy, the only thing on the planet bigger and of more significance than the shabby backwoods settlements. And Fort Roy was neither very big nor very significant. A Class F military base around which, over the years, a straggling town had come into existence, Fort Roy was a space-age trading post, linking Roy's population to the mighty mother planet, and a station from which the otherwise vacant and utterly unimportant 132nd segment of the space territories was periodically and uneventfully patrolled. It was no more than that. Twice a month, an Earth ship settled down to the tiny port, bringing supplies, purchases, occasional groups of reassigned military and civilians, the latter suspected of being drawn as a rule from Earth's undesirable classification. The ship would take off some days later, with a return load of the few local products for which there was outside demand, primarily the medically valuable tuba roots. And Fort Roy lay quiet again. The planet was not at fault. Essentially, it had what was needed to become a thriving colony in every sense. At fault was the Geist War. The war had periods of flare-up and periods in which it seemed to be subsiding. During the past decade, it had been subsiding again. One of the early flare-ups, one of the worst, and the one which brought the war closest to Earth itself, was the Gunderland battle in which Uncle William Bowles' trophy gun had been acquired. But the war never came near Roy. The action was all in the opposite section of the giant sphere of the space territories, and over the years the war drew steadily farther away. And Earth's vast wealth, its manpower, materials, and money, 
was pouring into space in the direction the Geist War was moving. Worlds not a tenth as naturally attractive as Roy, worlds where the basic condition for human life were just above the unbearable point, were settled and held, equipped with everything needed and wanted to turn them into independent giant fortresses, with a population not too dissatisfied with its lot. When Earth government didn't count the expense, life could be made considerably better than bearable almost anywhere. Those were the circumstances which condemned Roy to insignificance. Not everyone minded. Phil Bowles' native son did mind. His inclinations were those of an operator, and he was not being given an adequate opportunity to exercise them. Therefore, the circumstances would have to be changed, and the precise time to make the change was at hand. Phil himself was not aware of every factor involved, but he was aware of enough of them. Back on Earth, a certain political situation was edging towards a specific point of instability. As a result, an Earth ship, which was not one of the regular freighters, had put down at Fort Roy some days before. Among its passengers were Commissioner Sanford of the Territorial Office, a well-known politician, and a Mr. Ronald Black, the popular and enterprising owner of Earth's second-largest news outlet system. They were on a joint fact-finding tour of the thinly scattered colonies in this remote section of the territories, and had wound up eventually at the most remote of all, the 132nd segment and Roy. That was one factor. Just visible 20,000 feet below Phil, almost directly beneath him now as the R-car made its third leisurely crossing of the central belt of the peninsula, was another. From here it looked like an irregular brown circle against the peninsula's nearly white ground. Lower down it would have resembled nothing so much as the broken and half-decayed spirals of a gigantic snail shell, its base sunk deep in the ground and its shattered point rearing twelve stories above it. This structure, known popularly as the Ruins in Fort Roy, was supposed to have been the last stronghold of a semi-intelligent race native to Roy, which might have become extinct barely a century before the Earthmen arrived. A factor associated with this ruins again was that their investigation was the passionately pursued hobby of First Lieutenant Norman Vaughn, Fort Roy's science officer. Added to such things, the reason Roy was not considered in need of a serious defensive effort by Earth's strategists, the vast distances between it and any troubled area, and so the utter improbability that a geese ship might come close enough to discover that here was another world as well suited for its race as for human beings. And then a final factor, the instrument attached to the lining of Phil's coat, a very special camera which now carried the contact impressions made on it by Uncle William's souvenir gun. Put them all together, Phil thought cheerily, and they spelled out interesting developments on Roy in the very near future. He glanced at his watch again, swung the air car about, and started back inland. He passed presently high above Ampulus Tupa Ranch and that of the Feeney family two miles farther up the mountain, turned gradually to the east and twenty minutes later was edging back down the ranges to the coast. Here, in a wild, unfound region, Perched at the edge of a cliff dropping nearly nine hundred feet to the swirling tide was a small, trim cabin which was the property of a small, trim Fort Roy lady named Celia Adams. Celia had been shipped out from Earth six years before, almost certainly as an undesirable, though only the territorial office and Celia herself knew about that, the Botany Bay aspect of worlds like Roy being handled with some tact by Earth. Phil approached the cabin only as far as was necessary to make sure that the dark green air car parked before it was the one belonging to Major Wayne Jackson, the administration officer and second-in-command at Fort Roy, another native son and an old acquaintance. He then turned away, dropped to the woods ten miles south, and made a second inconspicuous approach under the cover of the trees. There might be casual observers in the area, and while his meeting with Jackson and Celia Adams today revealed nothing in itself, it would be better if no one knew about it. He grounded the car in the forest a few hundred yards from the Adams' cabin, slung a rifle over his shoulder, and set off along a game path. It was good hunting territory, and the rifle would explain his presence if he ran into somebody. When he came within view of the cabin, he discovered Celia and her visitor on the covered back patio, drinks standing before them. Jackson was in hunting clothes. Phil remained quietly back among the trees for some seconds watching the two, aware of something like a last-minute hesitancy. A number of things passed slowly through his mind. What they planned to do was no small matter. It was a hoax which should have far-reaching results, on a gigantic scale. And if Earth government realized it had been hoaxed, the thing could become very unpleasant. That tough-minded central bureaucracy did not ordinarily bother to obtain proof against those who suspected. The suspicion was enough. Individuals and groups whom the shadow of doubt touched found themselves shunted unobtrusively into some backwater of existence and kept there. It was supposed to be very difficult to emerge from such a position again. In the back of his mind, Phil had been conscious of that but it had seemed an insignificant threat against the excitement arising from the grandiose impudence of the plan, the perhaps rather small boyish delight at being able to put something over, profitably, on the greatest power of all. Even now it might have been only a natural wariness that brought the threat up for a final moment of reflection. He didn't, of course, want to incur Earth government's disapproval. But why believe that he might? On all Roy, there would be only three who knew, Wayne Jackson, 
Celia Adams, and himself. All three would benefit, each in a different way, and all would be equally responsible for the hoax. No chance of indiscretion or belated qualms there. Their own interest ruled it out in each case. And from the other men now involved, there was as little danger of betrayal. Their gain would be vastly greater, but they had correspondingly more to lose. They would take every step required to ensure their protection, and in doing that they would necessarily take the best of care of Phil Bowles. How did you ever get such a thing smuggled into Roy? Phil asked. He'd swallowed half the drink Celia offered him at a gulp, and now, a few minutes later, he was experiencing what might have been under different circumstances a comfortable glow, but which didn't entirely erase the awareness of having committed himself at this hour to an irrevocable line of action. Celia stroked a fluffy lock of red-brown hair back from her forehead and glanced over at him. She had a narrow, pretty face, marred only by a suggestion of hardness about the mouth, which was a little more than ordinarily noticeable just now. Phil decided she felt something like his own tensions, for identical reasons. He was less certain about Major Wayne Jackson, a big, loose-jointed man with an easy-going smile and a pleasantly self-assured voice. The voice might be veering a trifle too far to the hardy side, but that was all. "'I didn't,' Celia said. "'It belonged to Frank. How he got it shipped in with him, or after him, for mirth, I don't know. He never told me. When he died a couple of years ago, I took it over.' Phil gazed reflectively at the row of unfamiliar instruments covering half of the table beside her. The camera, which had taken an imprint of the geest gun in Ampula's living room, went with that equipment and had become an interior section of the largest of the instruments. "'What do you call it?' he asked. Celia looked irritated. Jackson laughed, said, "'Why not tell him? Feels feeling like we do. This is the last chance to look everything over, make sure nobody slipped up, that nothing can go wrong. Right, Phil?' Phil nodded. "'Something like that.' Celia chewed her lip. "'All right,' she said. It doesn't matter, I suppose, compared with the other. She tapped one of the instruments. The set's called a duplicator. This one's around sixty years old. They're classified as a forgery device, and it's decidedly illegal for a private person to build one, own one, or use one. Why that? Because forgery is ordinarily all they're good for. Frank was one of the best of the boys in that line before he found he'd been put on an out transfer list. Phil frowned. But if it can duplicate any manufactured object, it can had an average expense around fifty times higher than it would take to make an ordinary reproduction without it. A duplicator's no use unless you want a reproduction that's absolutely indistinguishable from the model. I see. Phil was silent a moment. After sixty years... Don't worry, Phil, Jackson said. It's in perfect working condition. We checked that on a number of samples. How do you know the copies were really indistinguishable? Celia said impatiently, Because that's the way the thing works. When the geese gun passed through the model plate... It was analyzed down to its last little molecule. The duplicate is now being built up from that analysis. Every fraction of every element used in the original will show up again exactly. Why do you think the stuff's so expensive? Phil grinned. All right, I'm convinced. How do we get rid of the inscription? The gadget will handle that, Jackson said. Crack that edge off, treat the cracked surface to match the wear of the rest. He smiled. Makes an earth forger's life look easy, doesn't it? It is, till they hook you, Celia said shortly. She finished her drink, set it on the table, added, We have a few questions too, Phil. The original gun, Jackson said. Mind you, there's no slightest reason to expect an investigation. But after this starts rolling, our necks will be out just a little until we've got rid of that particular bit of incriminating evidence. Phil pursed his lips. I wouldn't worry about it. Nobody but Beulah ever looks at Uncle William's collection of oddities. Most of it's complete trash. And probably only she and you and I know there's a geese gun among the things. William's cronies all passed away before he did. But if the gun disappeared now, Beulah would miss it. And that, since Earth governments made it illegal to possess geese artifacts, might create attention. Jackson fingered his chin thoughtfully, said, Of course, there is always a way to make sure Beulah didn't kick up a fuss. Phil hesitated. Dr. Fitzsimmons gives Beulah another three months at the most, he said. If she can stay out of the hospital for even the next eight weeks, he'll consider it some kind of miracle. That should be early enough to take care of the gun. It should be, Jackson said. However, if there does happen to be an investigation before that time... Phil looked at him, said evenly, We'd do whatever was necessary. It wouldn't be very agreeable, but my neck's out just as far as yours. Celia laughed. That's the reason we can all feel pretty safe, she observed. Every last one of us is completely selfish, and there's no more dependable kind of person than that. Jackson flushed a little, glanced at Phil, smiled. Phil shrugged. Major Wayne Jackson, native son, Fort Roy's second-in-command, was scheduled for the number one spot and a string of promotions via the transfer of the current commander, Colonel Thayer. 
that Earthside associates would arrange for that as soon as the decision to turn Fort Roy into a Class A military base was reached. Phil himself could get by with the guaranteed retention of the CLU presidency, and the membership moving up year by year to the half-million mark and beyond. He could get by very, very comfortably, in fact. While Celia Adams would develop a discreetly firm hold on every upcoming minor racket, facilitated by ironclad protection and an enforced lack of all competitors. We are all thinking of Roy's future, Celia, Phil said amiably, each in his own way. And the future looks pretty bright. In fact, the only possible stumbling block I can still see is right here on Roy, and it's honest Silas Thayer. If our colonel covers up the geest gun find tomorrow... Jackson grinned, shook his head. Leave that to me, my boy, and to our very distinguished visitors from Earth. Commissioner Sanford has arranged to be in Thayer's company on territorial office business all day tomorrow. Science Officer Vaughn is dizzy with delight because Ronald Black and most of the news-gathering troop will inspect his diggings in the ruins in the morning, with the promise of giving his theories about the vanished natives of Roy a nice spread on Earth. Black will happen to ask me to accompany the party. Between Black and Sanford, and myself, Colonel Silas Thayer won't have a chance to suppress the discovery of a geese gun on Roy until the military has had a chance to look into it fully. And the only one he could possibly blame for that will be Science Officer Norm Vaughn, for whom, I'll admit, I feel just a little bit sorry. First Lieutenant Norman Vaughn was an intense and frustrated young man whose unusually thick contact lenses and wide mouth gave him some resemblance to a melancholy frog. He suspected, correctly, that a good science officer would not have been transferred from Earth to Roy, which was a planet deficient in scientific problems of any magnitude, and where requisitions for research purposes were infrequently and grudgingly granted. The great spiraled ruin on the peninsula of Fort Roy had been Vaughn's one solace. Several similar deserted structures were known to be on the planet, but this was by far in the best condition and no doubt the most recently built. To him, if to no one else, it became clear that the construction had been carried out with conscious plan and purpose, and he gradually amassed great piles of notes to back up his theory that the vanished builders were of near-human intelligence. Unfortunately, their bodies appeared to have lacked hard and durable parts, since nothing that could be construed as their remains was found. And what Lieutenant Vaughn regarded as undeniable artifacts, on the level of very other man's work, looked to others like chance shards and lumps of the tough, shell-like material of which the ruins were composed. Therefore, while Vaughn was, as Jackson had pointed out, really dizzy with delight when Ronald Black, that giant of Earth's news media, first indicated an interest in the ruins and its theories about them, this feeling soon became mixed with acute anxiety. For such a chance surely would not come again if the visitors remained unconvinced by what he showed them. And what, actually, did he have to show? In the morning, when the party set out, Vaughn was in a noticeably nervous frame of mind. Two hours later, he burst into the anteroom of the base commander's office in Fort Roy, where the warrant on duty almost failed to recognize him. Lieutenant Vaughn's eyes glittered through their thick lenses. His face was red and he was grinning from ear to ear. He pounded past the startled warrant, pulled open the door to the inner office where Colonel Thayer sat with the visiting territorial commissioner, and plunged inside. Sir, the warrant heard him quaver breathlessly. I have the proof, the undeniable proof. They were intelligent beings. They did not die of disease. They were exterminated in war. They were... but see for yourself. There was a thud as he dropped something on the polished tabletop between the commissioner and Colonel Thayer. That was dug up just now, among their own artifacts. Silas Thayer was on his feet, sucking in his breath for the blast that would hurl his blundering science officer back out of the office. What halted him was an odd, choked exclamation from Commissioner Sanford. The colonel's gaze flicked over to the visitor, then followed Sanford's stare to the object on the table. For an instant... Colonel Thayer froze. Vong was bubbling on. And, sir, I... Shut up! Thayer snapped. He continued immediately. You say this was found in the diggings in the ruins? Yes, sir, just now. It's... Lieutenant Vaughn checked himself under the colonel's stare, some dawning comprehension of the enormous irregularities he had committed showing in his flushed face. He licked his lips uncertainly. You will excuse me for a moment, sir, Thayer said to Commissioner Sanford. He picked the geest gun up gingerly by its unmistakably curved shaft, took it over to the office safe, laid it inside and relocked the safe. He then left the office. In an adjoining room, Thayer rapped out Major Wayne Jackson's code number on a communicator. He heard a faint click as Jackson's wrist speaker switched on, and said quickly, Wayne, are you in a position to speak? I am at the moment, Jackson's voice replied cautiously. Colonel Thayer said, Norm Vaughn just crashed in here with something he claims was found in the diggings. Sanford saw it and obviously recognized it. We might be able to keep him quiet, but now some questions. Was that item actually dug up just now? Apparently it was, Jackson said. I didn't see it happen. I was talking to Black at the moment. 
but there are over a dozen witnesses who claim they did see it happen, including five or six of the news agency men. And they knew what it was? Enough of them did. Thayer cursed softly. No chance that one of them pitched the thing into the diggings for an Earthside sensation? I'm afraid not, Jackson said. It was lying in the sifter after most of the sand and dust had been blown away. Why didn't you call me at once? I've been holding down something like a mutiny here, Silas. Vaughn got away before I could stop him, but I grounded the other air cars till you could decide what to do. Our visitors don't like that. Neither do they like the fact that I've put a guard over the section where the find was made, and haven't let them talk to Norm's work crew. Ronald Black and his staff have been fairly reasonable, but there's been considerable mention of military high-handedness made by the others. This is the first moment I've been free. You did the right thing, Thayer said, but I doubt it will help much now. Can you get hold of Ronald Black? Uh, yes, he's over there. Colonel Thea? Another voice inquired pleasantly a few seconds later. Mr. Black, the colonel said carefully, what occurred in the diggings a short while ago may turn out to be a matter of great importance. That's quite obvious, sir. And that being the case, the colonel went on, do you believe it would be possible to obtain a gentleman's agreement from all witnesses to make no mention of this apparent discovery until the information is released through the proper channels? I'm asking for your opinion. Colonel Thea, Ronald Black's voice said, still pleasantly, my opinion is that the only way you could keep the matter quiet is to arrest every civilian present, including myself, and hold us incommunicado. You have your duty and we have ours. Ours does not include withholding information from the public which may signal the greatest shift in the conduct of the Geist War in the past two decades. I understand, Thayer said. He was silent for some seconds, and perhaps he, too, was gazing during that time at a Fort Roy of the future, a Class A military base under his command, with Earth's great war vessels lined up along the length of the peninsula. Mr. Black, he said, please be so good as to give your colleagues this word for me. I shall make the most thorough possible investigation of what has occurred and forward a prompt report, along with any material evidence obtained to my superiors on Earth. None of you will receive any other statement from me or from anyone under my command. An attempt to obtain such a statement will, in fact, result in the arrest of the person or persons involved. Is that clear? Quite clear, Colonel Thea, Ronald Black said softly, and entirely satisfactory. We have known for the past eight weeks, the man named Cranehart said, that this was not what it appears to be, that is, a section of a geest weapon. He shoved the object in question across the desk towards Commissioner Sanford and Ronald Black. Neither of the two attempted to pick it up. They glanced at it, then returned their eyes attentively to Cranehart's face. It is, of course, an excellent copy, Cranehart went on, produced with the professional forger's equipment. As I imagine you're aware, that should have made it impossible to distinguish from the original weapon. However, there's no real harm in telling you this now. Geese technology has taken somewhat different turns than our own. In their weapons, they employ traces of certain elements which we are only beginning to learn to maintain in stable form. That is a matter your government has kept from public knowledge, because we don't wish the geests to learn from human prisoners how much information we are gaining from them. The instrument which made this copy naturally did not have such elements at its disposal, so it employed their lower homologues and, in that matter, successfully produced an almost identical model. In fact, the only significant difference is that such a gun, if it had been a complete model, could not possibly have been fired. He smiled briefly. But that, I think you will agree, is a significant difference. We knew as soon as the so-called geest gun was examined that it could only have been made by human beings. Then, Commissioner Sanford said soberly, its apparent discovery on Roy during our visit was a deliberate hoax. Cranehart nodded. Of course. Ronald Black said, I fail to see why you've kept this quiet. You needn't have given away any secrets. Meanwhile, the wave of public criticism at the government's seeming hesitancy to take action on the discovery that is, to rush protection to the threatened territorial segments, has reached almost alarming proportions. You could have stopped it before it began two months ago with a single announcement. Well, yes, Cranehart said. There were other considerations. Incidentally, Mr. Black, we are not unappreciative of the fact that the news media under your own control exercised a generous restraint in the matter. For which, Black said dryly, I am now very thankful. As for the others, Cranehart went on, the government has survived periods of criticism before, and that is not important. The important thing is that the Geist War has been with us for more than a human lifespan now, and it becomes difficult for many to bear in mind that, until its conclusion, no acts that might reduce our ability to prosecute it can be tolerated. Ronald Black said slowly, So you've been delaying the announcement until you could find out who was responsible for the hoax. We were interested, Cranehart said, only in the important men, the dangerous men. 
We don't care much who else is guilty of what. This, you see, is a matter of expediency, not of justice. He looked for a moment at the politely questioning, somewhat puzzled faces across the desk, went on. When you leave this room, each of you will be conducted to an office where you will be given certain papers to sign. That is the first step. There was silence for some seconds. Ronald Black took a cigarette from a platinum case, tapped it gently on the desk, put it to his mouth, and lit it. Greenheart went on. It would have been impossible to unravel this particular conspiracy if the forgery had been immediately exposed. At that time, no one had taken any obvious action. Then, within a few days, with the discovery apparently confirmed by our silence, normal maneuverings in industry and finance were observed to be underway. If a major shift in war policy was pending, if one or more key bases were to be established in territorial segments previously considered beyond the range of geese reconnaissance and therefore secure from attack, this would be to somebody's benefit on Earth. Easy to tell always, Black murmured. Of course, it's a normal procedure, ordinarily of no concern to government. It can be predicted with considerable accuracy to what group or groups the ultimate advantage in such a situation will go. But in these past weeks, it became apparent that somebody else was winning out. Somebody who could have won out only on the basis of careful and extensive preparation for this very situation. That was abnormal, and it was the appearance of an abnormal pattern for which we had been waiting. We find there are seven men involved. These men will be deprived of the advantage they have gained. Arnold Black shook his head, said, You're making a mistake, Craynaught. I'm signing no papers. Nor I, Sanford said thickly. Cranehart rubbed the side of his nose with a fingertip, said meditatively, You won't be forced to, not directly. He nodded at the window. On the landing flange out there is an air car. It is possible that this air car will be found wrecked in the mountains some four hundred miles north of here early tomorrow morning. Naturally, we have a satisfactory story prepared to cover such an eventuality. Sanford whitened slowly. He said, So you'd resort to murder? Trainhart was silent for a few seconds. Mr. Sanford, he said then, you, as a member of the territorial office, know very well that the Geist War has consumed over 400 million human lives to date. That is a circumstance which obliges your government to insist on your cooperation. I advise you to give it. But you have no proof. You have nothing but surmises. Consider this, Cranehart said. A conspiracy of the type I have described constitutes a capital offense under present conditions. Are you certain that you would prefer us to continue to look for proof? Ronald Black said in a harsh voice. And what would the outcome be if we did choose to cooperate? Well, we can't afford to leave men of your type in a position of influence, Mr. Black, Cranehart said amiably. And you understand, I'm sure, that it would be entirely too difficult to keep you under proper surveillance on Earth. Celia Adams said from outside the cabin door, I think it is them, Phil. Both cars have started to circle. Phil Bowles came to the door behind her and looked up. It was early evening, Roy's sun just down and a few stars out. The sky above the sea was still light. After a moment, he made out the two air cars moving in a wide, slow arc far overhead. He glanced at his watch. Twenty minutes late, he remarked, but it couldn't be anyone else, and if they hadn't all come along, they wouldn't have needed two cars. He hesitated. We can't tell how they're going to take this, Celia, but they may have decided already that they could make out better without us. He nodded towards the edge of the cliff. Short way over there and a long drop to the water, so don't let them surprise you. She said coldly, I won't, and I've used guns before this. Wouldn't doubt it. Phil reached back behind the door, picked up a flare light standing beside a heavy machine rifle, and came outside. He pointed the light at the cars and touched the flash button briefly three times. After a moment, there were two answering flashes from the leading car. So Wayne Jackson's in the front car, Phil said. Now let's see what they do. He returned the light to its place behind the door and came out again, standing about twelve feet to one side of Celia. The air cars vanished inland, came back at treetop level a few minutes later. One settled down quietly between the cabin and the edge of the cliff, the other following, but dropping to the ground a hundred yards away, where it stopped. Phil glanced over at Celia, said softly, Watch that one. She nodded almost imperceptibly, right hand buried in her jacket pocket. The near door of the car before them opened. Major Wayne Jackson, hatless and in hunting clothes, climbed out, staring at them. He said, Anyone else here? Just Celia and myself, Phil said. Jackson turned, spoke into the car, and two men, similarly dressed, came up behind them. Phil recognized Ronald Black and Sanford. The three started over to the cabin, stopped a dozen feet away. Jackson said sardonically, Our five other previous Earthside partners are in the second car. 
In spite of your insistence to meet the whole group, they don't want you and Celia to see their faces. They don't wish to be identifiable. He touched his coat lapel. They'll hear what we're saying over this communicator, and they could talk to you, but won't unless they feel it's necessary. You'll have to take my word for it that we're all present. That's good enough, Phil said. All right, Jackson went on. Now what did you mean by forcing us to take this chance? Let me make it plain. Colonel Thayer hasn't been accused of collaborating in the Roy Gunn hoax, but he got a black eye out of the affair just the same. And don't forget that a planet with colonial status is technically under martial law, which includes the civilians. If Silas Thayer can get his hands on the guilty persons, the situation will become a lot more unpleasant than it already is. Phil addressed Ronald Black. Then how about you two? When you showed up here again on a transfer list, Thayer must have guessed why. Black shook his head. Both of us exercised the privilege of changing our names just prior to the out-transfer. He doesn't know we're on Roy. We don't intend to let him find out. Phil asked, Did you make any arrangements to get out of Roy again? Before leaving Earth? Black showed his teeth in a humorless smile. Bells, you have no idea of how abruptly and completely the government men cut us off from our every resource. We were given no opportunity to draw plans to escape from exile. Believe me. Phil glanced over at Celia. In that case, he said a little thickly, we'd better see if we can't draw some up together immediately. Jackson asked, staring, what are you talking about, Phil? Don't think for a moment Silas Thayer isn't doing what he can to find out who put that trick over on him. I'm not at all sure he doesn't suspect me. And if he can tie it to us, it's our neck. If you have some crazy idea of getting off the planet now, let me tell you that for the next few years we can't risk making a single move. If we stay quiet, we're safe. We... I don't think we'd be safe, Phil said. On his right, Celia Adams added sharply, The gentleman in the other car who's just started to lower that window had better raise it again. If he's got good eyesight, he'll see I have a gun pointed at him. Yes, that's much better. Go on, Phil. Have you both gone out of your minds? Jackson demanded. No, Celia said. She left with a sudden shakiness in her tone, added, Though I don't know why we haven't. We've thought of the possibility that the rest of you might feel it would be better if Phil and I weren't around anymore, Wayne. That's nonsense, Jackson said. Maybe. Anyway, don't try it. You wouldn't be doing yourselves a favor even if it worked. Better listen now. Listen to what? Jackson demanded exasperatedly. I'm telling you it will be all right if we just don't make any mistakes. The only real pieces of evidence were your duplicator and the original gun. Since we're rid of those... We're not rid of the gun, Wayne, Phil said. I still have it. I haven't dared get rid of it. You... What do you mean? I was with Beulah in the Fort Roy Hospital when she died, Phil said. He added to Ronald Black. That was two days after the ship brought the seven of you in. Black nodded, his eyes alert. Major Jackson informed me. She was very weak, of course, but quite lucid, Phil went on. She talked a good deal, reminiscing and in a rather happy vein. She finally mentioned the geest gun and how Uncle William used to keep us boys, Wayne and me, spellbound with stories about the Gunderland battle and how he'd picked the gun up there. Jackson began, And what does... He didn't get the gun there, Phil said. Beulah said Uncle William came in from Earth with the first shipment of settlers and was never off Roy again in his life. He... Then... Phil said... Don't you get it? He found the gun right here on Roy. Beulah thought it was awfully funny. William was an old fool, she said, but the best liar she'd ever known. He came in with the thing one day after he'd been traipsing around the backcountry and said it looked sort of like pictures of geese guns he'd seen and that he was going to put the inscription on it and have some fun now and then. Phil took a deep breath. Uncle William found it lying in a pile of ashes where someone had made camp a few days before. He figured it would have been a planetary speedster some rich sportsman from Earth had brought in for a taste of outworld hunting on Roy and that one of them had dumped the broken oddball gun into the fire to get rid of it. That was thirty-six years ago. Beulah remembered it happened a year before I was born. There was silence for some seconds. Then Ronald Black said evenly, And what do you conclude, Bowles? Phil looked at him. I'd conclude that Norm Vaughn was right about there having been some fairly intelligent creatures here once. The geests ran into them and exterminated them as they usually do. That might have been a couple of centuries back. Then, thirty-six years ago, one of their scouts slipped in here without being spotted, found human beings on the planet, looked around a little, and left again. He took the geest gun from his pocket, hefted it in his hand. We have the evidence here, he said. We had it all the time and didn't know it. Ronald Black said dryly, We may have the evidence, but we have no slightest proof at all now that that's what it is. I know it, Phil said. Now Beulah's gone. Well, we couldn't even prove that William Bowles never left the planet for that matter. There weren't any records to speak of being kept in the early days. He was silent a moment. 
Supposing, he said, we went ahead anyway. We hand the gun in with the story I just told you. Jackson made a harsh laughing sound. That would hang us fast, Phil. And nothing else? Nothing else, Black said with finality. Why should anyone believe the story now? There are a hundred more likely ways in which a geese gun could have gotten to Roy. The gun was tangible evidence of the hoax. But that's all. Phil asked, Does anybody, including the cautious gentleman in the car over there, disagree with that? There was silence again. Phil shrugged, turned towards the cliff edge, drew his arm back and hurled the geese gun far up and out above the sea. Still without speaking, the others turned their heads to watch it fall towards the water, then looked back at him. I didn't think very much of that possibility myself, Phil said unsteadily, but one of you might have. All right, we know the geese know we're here, but we won't be able to convince anyone else of it. And the last few years, the war seems to have been slowing down again. In the past, that's always meant the geese were preparing a big new surprise operation. So, the other thing now? The business of getting off Roy. It can't be done unless some of you have made prior arrangements for at Earthside. If it had been possible in any other way, I'd have been out of this place ten years ago. Ronald Black said carefully, Very unfortunately, Bowles, no such arrangements have been made. Then there it is, Phil said. I suppose you see now why I thought this group should get together. The Ten Masterminds! Well, we've hoaxed ourselves into a massive jam. Now let's find out if there's any possible way, any possibility at all, of getting out of it again. A voice spoke tinnily from Jackson's lapel communicator. Major Jackson? Yes, Jackson said. Please persuade Miss Adams that it is no longer necessary to point her gun at this car. In view of the stated emergency, we feel we had better come out now and join the conference. From the records of the Territorial Office, 2345 A.D. It is generally acknowledged that the campaign of the 132nd segment marked the turning point of the Geist War. Following the retransfer of Colonel Silas Thayer to Earth, the inspired leadership of Major Wayne Jackson and his indefatigable and exceptionally able assistants, notably CLU President Bowles, transformed the technically unfortified and thinly settled key world of Roy within twelve years into a virtual death trap for any invading force. Almost half of the Geist fleet which eventually arrived there was destroyed in the first week subsequent to the landing, and few of the remaining ships were sufficiently undamaged to be able to lift again. The enemy relief fleet, comprising an estimated 40% of the surviving Geist space power, was intercepted in the 134th segment by the combined Earth forces under Admiral McKenna's command and virtually annihilated. In the following two years... End of Watch the Sky by James H. Schmitz Recording by Sebastian Levine, Buffalo, New York This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Example, by Tom Pace. Malevolent death reared out of inky space before the hurtling liner. From it a frantic voice reached Commander Gray, you know what to do. He smiled grimly. Yes he knew what to do. The fifth sector commander was known as a rigid man, that was true, and yet no one could say exactly how rigid. His office, aboard the Polaris, was a rather grim place. All command offices were, essentially, being limited pretty much to regulation furnishings, but rare was the commander who did not manage to plant some of his personality there. It was perhaps characteristic of Commander Gray that there was only one item in his office which could be said to reveal anything about him. He sat now behind the cubicle steel desk and looked down at the glowing screen of the television set. The face in it was not at ease. Far from it. Ordinarily, John Bruller, the commissioner over Gray, was a self-important, unconsciously comical person. Now he looked neither comical nor important. He just looked very, very frightened. He licked his trembling lips and said, in a voice hoarse with fear, of course there is something you can do, Commander. After all, he brightened faintly, there are important people on the Stella. Important people. 
he emphasized important. I am aware of that, Commissioner Brulla, said the commander. Yet, what can I do? You have authority, sputtered Brulla. And you know what you can do. Get through to Interstellar Command on Sirius 7 and tell them just exactly what these Baelins are up to. He glared, a fat man in mortal fear for his life. And you can do it quickly, Commander. Quickly, do you understand? I understand, the Commander said. Good. Brawler started to speak again, gulped, hesitated, and finally repeated, good. He switched off. The commander gazed reflectively down the catwalk, through the ship, at the faint glimmer of green outside of an open lock. There was a turbulence deep in his steel-colored eyes. He tapped a small stud with a slim, tapering forefinger. Kina Storm came in. Kina wasn't all Solarian. He had enough soul blood in him to make him one in almost every respect, but there were differences, if you looked closely. He was the commander's personal aide. There was actually more than that between them. The tremendousness of all the commander governed, and which Kina helped him run, made for a rather involved relationship. When people saw the commander, they looked for Kina Storm. The two had not been a hundred yards apart since they had first met as newly appointed official and aide. It was said that Kina knew every bit as much about the Fifth Sector and the Commander's work as the Commander knew himself. For that reason, if Kina ever left his post, he would certainly die within an hour. The Commander said, Kina, call horns. The Secretary showed no surprise, but somehow managed to give that impression. The city of Horns, capital of Bielin III, the ruling planet of the Bielin system. He asked very respectfully. Yes. I want to talk to their commissioner-in-chief. And also find the present location of the Stella. Yes, sir, said Keener. He came back within ten seconds. The Stella, he said, is now at 3rd Quadrant 3521 Na, W88236. Speed, one light year per hour. Heading, 338 degrees na of nearest sun, Bielin? And I have Bielin command for you. The commander touched a switch and the screen flicked on again. Thank you, Kina, he said. The face in the screen was definitely not human. Its structure, and even more, its expression was alien. It was distinctly unpleasant. It belonged to Krilla, who was commander-in-chief, and the foremost murderer of the Bielin system. He smiled, a smile that was not a smile. He said, Ah, commander. And he saluted, sneering slightly. The commander said, Greetings, Krula. I would like to inquire the reason for your fleet being in its present position. Krula smiled again. The fleet, commander. Merely maneuvers, he said slyly. Why do you ask? There is a liner transiting through the outer fringes of your territory in, he looked at a paper Keener had slipped before him about four hours. I would appreciate it if your fleet is withdrawn in time. It would not go well, Kruller, if an accident were to happen to this liner of which I speak. I think you understand. He gave Kruller no time to answer, but switched off. He sat back, and looked aimlessly at Kina. Kina, he said, after a few moments of thought. Yes, Commander. Do you get the framework of this problem? I do, sir, answered the aide. Good. Let me hear it. The question is one of command, said Kina Storm quietly. Out here in the stars, power, the authority to command, goes not to men's heads but to their souls. Krolov Bielin is an example, and, in a different way. Myself? No, Commander Brulla. He is the brass hat type, while Krolov is simply a tyrannical madman. So far, you're right. 
But what of this particular problem? Yes, sir, the aide said. Kruller, and the Beelin rulers, have power in and about their system to the extent that their depredations go unchallenged there. And an apathetic interstellar command. Does not act, finished the commander. You are entirely correct, Keener. He touched, studs on the desk and reports, slid through the viewer on the wall. He said quietly, we have lost a score of ships, ships that we are sure the Baelins could tell us about. And yet the command does not act. He looked reflectively at the slim, impassive man, and then spoke swiftly. Kina, I want you to get me two more connections, Sirius 7, and the command cruiser nearest to Beelin. Hurry. The cruiser first? A minute or so later, Kina slipped a sheet of paper onto the desk, and touched a switch. The screen glittered into life, showing the face of a man who wore a captain's shoulder bars. Glancing at the paper, which gave the name of the officer and the ship, the commander said, Captain Stang, how far are you from Beelin? Roughly twenty light years, sir, was the immediate answer. Do you think that you can make a speed of, say, five light years per hour, or perhaps more? The captain frowned slightly. I'm not sure, Commander. Perhaps we can. Good. Stand by, at your present position in space. Gray switched off. Keener spoke softly at his side. That one cruiser, Commander, is more than a match for the entire Beelin fleet. He paused. Here's your call to Sirius headquarters, sir. That one cruiser, Commander, is more than a match for the entire Beelin fleet. The commander turned back to the screen. Over Commissioner Branu, are you aware of the present stage of relations with Beelin? The over Commissioner frowned at him. Certainly. Why are you asking, Commander? There was an imperious sharpness in his voice. What are they? Branu hesitated, said, Relations are somewhat strained at present, of course, but not seriously. I suppose proof was given that Beelin was back of the recent disappearances of spacecraft. My dear Commander Gray. You, you must not say that. Such an intimation might easily cost you your post. Why? The Commissioner cut him off. You see, Commander, said Keener, the command simply cannot think of such a thing. Yes, but they could be made, forced, to think of it. There is only one way to do that, said Kina. Only one way. Yes. Commander Gray fell silent for a minute, and then said quietly, Kina. I am listening, sir. The hands of one man, said the commander, were never meant to hold personal power such as this. We can do only the best we can, and it will never be perfect. We must be prepared to, he hesitated slightly before going on to set aside all personal things, and substitute the stars for them. Because only in that way can we approach perfection. Kina was silent and attentive, but his eyes flickered for a second across the one personal item in the office. I am not a god, Kina. And yet I must be because there are men, such as Kruller, who think they are. He fell silent. Then he said, a god must have power of life, and death. The screen was on again and, once more, it was Commissioner Bruller. He was almost frantic. Commander Gray. Have you acted yet? The captain says that we are being screened out. Only this special set can get through, and only to you. He gulped, mopping at his forehead. Commander, I have my entire family aboard this ship. I, I know that you. His voice faltered for an instant. Can't you get through to the command? Then, nervously, without waiting for a reply, he plunged on. The captain of the Stella says he believes there is an interstellar command cruiser within four hours or so. Can't you get it here? 
It could escort us through the edge of the Beelin system in safety. Commander Gray, I in? The commander cut Brulla off. Keena, he asked, what do you think the effect of a Beelin massacre would be on the command? Roughly estimating, commander, considerably more than the effect of an unleashed power beam on inert matter. Yes, said the commander. Yes. Keena, at least, 10,000 human lives have been lost on ships that I know have been captured by the Baelins. Unless the command takes action, now, there will never be a check on Krilla and his successors. And only a shocking catastrophe would stir up the Sirius command headquarter. A certain kind of catastrophe. The sacrifice justifies itself, said Keena Storm. The moral laws, the very framework of civilization itself, is now of a shape incredible to the person of two or three hundred years ago. My orders, then, should be. Keena stood up, stiffly. It would be presumptuous of me, Commander. The silence did not last very long. At last the Commander said, Keena, order Captain Stang to resume his usual patrol activities. Arrange to follow the Stella with a long-range recording beam. Prepare for the Interstellar Command's order, to proceed with a punitive expedition against the Beelin system. He looked long down the catwalk, and his fingers slowly closed about the one personal touch to his office. His voice was very low. No more messages are to be received from the Stella. And he opened his hand. Later, after the commander had gone down the catwalk to walk about for a while on the soft, earth-like greenness of this world's vegetation, Keena bent to pick up that which had fallen to the floor. It was a color photograph, and the cold plastic sheen of the film somehow managed to convey the impression of the blonde, young woman's soft, warm loveliness. It was inscribed, With all my love, John. Myra. Keena had often seen Commissioner Brulla's daughter. He dropped the photograph into a disposal chute, and turned to some papers that had to be filed. End of example, by Tom Pace. The Rumble and the Roar, by Stephen Bartholomew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins. The Rumble and the Roar, by Stephen Bartholomew. When Joseph got to the office, his ears were aching from the noise of the copter and from his earplugs. Lately, every little thing seemed to make him irritable. He supposed it was because his drafting department was behind schedule on the latest defense contract. His ears were sore, and his stomach withered with dyspepsia, and his feet hurt. Walking through the clerical office usually made him feel better. The constant clatter of typewriters and office machines gave him a sense of efficiency, of stability, and an all-is-well-with-the-world feeling. He waved to a few of the more familiar employees and smiled. But of course you couldn't say hello with the continual racket. This morning somehow it didn't make him feel better. He supposed it was because of the song they were playing over the speakers. Slam! Bang! Boom! The latest top hit. He hated that song. Of course the national mental health people said that constant music had a beneficial effect on office workers. So Joseph was no one to object, even though he did wonder if anyone could ever actually listen to it over the other noise. In his own office, the steady din was hardly diminished despite the soundproofing, and since he was next to an outside wall, he was subject also to the noise of the city. He stood staring out of the huge window for a while, watching the cars on the freeway and listening to the homogeneous rumble and scream of turbines. Something's wrong with me, he thought. I shouldn't be feeling this way. Nerves, nerves. He turned around and got his private secretary on the viewer, she simpered at him, trying to be friendly, with dull, sunken eyes. Betty, he told her, I want you to make an appointment with my therapist for this afternoon. Tell him it's just a case of the nerves, though. Yes, sir. Anything else? Her voice, like everyone's, was high-pitched, screeching, trying to be heard above the noise. Joseph winced. 
Anybody want to see me this morning? Well, Mr. Wills says he has the first model of his invention ready to show you. Let him in whenever he's ready. Otherwise, if nothing important comes up, I want you to leave me alone. Yes, sir, certainly. She smiled again, a mechanical, automatic smile that seemed to want to be something more. Joseph switched off. That was a damn funny way of saying it, he thought. I want you to leave me alone, as if somebody were after me. He spent about an hour on routine paperwork. Then Bob Wills showed up, so Joseph switched off his dictograph and let him in. I'm afraid you'll have to make a brief, Bob, he grinned. I have a whale of a lot of work to do, and I seem to be developing a splitting headache. Nerves, you know. Sure, Mr. Parch. I won't take a minute. I just thought you'd like to have a look at the first model of our widget and get clued in on our progress so far. Yes, yes, just go ahead. How does the thing work? Bob smiled and set the gray steel chassis on Parch's desk, sat down in front of it, and began tracing the wiring for Joseph. It was an interesting problem, or at any rate it should have been. It was one that had been harassing cities, industries, and particularly airfields for many years. Of course, everyone wore earplugs, and that helped a little. And some firms had partially solved the problem by using personnel that were totally deaf because such persons were the only ones who could stand the terrific noise levels that a technological civilization forced everyone to endure. The noise from a commercial rocket motor on the ground had been known to drive men mad, and sometimes kill them. There had never seemed to be any wholly satisfactory solution. But now Bob Wills apparently had the beginning of a real answer. A device that would use the principles of interference to cancel out sound waves, leaving behind only heat. It should have been fascinating to Parch but somehow he couldn't make himself get interested in it. The really big problem is the power requirement, Wills was saying. We've got to use a lot of energy to cancel out big sound waves. But we've got several possible answers in mind, and we're working on all of them. He caressed the crackle-finished box fondly. The basic gimmick works fine, though. Yesterday I took it down to a static test end over in Building 90 and had them turn on a pretty fair-sized steering rocket for one of the big moon ships. Reduced the noise level by about 25%. It, it did. Of course, I still needed my plugs. Joseph nodded approvingly and stared vacantly into the maze of transistors and tubes. I've built it to work on ordinary 60-cycle house current, Wills told him, in case you should want to demonstrate it to anybody. Parch became brusque. He liked Bob, but he had work to do. Yes, I probably shall, Bob. I tell you what, why don't you just leave it here in my office, and I'll look over it later, hmm? Okay, Mr. Parch. Joseph ushered him out of the office, complimenting him profusely on the good work he was doing. Only after he was gone and Joseph was alone again behind the closed door did he realize that he had a sudden yearning for company, for someone to talk to. Parch had Betty send him a light lunch, and he sat behind his desk, nibbling the tasteless stuff without much enthusiasm. He wondered if he was getting an ulcer. Yes, he decided he was going to have to have a long talk with Dr. Coles that afternoon be a pleasure to get it all off his chest, his feelings of melancholy, his latent sense of doom, be good just to talk about it. Oh, everything was getting to him these days. He was in a rut. That was it, a rut. He spat a sesame seed against the far wall, and the low whir of the automatic vacuum cleaners rose and fell briefly. Joseph winced. The speakers were playing slam, bang, boom again. His mind turned away from the grating melody and self-defense to look inward on himself. Of what, after all, did Joseph Parch's life consist? He licked his fingers and thought about it. What would he do this evening after work, for instance? Why, he'd stuff earplugs back in his inflamed ears and board the commuter's copter and ride for half an hour listening to the drumming of the rotors and the pleading of the various canned commercials played on the copter's speakers loud enough to be heard over the engine noise and through the plugs. And then when he got home, there would be the continuous yammer of his wife, added to the Tri-D set going full blast and the dull food from the automatic kitchen and synthetic coffee and one stale cigarette, perhaps a glass of brandy to steady his nerves if Dr. Coles approved. Parch brooded. The sense of foreboding had been submerged in the day's work. But it was still there. It was as if any moment a hydrogen bomb were going to be dropped down the chimney and you had no way of knowing when. And what would there be to do after he had finished dinner that night? Why, the same thing he'd been doing every night for the past fifteen years. There would be Tri-D, first of all, the loud comedians, and the musical commercials, and the loud bands, and the commercials, and the loud songs. 
and every 20 minutes or so the viewer would jangle with one of Felicia's friends calling up and more yammering from Felicia. Perhaps there would be company that night to play cards and sip drinks and talk and talk and talk and never say anything at all. There would be aircraft shaking the house now and then and the cry of the monorail horn at intervals. And then at last it would be time to go to bed and the murmur of the Soma learner orating him in the theory of groups all through the long night. And in the morning he would be shocked into awareness with the clangor of the alarm clock and whatever disc jockey the clock radio happened to tune in on. Joseph Parch's world was made up of sounds and noise, he decided. Dimly he wondered of what civilization itself would be constructed of if all the sounds were taken away. Why, after all, was the world of man so noisy? It was almost as if, as if everybody were making as much noise as they could to conceal the fact that there was something lacking, or something they were afraid of, like a little boy whistling loudly as he walks by a cemetery at night. Parch got out of his chair and stared out the window again. There was a fire over on the east side, a bad one by the smoke. Fire engines went screaming through the streets like wounded dragons. Sirens, bells, police whistles. All at once, Parts realized that never in his life had he experienced real quiet or solitude. That actually, he had no concept of what absence of thunder and wailing would be like. A total absence of sound and noise. Almost it was like trying to imagine what a negation of space would be like. And then he turned and his eyes fell on Bob Wills' machine. It could reduce the noise level of a rocket motor by 25%, Wills had said. Here in the office, the sound was far less than that of a rocket motor. And the machine worked on ordinary house current, Bob had said. Parch had an almost horrifying idea. Suppose. But what would Dr. Coles say about this, Parch wondered. Oh, he had to get a grip on himself. This was silly, childish. But looking down, he found that he had already plugged in the line cord. An almost erotic excitement began to shake Joseph's body. The sense of disaster had surged up anew. But he didn't recognize it yet. An absence of sound? No. Silly. Then a fire engine came tearing around the corner just below the window, filling the office with an ocean of noise. Joseph's hand jerked and flicked the switch. And then the dream came back to him, the nightmare of the night before that had precipitated, unknown to him, his mood of foreboding. It came back to him with stark realism and flooded him with unadorned fear. In the dream, he had been in a forest. Not just the city park, but a real forest, one thousands of miles and centuries away from human civilization, a wood in which the foot of man had never trod. It was dark there, and the trees were thick and tall. There was no wind, the leaves were soft underfoot, and Joseph Parch was all alone, completely alone, and it was quiet. Dr. Coles looked at the patient on the white cot sadly. I've only seen a case like it once before in my entire career, Dr. Leeds. Leeds nodded. It is rather rare. Look at him. Total catatonia. He's curled into a perfect fetal position. Never be the same again, I'm afraid. The shock must have been tremendous. An awful psychic blow, especially to a person as emotionally disturbed as Mr. Parch was. Yes, that machine of Mr. Wills is extremely dangerous. What amazes me is that it didn't kill Parch altogether. Good thing we got to him when we did. Dr. Coles rubbed his jaw. Yes, you know, it is incredible how much the human mind can sometimes take. Actually, as you say, it's a wonder it didn't kill him. He shook his head. Perfectly horrible. How could any modern human stand it? Two hours he was alone with that machine. Imagine two hours of total silence. End of The Rumble and the Roar by Stephen Bartholomew Recording by James Jenkins, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Hard Guy by H. B. Carlton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Hard Guy by H. B. Carlton. He was standing at the side of the glassite superhighway, his arm half raised, thumb pointed in the same direction as that of the approaching rocket car. Ordinarily, Frederick Marden would have passed a hitchhiker without stopping, but there was something in the bearing and appearance of this one 
that caused him to apply his brakes. Martin opened the car door next to the vacant seat beside him. Going my way? he asked. A pair of steady, unsmiling blue eyes looked him over. Yeah. All right, then, hop in. The hitchhiker took his time. He slid into the seat with casual deliberateness and slammed the car door shut. The rocket car got under way once more. They rode in silence for half a mile or so. Finally, Marden glanced questioningly at his companion's expressionless profile. Where are you headed for? he asked. Dantonville, he spoke from the corner of his mouth without turning his head. Oh, yes. That's the next town, isn't it? Yeah. Not very communicative, reflected Martin, noticing the rather ragged condition of the other's cellolex clothing. Have much trouble getting rides? The passenger turned his head. His blue eyes were without emotion. Yeah. Most guys are leery about picking up hitchhikers. Scared they'll get robbed. Martin pursed his lips and nodded. Something to that, all right. I'm usually pretty careful myself, but I figure you looked okay. Can't always tell by looks, was the calm reply. Course, us guys mostly pick out some guy with a swell atomic mobile, if we're gonna pull a stick up. When we see an old heap like this one, there's usually not enough dough to make it pay. Martin felt his jaw drop. Say, you sound like you go in for that sort of thing. I'm telling you right now I haven't enough cash on me to make it worth your while. I'm just a salesman, trying to get along. You got nothing to worry about, his passenger assured him. Stick-ups ain't my racket. An audible sigh of relief escaped Martin. I'm certainly glad to hear that. What is your, uh, racket, anyway? The blue eyes frosted over. Look, chum, sometimes it ain't exactly healthy to ask questions like that. Pardon me, Martin said hastily. I didn't mean anything. It's none of my business, of course. The calm eyes flickered over his contrite expression. Skip it, pal. You look like a right guy. I'll put you next to something. Only keep your lip buttoned, see? Oh, absolutely. I'm Mike Egan, head of the Strato Rovers. No, Martin said, plainly awed. The Strato Rovers, eh? I've heard of them all right. The other nodded complacently. Yeah, we're about the toughest mob this side of Mars. We don't bother honest people, though. We get ours from the crooks and racketeers. They can't squeal to the interplanetary police. There's a lot to what you say, agreed Martin. And of course that puts your mob in the Robin Hood class. Robin Hood? Nuts! That guy was a dope. Running around with bows and arrows? Why, we got a mystery raid that paralyzes anybody that starts up with us. They're all right when it wears off, but by that time we get away. Martin was properly impressed. A mystery ray. With a weapon like that, you should be able to walk into a bank and clean it out without any trouble. His passenger's lip curled. I told you we don't bother honest people. We even help the SP sometimes. Right now, we're working with the Earth-Mars G-Men in rounding up a gang of fifth columnists that are planted to take over the government. They are led by the Black Hornet. This Black Hornet goes around pretending like he's a big businessman, but he's really an international spy. A what? An international spy, repeated Marsden's companion shortly. The EMG men said he's the most dangerous man in the country but he won't last long with the Strato Rovers on his trail. Marsden nodded. I can believe that. Tell me, Egan, what are you doing out here 
around a small earth town like Dentonville. The government's building some kind of an ammunition place near here, and I understand the Black Hornet's figuring on wrecking everything. Of course, he won't get away with it. Scattered plasticade houses on either side of the road indicated they had reached the outskirts of Dentonville. Mike Egan pointed ahead to a small white house, set back among a cluster of trees. That's where I'm holed up. Drop me off in front. A young woman in a faded blue, satin glass house dress was standing at the gate of the white picket fence. She watched in silence as the passenger stepped out of the rocket car and lifted his hand to the driver, a careless farewell. Thanks for the lift, chum, said Mike Egan. Not at all, replied Marsden. Glad to have been of service to Mike Egan. The woman smiled to him. He told you his name, I see. Marden lifted his hat. Indeed he has. Michael is all right, she said. I do think, though, that he reads too many Buck Gordon interplanetary comic books for a boy of eleven. The End of Hard Guy by H. B. Carlton The Hunters by William Morrison This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hunters by William Morrison Illustrated by Van Dongen to all who didn't know him, Kurt George was a mighty hunter and actor, but this time he was up against others who could really act, and whose business was the hunting of whole worlds. There were thirty or more of the little girls, their ages ranging apparently from nine to eleven, all of them chirping away like a flock of chicks as they followed the old mother hen past the line of cages. "'Now, now, girls,' called Miss Burton cheerily, "'don't scatter. I can't keep my eye on you if you get too far away from me.' You, Hilda, give me that water pistol. No, don't fill it up first at that fountain. And Francis, stop bouncing your ball. You'll lose it through the bars, and a bowler bear may get it and not want to give it back. Francis giggled. Oh, Miss Burton, do you think the polar bear would want to play catch? The two men who were looking on wore pleased smiles. Charming, said Manto, but somewhat unpredictable, despite all our experiences, mi amigo. No attempts at Spanish, Manto, not here. It calls attention to us. And you are not sure of the grammar anyway. You may find yourself saying things you do not intend. Sorry, Pallet. It wasn't an attempt to show my skill, I assure you. It's that by now I have a tendency to confuse one language with another. I know, you were never a linguist. But about these interesting creatures... I suggest that they could stand investigation. It would be good to know how they think. Whatever you say, Manto. If you wish, we shall join the little ladies. We must have our story prepared first. Pallet nodded, and the two men stepped under the shade of a tree whose long, drooping, leaf-covered branches formed a convenient screen. For a moment, the tree hid silence. Then there came from beneath the branches the chatter of girlish voices, and two little girls skipped merrily away. Miss Burton did not at first notice that now she had an additional two children in her charge. "'Do you think you'll be able to keep your English straight?' asked one of the new little girls. The other one smiled with amusement, and at first did not answer." Then she began to skip around her companion and chant, I know a secret, I know a secret. There was no better way to make herself inconspicuous. For some time, Miss Burton did not notice her. The polar bears, the grizzlies, the penguins, the reptiles, all were left behind. At times the children scattered, but Miss Burton knew how to get them together again, and not one was lost. Here, children, is the building where the kangaroos live. Who knows where kangaroos come from? Australia, clanged at the shrill chorus. That's right, and what other animals come from Australia? I know, Miss Burton, cried Frances, a dark-haired nine-year-old with a pair of glittering eyes that stared like a pair of critics from a small heart-shaped face. I've been here before. Wallabies and wombats. Very good, Frances. Frances smirked at the approbation. I've been to the zoo lots of times, she said to the girl next to her. My father takes me. I wish my father would take me, too, replied the other little girl, with an air of wistfulness. Why don't you ask him to? Before the other little girl could answer, Frances paused, cocked her head slightly, and demanded, Who are you? You aren't in our class. I'm in Miss Hassel's class. 
Miss Hassel, who is she? Is she in our school? I don't know, said the other little girl, uncertainly. I go to P.S. 77. Oh, Miss Burton, screamed Frances. Here's a girl who isn't in our class. She got lost from her own class. Really? Miss Burton seemed rather pleased at the idea that some other teacher had been so careless as to lose one of her charges. What's your name, child? I'm Carolyn. Carolyn what? Carolyn Manto. Please, Miss Burton, I had to go to the bathroom, and then when I came out... Uh, yes, yes, I know. A shrill cry came from another section of her class. Oh, Miss Burton, here's another one who's lost. The other little girl was pushed forward. Now, who are you? Miss Burton asked. I'm Doris Pallet. I went with Carolyn to the bathroom. Miss Burton made a sound of annoyance. Imagine losing two children and not noticing it right away. The other teacher must be frantic by now and serve her right for being so careless. All right, you may stay with us until we find a policeman. She interrupted herself. Frances, what are you giggling at now? It's Carolyn. She's making faces just like you. Really, Carolyn, that isn't at all nice. Carolyn's face altered itself in a hurry, so as to lose any resemblance to Miss Burton's. I'm sorry, Miss Burton. I didn't really mean to do anything wrong. Well, I'd like to know how you were brought up. If you don't know that it's wrong to mimic people to their faces. A big girl like you, too. How old are you, Carolyn? Carolyn shrank. She hoped imperceptibly by an inch. I'm two... An outburst of shrill laughter. She's two years old. She's two years old. I was going to say I'm twelve. Almost, anyway. Eleven years old, said Miss Burton. Old enough to know better. I'm sorry, Miss Burton. An honest Miss Burton. I didn't mean anything, but I'm studying to be an actress and I imitate people, like the actors you see on television. Oh, Miss Burton, please don't make her go home with the policeman. If she's going to be an actress, I bet she'd love to see Kurt George. Well, after the way she's behaved, I don't know whether I should let her. I really don't. Please, Miss Burton, it was an accident. I won't do it again. All right, if you're good and cause no trouble. But we still have plenty of time before seeing Mr. George. It's only two now, and we're not supposed to go to the lecture hall until four. Miss Burton, cried Barbara Wilman. Do you think he'll give us his autograph? Now, children, I warned you about that. You mustn't annoy him. Mr. George is a famous movie actor, and his time is valuable. It's very kind of him to offer to speak to us, especially when so many grown-up people are anxious to hear him, but we mustn't take advantage of his kindness. But he likes children, Miss Burton. My big sister read in a movie magazine where it said he's just crazy about them. I know, but he's not in good health, children. They say he got jungle fever in Africa, where he was shooting all those lions and rhinoceroses and elephants for his new picture. That's why you mustn't bother him too much. But he looks so big and strong, Miss Burton. It wouldn't hurt him to sign an autograph. Oh, yes, it would, asserted one little girl. He shakes. When he has an attack of fever, his hand shakes. Yes, Africa is a dangerous continent, and one never knows how the dangers will strike one, said Miss Burton complacently. So we all must remember how bravely Mr. George is fighting his misfortune, and do our best not to tire him out. In the bright light that flooded the afternoon breakfast table, Kurt George's handsome manly face wore an expression of distress. He groaned dismally and muttered, What a head I've got, what a head! How do you expect me to face that gang of kids without a drink to pick me up? You've had your drink, said Carol. She was slim, attractive, and efficient. At the moment she was being more efficient than attractive and she could sense his resentment. That's all you get. Now lay off and try to be reasonably sober for a change. But those kids, they'll squeal and giggle. They're about the only audience in the world that won't spot you as a drunk. God knows where I could find anyone else who'd believe that your hand shakes because of fever. I know that you're looking out for my best interest, Carol, but one more drink wouldn't hurt me. She said warily but firmly, I don't argue with drunks, Kurt. I just go ahead and protect them from themselves. No drinks. Afterwards? I can't watch you the way a mother watches a child. The contemptuous reply sent his mind off on a new track. You could if we were married. I've never believed in marrying weak characters to reform them. But if I prove to you that I could change, prove it first, and I'll consider your proposal afterwards. You certainly are a cold-blooded creature, Carol but I suppose that in your profession you have to be. 
cold, suspicious, nasty, and reliable. It's inevitable when I must deal with such warm-hearted, trusting, and unreliable clients. He watched her move about the room, clearing away the dishes from his meager breakfast. What are you humming, Carol? Was I humming? I thought I recognized it. All of me, why not take all of me? That's it. Your subconscious gives you away. You really want to marry me. A mistake, she said coolly. My subconscious doesn't know what it's talking about. All I want of you is the usual 10%. Can't you forget for a moment that you're an agent and remember that you're a woman too? No, not unless you forget that you're a drunk and remember that you're a man. Not unless you make me forget that you drank your way through Africa because you weren't there with me with hardly enough energy to let them dress you in that hunter's outfit and photograph you as if you were shooting lions. You're so unforgiving, Carol. You don't have much use for me, do you? Consciously, that is. Frankly, Kurt, no, I don't have much use for useless people. I'm not entirely useless. I earn you that 10%. I'd gladly forgo that to see you sober. But it's your contempt for me that drives me to drink, and when I think of having to face those dear little kitties with nothing inside me, there should be happiness inside you at the thought of you doing a good deed. Not a drop, George. Not a drop. The two little girls drew apart from the others and began to whisper into each other's ears. The whispers were punctuated by giggles which made the entire childish conversation seem quite normal. But Pat was in no laughing mood. He said in his own language, You're getting careless, Manto. You had no business imitating her expression. I'm sorry, Pat, but it was so suggestive, and I'm a very suggestible person. So am I, but I control myself. Still, if the temptation were great enough, I don't think you'd be able to resist either. The issues are important enough to make me resist. Still, I thought I saw your face taking on a bit of her expression, too. You are imagining things, Manto. Another thing, that mistake in starting to say you were two hundred years old? They would have thought it a joke, and I think I got out of that rather neatly. You like to skate on thin ice, don't you, Manto? Just as you did when you changed your height. You had no business shrinking right out in public like that. I did it skillfully. Not a single person noticed. I noticed. Don't quibble. I don't intend to. Some of these children have very sharp eyes. You'd be surprised at what they see. Manto said tolerantly, You're getting jittery, Pallet. We've been away from home too long. I'm not jittery in the least, but I believe in taking due care. What could possibly happen to us if we were to announce to the children and the teacher and to every one in this zoo, for that matter, exactly who and what we were, they wouldn't believe us. And even if they did, they wouldn't be able to act rapidly enough to harm us. You can never tell about such things. Wise people simply don't take unnecessary chances. I'll grant that you're my superior in such wisdom. You needn't be sarcastic, Manto. I know I'm superior. I realize what a godsend this planet is. You don't. It has the right gravity, a suitable atmosphere, the proper chemical composition, everything, including a population that will be helpless before us. And you would take chances of losing all this? Don't be silly, pal. What chances am I taking? The chance of being discovered. Here we stumble on this place quite by accident. No one at home knows about it. No one so much as suspects that it exists. We must get back and report and you do all sorts of silly things which may reveal what we are and lead these people to suspect their danger. This time, Manto's giggle was no longer mere camouflage, but expressed to a certain degree how he felt. They cannot possibly suspect. We have been all over the world. We have taken many forms and adapted ourselves to many customs, and no one has suspected. And even if danger really threatened, it would be easy to escape. I could take the form of the school teacher herself, of a policeman, of anyone in authority, However, at present, there is not the slightest shadow of danger, so, Pallet, you had better stop being fearful. Pallet said firmly, Be careful, and I won't be fearful. That's all there is to it. I'll be careful. After all, I shouldn't want us to lose these children. They're so exactly the kind we need. Look how inquiring they are, how unafraid, how quick they adapt to any circumstances. Miss Burton's voice said, Good gracious, children, what language are you using? Greek? They'd been speaking too loud. They'd been overheard. Pallet and Manto stared at each other and giggled coyly. Then, after a second to think, Pallet said, Omne isme urten bay. What? Francis shrilled triumphantly. It isn't Greek, Miss Burton. It's Latin. Big Latin. She said, No, Miss Burton. 
Good heavens, what is Pig Latin? It's a kind of way of talking where you talk kind of backwards. Like, you don't say me, you say ime. You don't say yes, you say esye, added another little girl. You don't say you, you say uye. You don't say, all right, all right, I get the idea. You don't say, that'll do, said Miss Burton firmly. Now let's get along to the lion house. And please, children, do not make faces at the lions. How would you like to be in a cage and have people make faces at you? Always remember to be considerate to others. Even lions, Miss Burton? Even lions. But Mr. George shot lots of lions. Was he considerate of them, too? There was no time for silly questions, said Miss Burton with the same firmness. Come along. They all trooped after her, Pallet and Manto bringing up the rear. Manto giggled and whispered with amusement that pig Latin business is quick thinking, Pallet, but in fact quite unnecessary. The things you do to avoid being suspected. It never hurts to take precautions, and I think that now it is time to leave. No, not yet. You are always anxious to learn details before reporting. Why not learn a few more details now? Because they are not necessary. We already have a good understanding of human customs and psychology, but not of the psychology of children. And they, if you remember, are the ones who will have to adapt. We shall be asked about them. It would be nice if we could report that they are fit for all purpose service on a wide range of planets. Let us stay a while longer. All right, conceded Pallet grudgingly. So they stayed, and out of some twigs and leaves they shaped the necessary coins with which to buy peanuts, and popcorn and ice cream and other delicacies favored by the young. Manta wanted to win easy popularity by treating a few of the other children, but Pallad put his girlish foot down. No use arousing suspicion. Even as it was, "'Gee, your father gives you an awful lot of spending money,' said Francis enviously. "'Is he rich?' We get as much as we want, replied Manto carelessly. Gosh, I wish I did. Miss Burton collected her brood. Come together, children. I have something to say to you. Soon it will be time to go in and hear Mr. George. Now, if Mr. George is so kind as to entertain us, don't you think that it's only proper for us to entertain him? We could put on our class play, yelled Barbara. Barbara is a fine one to talk, said Francis. She doesn't even remember her lines. No, children, we mustn't do anything we can't do well. That wouldn't make a good impression. And besides, there is no time for a play. Perhaps Barbara will sing? I can sing a thank you song, interrupted Francis. That would be nice. I can recite, added another little girl. Fine, how about you, Carolyn? You and your little friend, Doris. Can she act, too? Carolyn giggled. Oh, yes, she can act very well. I can act like people. She can act like animals. The laughing, girlish eyes evaded a dirty look from the little friend. She can act like any kind of animal. She's certainly a talented child, but she seems so shy. Oh, no, said Carolyn. She likes to be coaxed. She shouldn't be like that. Perhaps, Carolyn, you and Doris can do something together, and perhaps, too, Mr. George will be pleased to see that your teacher also has talent. You, Miss Burton? Miss Burton coughed modestly. Yes, children. I never told you, but I was once ambitious to be an actress, too. I studied dramatics, and really, I was quite good at it. I was told that if I persevered, I might actually be famous. Just think, your teacher might actually have been a famous actress. However, in my day, there were many coarse people on the stage, and the life of theater was not attractive. But perhaps we better not speak of that. At any rate, I know the principles of the dramatic art very well. God knows what I'll have to go through, said Kurt, and I don't see how I can take it sober. I don't see how they can take you drunk, replied Carol. Why go through with it at all? Why not call the whole thing quits? Because people are depending on you. you. You always want to call quits whenever you run into something you don't like. You may as well call quits to your contract, if that's the way you feel. And to your 10%, darling. You think I'd mind that? I work for my 10%, Kurt, sweetheart. I work too damn hard for that 10%. You can marry me and take it easy. Honest, Carol, if you treated me better, if you showed me I meant something to you, I'd give up drinking. She made a face. Don't talk nonsense. Take your outfit and let's get ready to go, unless you want to change here and walk around dressed as a lion hunter. Why not? I've walked around dressed as worse. A drunk. Drunks don't attract attention. They're too ordinary. But a drunken lion hunter, that's something special. He went into the next room and began to change. 
Carol, he called, do you like me? At times, would you say that you liked me very much? When you're sober, rarely, love me, once in a blue moon, what would I have to do for you to want to marry me? Amount to something. I like that. Don't you think I amount to something now? Women swoon at the sight of my face on the screen and come to life again at the sound of my voice. The woman who swoon at you will swoon at anybody. Besides, I don't consider that making nitwit swoon is a useful occupation for a real man. How can I be useful, Carol? No one ever taught me how. Some people manage without being taught. I suppose I could think how if I had a drink inside me. Then you'll have to do without thinking. He came into the room again, powerful, manly, determined looking. There was an expression in his eye which indicated courage without end, a courage that would enable him to braid the wrath of man, beast, or devil. How do I look? Your noble self, of course, a poor woman's edition of Rudolph Valentino. I feel terrified. I don't know how I'm going to face those kids. If they were boys, it wouldn't be so bad. But a bunch of little girls? They'll grow up to be your fans, if you're still alive five years from now. Meanwhile, into each life, some rain must fall. You would talk of water when you know how I feel. Sorry. Come on, let's go. The lecture hall resounded with giggles, and beneath the giggles was a steady undercurrent of whispers, of girlish confidences exchanged, of girlish hopes that would now be fulfilled. Miss Burton's class was not the only one which had come to hear the famous actor-hunter describe his brave exploits. There were at least five others like it, and by some mistake, a class of boys, who also whispered to each other, in manly superiority, and pretended to find amusement in the presence of so many of the fairer sex. In this atmosphere of giggles and whispers, Manto and Pallet could exchange confidences without being noticed. Pallet said savagely, Why did you tell her that I could act too? Why, because it's the truth. You're a very good animal performer. You make a wonderful dragon, for instance. Go on, Pallet. Show her what a fine dragon you can... Stop it, you fool, before you cause trouble. Very well, Pallet. Did I tempt you? Did you tempt me? You and your sense of humor. You and your lack of it. But let's not argue now, Pallet. Here, I think, comes the lion hunter. Let's scream and be as properly excited as everyone else is. My God, he thought, how can they keep their voices so high so long? My eardrums hurt already. How do they stand a lifetime of it, even an hour? Go ahead, whispered Carol. You've seen the script. Go into your act. Tell them what a hero you are. You have the odds in your favor to start with. My lovely looks, he said with some bitterness. Lovely is the word for you, but forget that. If you're good, you'll get a drink afterwards. Will it be one of those occasions when you love me? If the moon turns blue. He strode to the front of the platform, an elephant gun swinging easily at his side, an easy grin radiating from his confident, rugged face. The cheers rose to a shrill fortissimo, but the grin did not vanish. What a great actor he really was, he told himself, to be able to pretend he liked this. An assistant curator of some collection in the zoo, a flustered old woman, was introducing him. There were a few laudatory references to his great talent as an actor, and he managed to look properly modest as he listened. The remarks about his knowledge of wild and ferocious beasts were a little harder to take, but he took them. Then the old woman stepped back, and he was facing his fate alone. Children, he began, a pause, a bashful grin, perhaps I should rather say my friends. I'm not one to think of you as children. Some people think of me as a child myself because I like to hunt and have adventures. They think that such things are childish. But if they are, I'm glad to be a child. I'm glad to be one of you. Yes, I think I will call you my friends. Perhaps you regard me, my friends, as a lucky person. But when I recall some of the narrow escapes I have had, I don't agree with you. I remember once, when we were on the trail of a rogue elephant, he told the story of the rogue elephant, modestly granting a co-hero's role to his guide, then another story illustrating the strange ways of lions. The elephant gun figured in still another tale, this time a vicious rhinoceros. His audience was quiet now, breathless with interest, and he welcomed the respite from the shrillness he had won for his ears. And now, my friends, it is time to say farewell. He actually looked sad and regretful, but it is my hope that I shall be able to see you again. 
the screams of exultation shrill as ever, small hands beating enthusiastically to indicate joy. Thank God that's over with, he thought. Now for those drinks. And he didn't mean drink, singular. Talk of being useful. He'd certainly been useful now. He'd made those kids happy. What more can any reasonable person want? But it wasn't over with. Another old lady stepped up on the platform. Mr. George, she said, in a strangely affected voice, like that of the first dramatic teacher he had ever had, the one who had almost ruined his acting career. Mr. George, I can't tell you how happy you have made us all, young and old. Hasn't Mr. George made us happy children? Yes, Miss Burton, came the shrill scream, and we feel that it would be no more than fair to repay you in some small measure for the pleasure you have given us. First, a thank you song by Francis Heller. He hadn't expected this, and he repressed a groan. Mercifully, the first song was short. He grinned the thanks he didn't feel, to think that he could take this while sober as a judge. What strength of character, what willpower. Next, Miss Burton introduced another kid who recited, and thus Miss Burton stood upright and recited herself. That was the worst of it all. He winced once, then bore up. You can get used even to torture, he told himself. An adult making a fool of herself is always more painful than a kid, and that affected electrocutionist voice gave him the horrors. But he thanked her, too, his good deed for the day. Maybe Carol would have him now, he thought. A voice trilled, Miss Burton? Yes, dear. Aren't you going to call on Carolyn to act? Oh, yes, I was forgetting. Come up here, Carolyn. Come up, Doris. Carolyn and Doris, Mr. George, are studying how to act. They act people and animals. Who knows? Some day they, too, may be in the movies, just as you are, Mr. George. Wouldn't that be nice, children? What? the devil do you do in a case like that? You grin, of course, but what do you say without handing over your soul to the devil? Agree how nice it would be to have those sly little brats with faces magnified on every screen all over the country? Like hell you do. Now, what are we going to act, children? Please, Miss Burton, said Doris. I don't know how to act. I can't even imitate a puppy. Really, I can't, Miss Burton. Oh, come, come, mustn't be shy. Your friend says that you act very nicely indeed. Can't want to go on the stage and still be shy. Now, do you know any movie scenes? Shirley Temple used to be a good little actress, I remember. Can you do any scenes that she does? The silence was getting to be embarrassing. And Carol said he didn't amount to anything. He never did anything useful. Why, if thanks to his being here this afternoon, those kids lost the ambition to go on the stage, the whole human race would have cause to be grateful to him. To him and to Miss Burton, she'd kill ambition in anybody. Miss Burton had an idea. I know what to do, children. If you can act animals, Mr. George has shown you what the hunter does. You show him what the lions do. Yes, Carolyn Doris, you're going to be lions. You're waiting in your lairs, ready to pounce on the unwary hunter. Crouch now behind that chair. Closer and closer he comes. You act it out, Mr. George, please, that's the way. Ever closer, and now your muscles tighten for the spring, and you open your great, wide, red mouths in a great, great, big roar, a deep and tremendous roar, as of thunder, crash to the auditorium, a roar, and then from the audience, an outburst of terrified screaming such as he had never heard, the bristles rose at the back of his neck, and his heart froze. Facing him across the platform were two lions, tensed as if to leap. Where they had come from, he didn't know, but there they were, eyes glaring, manes ruffled, more terrifying than any he had seen in Africa. There they were, with the threat of death and destruction in their fierce eyes, and here he was, terror and helplessness in his handsome, manly, and bloodless face, heart unfrozen now and pounding fiercely, knees melting, hands, hands clutching an elephant gun. The thought was like a director's command, with calm efficiency, with all the precision of an actor playing a scene rehearsed a thousand times, the gun leaped to his shoulder, and now its own roar thundered out a challenge to the roaring of the wild beasts, shouted at them in its own accents of barking thunder. The shrill screaming continued long after the echoes of the gun's speech had died away. Across the platform from him were two great bodies, the bodies of lions, and yet curiously unlike the beasts in some ways, now that they were dead and dissolving, as if corroded by some invisible acid. Carol's hand was on his arm. Carol's thin and breathless voice shook as she said, A drink. All the drinks you want. One will do. And you? And me. I guess you're kind of... kind of useful after all. 
End of The Hunters by William Morrison Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Franklin Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett You hear a lot of talk these days about secret weapons. If it's not a new wrinkle in nuclear fission, it's a gun to shoot round corners and down winding staircases. Or maybe a nice new strain of bacteria guaranteed to give you radioactive dandruff. Our own suggestion is to pipe a few of our television commercials into Russia and bore the enemy to death. Well, it seems that Ivor Jorgensen has hit on the ultimate engine of destruction, a weapon designed to exploit man's greatest weakness. The blueprint can be found in the next few pages, and as the soldier in the story says, our only hope is to keep a sense of humour. Me? I'm looking for my outfit. Got cut off in that Holland Tunnel attack. Mind if I sit down with you guys a while? Thanks. Coffee? Damn, this is heaven. Ain't seen a cup of coffee in a year. What? You said it. This sure is a hell of a war. Tough on a guy's feet. Yeah, that's right. Holland Tunnel Skirmish. Where the Ruskies used that new gun. Huh? God. It was awful. Guys popping off all around a guy and him not knowing why. No sense to it. No noise. No wound just popping off. That's the trouble with this war. It won't settle down to a routine. Always something new. What the hell chances a guy got to figure things out? And I tell you them Ruskies are coming up with new weapons just as fast as we are. Enough to make your hair stand on end. Sugar? Christ, yes. Ain't seen sugar for a year. You see, it's like this. We were bottled up in the pits around the tunnel for seven damn days. It was like nothing you ever saw before. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to splash you. I was laughing about something that happened there to a guy. Maybe you guys would get a kick out of it. After all, we got to keep our sense of humor. You see, there was me and a Kentucky kid named Stillwell in this pit. A pretty big pit with lots of room, and we were all alone. This Stillwell was a nice kid, green and lonesome, and it's pretty sad, really, but there's a yak in it. And as I say, we got to keep a sense of humour. Well, this Stillwell, a really green kid, is unhappy and just plain drooling for his gal back home. He talks about his mother, of course, and his old man, but it's the girl that's really on his mind, as you guys can plainly understand. He's seeing her every place, like spots in front of his eyes, nice spots doing things to him when this rusky babe shows up. My gun came up without any orders from me, just as she poked her puss over the edge of the pit, and, huh? Oh, thank you kindly. It sure tastes good. But I don't want to short you guys. Thank you kindly. Well, as I was saying, this rusky babe pokes her nose over the edge of the pit, and Stillwell dives and knocks down my gun. He says, You son of a bitch! Just like that, wild and desperate. Like you'd say to a guy if the guy was just kicking over the last jug of water on a desert island. It would have been long enough for her to kill us if I hadn't had good reflexes. Even then, all I had time to do was knock the pistol out of her hand and drag her into the pit. With her play bollocksed, she was confused and bewildered. She ain't a fighter, and she sits back against the wall staring at us, deadpan, with big expressionless eyes. She's a plenty pretty babe, 
and I could see exactly what had happened as far as Stillwell was concerned. His spots had come to life in very adequate form, so to speak. Stillwell goes over and sits down beside her, and I'm very much on the alert because I know where his courage comes from. But I decide it's all right because I see the babe is not belligerent, just confused kind of and friendly and willing. Kind of a whipped little dog willing and man, oh man, she was sure what Stillwell needed. They kind of went together like a hand and a glove, natural-like. And it followed, pretty natural, that when Stillwell got up and led her around a wing of the pit out of sight, she went willing like the same little dog. Huh? No, you guys, two's enough. I wouldn't rob you. Well, okay, and thanks kindly. Well, there I was, all alone, but happy for Stillwell, because I know it's what the kid needs, and in spots like that, what difference does it make? Yank, Rusky, Mongolian, as long as she's willing. Then, you guys, Stillwell comes back out, wall-eyed, real wall-eyed, like being hit but not knocked out and still walking. I know what it is, some kind of shock. I get up and walk over and take a look at the babe where he left her, and I bust out laughing. I told you guys there was a yak in this. I laughed like a fool. It was that funny, as much as I had time to before Stillwell cracked. It was enough to crack him, the little thing that pushes a guy over the edge. He lets out a yell and screams, For Christ's sake! For Christ's sake! Nothing but a bucket of bolts! Nothing but a couple of plastic lumps! That was when I hit him. I had to. He was for the birds, Stillwell was. An hour later, we got relieved and a couple of medicos carried him away, strapped to a stretcher, gone like a kite. They took the robot too, and its clothes, but they forgot the brassier, so I took it, and I've been carrying it ever since. But I'll leave it with you guys, if you want, for the coffee. Might make you think about home. After all, like the man says, we got to keep our sense of humor. Well... So long, you guys, and thanks. End of Belly Laugh by Randall Garrett Two Whole Glorious Weeks by Will Moeller This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins Two Whole Glorious Weeks by Will Moeller Bertha and I were like a couple of city kids on their first country outing when we arrived at Morton's place. The weather was perfect. The first chill of autumn had arrived in the form of a fine needle shower rain of the type that doesn't look very bad through a window, but when you get out in it, it seeks out every tiny opening between the warp and the weft of your clothing and runs through your hair and eyebrows, under your collar and over the surface of your body, until, as though directed by some knowing, invisible entity, it finds its way to your belly button. It was beautifully timed. The ancient motor bus had two blowouts on the way up the last half mile of the corduroy road that led to the place, and of course we were obligated to change the tires ourselves. This was a new experience for both of us, and on our very first day. Everything was as advertised, and we hadn't even arrived at the admission gate yet. We didn't dare talk. On the way from the heliport, we had seen some of the other folks at work in the swamps that surrounded the camp proper. They were digging out stumps with mattocks and crowbars and axes, and some of them stood waist-deep in the dark water. Bertha had said, Looky there, and had made some remark about the baggy gray carboralls they wore. Just like convicts, she said. The driver, a huge swine-like creature with very small, close-set eyes, had yanked the emergency brake and wheeled round at us. You schnooks might just as well get out of the habit of talking right here and now. One more peep out of you, and you're going to get clobbered. All we could do was look at each other and giggle like a couple of kids in the back pew of Sunday school after that. Bertha looked ten years younger already. The gate was exactly as the brochure had pictured it, solid and massive. It was let into on a board fence about ten feet high, which extended as far as you could see in either direction, 
and lost itself on either side of a tangle of briars, elder bushes, and dark trees. There were two strands of bob wire running along the top, a sign over the gate, stark black lettering on a light gray background, red. Silence. No admission without authority. No smoking. Morton's Misery Farm. Thirty acres of swamp. Our own rock quarry. Jute mill. Steam laundry. Harshest dietary laws in the Catskills. A small door opened at one side of the gate, and a short, stocky, well-muscled woman in a black visored cap and a shapeless black uniform came out and boarded the bus. She had our release with her, fastened to a clipboard. She thrust this under my nose. Read and sign, Schmuck, she said, in a voice that sounded like rusty boilerplate being torn away from more rusty boilerplate. The releases were in order. Our hands shook a little when we signed the papers. There was something so terribly final and irreversible about it. There would be no release, except in cases of severe medical complaint, external legal involvement, or national emergency. We were paid up in advance, of course. There was no turning away. Another attendant, who also looked like a matron of police, boarded the bus with a large suitcase and two of the baggy gray garments we had seen the others wearing in the swamp. No shoes, socks, or underwear. Strip and pack your clothes here, Schnooks, said the woman with the empty suitcase. We did, though it was pretty awkward, standing there in the aisle of the bus with those two gorgons staring at us. I started to save out a pack of cigarettes, but was soon disabused of this idea. The older of the two women knocked the pack from my hand, ground it under her heel on the floor, and let me have one across the face with what I am almost certain must have been an old sock full of rancid hog kidneys. What the hell was that? I protested. Sock full of hog kidney, Schnook. Soft but heavy, know what I mean? Just let us do the thinking around here. Get out of line just once and you'll see what you can do with a sock full of kidneys. I didn't press the matter further. All I could think of was how I wanted to smoke just then. When I thought of the fresh new pack of cigarettes with its unbroken cellophane and its twenty pure white cylinders fragrant Turkish in Virginia, I came as close to weeping as I had in forty years. The ground was slimy and cold under our feet when we got down from the bus. But the two viragos behind us gave us no time to pick our way delicately over the uneven ground. We were propelled through the small door at the side of the gate, and at last we found ourselves within the ten-foot barriers of the Missouri camp. We just looked at each other and giggled. Inside the yard, about twenty other guests shuffled around and around in a circle. Their gray coveralls were dark and heavy with the rain, and clung to their bodies in clammy-looking patches. All moved sluggishly through the mud with their arms hanging slack at their sides, their shoulders hunched forward against the wet chill, and their eyes turned downward as, as though they were fascinated with the halting progress of their own feet. I had never seen people look so completely dispirited and tired. Only one man raised his head to look at us as we stood there. I noticed that his forehead had bright purple marks on it. These proved to be number 94, property of MMF in inch-high letters which ran from temple to temple just above his eyebrows. Incredibly enough, the man grinned at us. You'll be sorry, he yelped. I saw him go down the mud under a blow with a kidney sock from a burly male guard who'd been standing in the center of the cheerless little circle. Leave the welcoming ceremonies to us, knucklehead, barked the guard. The improvident guest rose painfully and resumed his plotting with the rest. I noticed that he made no rejoinder. He cringed. We were led into a small office at the end of a long wooden one-story building. A sign on the door said simply, Admission, knock and remove hat. The lady guard knocked and we entered. We had no hats to remove. Indeed, this was emphasized for us by the fact that the rain had by now penetrated our hair and brows and was running down over our faces annoyingly. As soon as I'd blinked the rain from my eyes, I was able to see the form of the person behind the desk with more clarity than I might have wished. He was large but terribly emaciated, with the kind of gauntness that should be covered by a sheet, tenderly, reverently, and finally. Picture the type of every chain gang captain who has been relieved for inhumanity to prisoners. Imagine the naked attribute meanness, stripped of all accidental incongruous mitigating integument. Picture all kindness, all mercy, all warmth, all humanity excised or cauterized, or turned back upon itself and let ferment into some kind of noxious mash. Visualize the creature from which all gentle qualities had been expunged, thus, and then try to forget the image. The eyes were perhaps the worst feature. They burned like tiny, phosphorescent creatures, 
dimly visible deep inside a cave under dark overhanging cliffs the brows the skin of the face was drawn over the bones so tautly that you felt a sharp rap with a hard object would cause the sharp cheekbones to break through there was a darkness about the skin that should have been yet somehow did not seem to be the healthy tan of outdoor living it was a coloring that came from the inside and radiated outwards perhaps pellagra a wasting darkening malnutrition disease which no man had suffered for three hundred years i wondered where on the living earth they had discovered such a specimen i am in full charge here you will speak only when spoken to he said his voice came as a surprise and it, to me at least as a profound relief i had expected an inarticulate drawl something not yet language not quite human instead his voice was clipped precise clear as new type on white paper this gave me hope in a time when hope was at a dangerously low mark on my personal thermometer my mounting misgivings had come to focus on the grim figure behind the desk and the most feared quality that i had seen in his face a hard sharp immovable and imponderable stupidity was strangely mitigated and even contradicted by the flawless mechanical speech of the man what did you do on the outside schnook he snapped at me central computing and control i punched tapes only got four hours of work a month i said hoping to cover myself with a protective film of humility ha another low hour man i don't see how the hell you could afford to come here well anyway we've got work for the climbers like you real work snook i know climbers like you hope you'll meet aristocracy in a place like this ten hour men or even weekly workers but I can promise you, Schnook, that you'll be too damn tired to disport yourself socially and too damn busy looking at your toes. Don't forget that. Remembering, I looked down quickly, but not before one of those matrons behind me had fetched a solid cloud on the side of my head with her sap. Mark em and put em to work, he barked at the guards. Two uniformed men, who must have sneaked in while I was fascinated by the man behind the desk, seized me and started painting my forehead with an acrid fluid that stung like strong disinfectant in an open wound. I squeezed my eyes and tried to look blank. This is indelible, one of them explained. We have the chemical to take it off, but it doesn't come off until we say so. When I had been marked, one of the guards took his ink and brush and advanced upon Bertha. The other addressed himself to me. There's a choice of activities. There is the jute mill, the rock quarry, the stump removal detail, the manure pile. How about the steam laundry, I asked, prompted now by the cold sound of sudden gust of rain against the wooden side of the building. Spluck! went the guard's kidney sock as it landed on the right hinge of my jaw. Soft or not, it nearly dropped me. I said there is a choice. Not you have a choice, Snook. Besides, the steam laundry is for the ladies. Don't forget who's in charge here. Who is in charge here, then, I asked, strangely emboldened by the cloud on the side of my jaw. Spluck! That's something you don't need to know, Snook. You ain't going to sue nobody. You signed a release, remember? I had nothing to say. My toes, I noted, looked much the same. Then behind my back, I heard a sharp squeal from Bertha. Stop that! Oh, stop that! Stop! The brochure said nothing about... Take it easy, lady, said the other guard in an oily, nasty voice. I won't touch you none. Just wanted to see if you was amenable. I would like more than anything else in the world to be able to say honestly that I felt a surge of anger then. I didn't. I can remember with terrible clarity that I felt nothing. So he wants a nice job inside the steam laundry, said the man behind the desk. The captain, we, inst we were instructed to call him. Another gust of wet wind joined his comments. Put him on the big rock candy mountain. He fixed me then with those deep-set glow-worm eyes, coldly appraising. The two sisters of Garonia, meanwhile, seized Bertha's arms and dragged her from the room. I did not try to follow. I knew the rules. There were to be three husband and wife visits per week. Fifteen minutes each. The captain was still scrutinizing me from under the dark cliff of his brows. A thin smile now shaped on his lipless mouth. One of the guards was beating a slow, measured, somewhat squishy tattoo on the edge of the desk with his kidney sock. You wouldn't be entertaining angry thoughts, would you, Schnook? said the captain, after what seemed like half an hour of sickly pause. My toes hadn't changed in the slightest respect. It must have been then or soon after that my sense of time went gently haywire. I was conducted to the big rock candy mountain, which turned out to be a huge manure heap. Its forbidding bulk overshadowed all the features of the landscape except some of the larger trees. 
A guard stood in the shadow of a large umbrella at a respectable and tolerable distance from the detrogenous colossus, but not so distant that his voice did not command the entire scene. Hut ho, hut ho, hut ho, hi, he roared, and the wretched gray-clad figures, whose numbers I joined without ceremony or introduction, moved steadily at their endless work, in apparent unawareness of his cadent chant. I do not remember that anyone spoke to me directly, or at least coherently enough so that those words lodged in my memory, but someone must have explained the general pattern of activity. The object, it seemed, was to move all this soggy fertilizer from its present imposing site to another small but growing pile located about 300 yards distance. This we were to accomplish by filling paper cement bags with the manure and carrying it, a bag at a time, to the more distant pile. Needless to say, the bags frequently dissolved or burst at the lower seams. This meant scraping the stuff up with the hands and refilling another paper bag. Needless to say, also, pitchforks and shovels were forbidden at the farm, as was any potential dangerous object which could be lifted, swung, or hurled. It would have been altogether redundant to explain this rule. I have absolutely no way of knowing how long we labored at this Argean enterprise. My watch had been taken from me, of course, and of the strange dislocation of my normal time sense I have already spoken. I do remember that floodlights had been turned on long before a raucous alarm sounded, indicating that it was time for supper. My weariness from the unaccustomed toil had carried me past the point of hunger, but I do remember my first meal at the farm. We had dumplings. You usually think fondly of dumplings as being in or with something. We just had dumplings, cold and not quite cooked through. Impressions of this character have a way of entrenching themselves, perhaps at the cost of more meaningful ones. Conversation at the farm was monosyllabic and infrequent, so it may merely be that I recall most lucidly those incidents with which some sort of communication was associated. A small man sitting opposite me in the mess hall gloomily indicated the dumpling at which I was picking dubiously. Now, bind ye, he said with finality of special and personal knowledge. You don't want to let yourself get bound here. They've got a... I don't recall whether I said something or whether I merely held up my hand. I do know that I had no wish to dwell on the subject. If I had hoped for respite after supper, it was at that time that I learned not to hope. Back to the big rock candy mountain we went, and under the bleak, iridescent glare of the lights we resumed our labors of no reward. One by one I felt my synapses parting, and one by one, slowly and certainly, the fragile membrane separating the minute from the hour, the now from the then, and the epoch of the unmeasured time softened and sloughed away. I was at last, number 109, at work on a monstrous manure pile, and I labored with the muscles and nerves of an undifferentiated man. I experienced change. I knew now that my identity, my ego, was an infinitesimal thing which rode along embedded in a mountain of more or less integrated organisms, more or less purposefully tissues, fluids, and loosely articulated bones, as a tiny child rides on the cab of a locomotive. And the rain came down, and the manure bags broke, and we scrambled with our hands to refill new ones. The raucous alarm sounded again in a voice which might have been that of a hospital nurse or of an outraged parrot announcing that it was time for Betty by, and in a continuous, unbroken motion, we slogged into another long building, discarded our coveralls, waded through a shallow tank of cloudy disinfectant solution, and were finally hosed down by the guards. I remembered observing to myself giddily that I now knew how cars must feel in an auto laundry. There were clean towels waiting for us at the far end of the long building, but I must have just blotted the excess water off myself in a perfunctory way, because I still felt wet when I donned the clean coverall that someone handed me. Betty Bye was one of a row of thirty-odd slightly padded planks like ironing boards, which were arranged at intervals of less than three feet in another long, low-ceilinged barracks. I knew that I would find no real release in Betty Bye, only another dimension of that abiding stupor which now served for my consciousness. I may have groaned, croaked, whimpered, or expressed myself in some other inarticulate way as I measured the length of the board with my carcass. I only remember that the others did so. There was an unshaded light bulb hanging directly over my face. To this day, I cannot be sure that that bleak beacon was ever turned off. I think not. I can only say with certainty that it was burning just as brightly when the raucous signal sounded again and the unoiled voice from the loudspeaker announced, that it was time for the morning cheer-up entertainment.
These orgies, it turned out, were held in the building housing the admission office. There was a speech choir made up of elderly women, all of whom wore the black uniform of the farm matrons. The realization that a speech choir still existed may have startled me into a somewhat higher state of awareness. I had assumed that the speech choir had gone out with hair receivers and humoristic medicine. The things they recited were in a childishly simple verse form. One and two and three and four. One and two and three. These verses had to do with the virtues of endless toil, the importance of thrift, and the hideous dangers lurking in cigarette smoking and needless borrowing. I'm happy to report that I do not remember them more specifically than this, but I was probably more impressed by the delivery than the message delivered. I could not imagine where they had discovered these women. During their performance, some sense of duration was restored to me, while I could be certain of nothing pertaining to the passage of time. It's not possible that the cheer-up period lasted less than two hours. Then they let us go to the latrine. After a breakfast of boiled cabbage and dry pumpernickel crusts, more savory than you might imagine, we were assigned to our work for the day. I had expected to return to the manure pile, but got instead the rock quarry. I remember observing then, with no surprise at all, that the sun was out and the day promised to be a hot one. The work at the rock quarry was organized according to the same fertilitarian pattern that governed the manure pile operation. Rock had to be hacked, pried, and blasted from one end of the quarry, then reduced to coarse gravel with sledgehammers and carted to the other end of the excavation in wheelbarrows. Most of the men commenced working at some task in the quarry with the automatic unconcern of trained beasts who have paused for rest and water, perhaps, but have never fully stopped. A guard indicated a wheelbarrow to me and uttered a sharp sound, Something like, huh! I picked up the smooth handles of the barrow, and time turned its back upon us again. It was that night, or perhaps the following night, that Bertha and I had our first fifteen-minute visit with each other. She was changed. Her face glowed with feverish vitality. Her hair was stringy and moist, and her eyes were serenely glassy. She had not been more provocative in twenty-five years. An old dormant excitement stirred within me microscopically, but unmistakably. She told me that she'd been put to work in the jute mill, but had passed out and had been transferred to the steam laundry. Her job in the laundry was to sort out socks and underwear that were too bad to go in with the rest of the wash. We speculated on where the socks and underwear could have come from, as such fripperies were denied to us on the farm. We also wondered about the manure, considering that no animals were in evidence here. Both, we concluded, must have been shipped in specifically from the outside. We found it in us to giggle, when the end of the visit was announced, over our own choice of conversational material for that precious quarter hour. Thereafter, when we could catch glimpses of each other during the day, we would exchange furtive signals, then go about our work exhilarated by the fiction that we had shared some priceless, cabalistic knowledge. The grim captain made an appearance in the rock quarry one morning, just as we were beginning work. He stood on top of a pile of stones, swinging his kidney sap from his wrist and letting his eyes sweep over us as though selecting one for the slaughter. When the silence had soaked in thoroughly, he announced in his cold, incisive tone that there will be no rest periods, no chow, nobody by, until this entire rock face is reduced to ballast rock. He indicated a towering slab of stone. We raised our heads only long enough to reassure ourselves of the utter hopelessness of the task before us. Not daring to look at each other closely, fearing to see our own despair reflected in the faces of the others, we picked up our hammers and crowbars and crawled to the top of the monolithic mass. The film must have been cleared from my eyes then, momentarily. Why, this thing is nothing but a huge writing slate, I said to a small, bald inmate beside me. He made a feeble noise in reply. The captain left, and the only other guard now relaxed in the shade of a border nearly fifty yards away. He was smoking a forbidden cigar. Suddenly and unaccountably, I felt a little taller than the others, and everything looked unnaturally clear. The slab was less than six inches wide at the top. If we work this thing right, this job will practically do it itself. We'll be through here before sundown, I heard myself snap out. The others, accustomed now to obey any imperative voice, fell to with the crowbars and the peeveries as I directed them. Use them as levers, I said. Don't just flail and hack pry. No one questioned me. When all the tools were in position, I gave the count. One, two, heave. 
The huge slab finally leaned out, wavered for a queasy moment, then fell with a splintering crash onto the boulders below. After the dust settled, we could see that much of the work of breaking up the mass was already accomplished. We descended and set to work with an enthusiasm that was new. Long before sundown, of course, we were marched back to the latrine and then to the mess hall. Later I had expected that some further work would be thrust upon us, but it didn't happen. The grim captain stopped me as I entered the mess hall. I froze. There was a queer smile on his face, and I had grown to fear novelty. You had a moment, he said simply and declaratively. You didn't miss it, did you? No, I replied, not fully understanding. No, I didn't miss it. You are more fortunate than most, he went on, still standing between me and the mess hall. Some people come here year after year, or they go to other places like this, or permit themselves to be confined in the holes of old submarines, and some even apprentice themselves to medical missionaries in equatorial Africa. They expose themselves to every conceivable combination of external conditions, but nothing really happens to them. They feel nothing except a fleeting sensation of contrast, soon lost in a torrent of other sensations. No moment, only a brief cessation of the continuing pleasure process. You have been one of the fortunate few, Mr. DeVoe. Then the film dissolved finally and completely from the surface of my brain, and my sense of time returned to me in a flood of orderly recollections. Hours and days began to arrange themselves in meaningful sequence. Was it possible that two whole glorious weeks could have passed so swiftly? You and Mrs. DeVoe may leave tonight or in the morning, just as you prefer, said the captain. Bertha and I have little to say to one another as we wait in the office for the car that will take us to the heliport. For the moment, this moment, it suffices that we stand here in our own clothes, that we have tasted coffee again brought to us on a tray by a matron whose manner towards us bordered on the obsequious, and that the aroma of a cigarette is just as gratifying as ever. We will go back to our ten-room apartment on the 91st floor of the new Empire State Hotel, back to our swimming pool, our three-dimensional color television, our anti-gravity sleeping chambers, our impeccably efficient, relentlessly cheerful robot servants, and our library of thrills, entertainment, solace, diversity, and escape, all impressed on magnetic tapes and awaiting our pleasure. I will go back to my five kinds of cigars and my sixteen kinds of brandy. Bertha will return to her endless fantasy of pastries and desserts, an endless, joyous parade of goodies, never farther away than the nearest dumbwaiter door and we will both become softer, heavier, a little less responsive. When it sometimes happens, the sweet lethargy threatens to choke off our breath. We will step into our flying platform and set its automatic controls for Miami, Palm Beach, or the Corps du Jour. There are conducted tours of the Himalayas now, or to the lost cities of the South American jungles, or to the bottom of any one of the seven seas. We will bide our time much as others do. I still have my four hours per month at Central Computing and Control. Bertha has her endless and endless varying work on committees. The last one was dedicated to the abolition of gambling at Las Vegas in favor of such wholesome games as Scrabble and Checkers. We cannot soften and slew away together, for when all else fails, when the last stronghold of the spirit is in peril, there is always the vision of the year's end and another glorious vacation. End of Two Whole Glorious Weeks by Will Moeller. Recorded by James Jenkins. Doctor by Murray Leinster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by MJ. Doctor by Murray Leinster. There were sons which were nearby and there were stars which were so far away that no way of telling their distance had any meaning. The suns had planets, most of which did not matter, but the ones that did count had seas and continents, and the continents had cities and highways and spaceports and people. The people paid no attention to their insignificance. They built ships which went through emptiness beyond imagining, and they landed upon planets and rebuilt them to their own liking. Suns flamed terribly, renting their impertinence, and storms swept across the planets they preempted. But the people built more strongly and were secure. Everything in the universe was bigger or stronger than the people. But they ignored the fact. They went about the businesses they had contrived for themselves. 
They were not afraid of anything until somewhere on a certain small planet, an infinitesimal single molecule changed itself. It was one molecule among unthinkably many, upon one planet of one solar system among uncountable star clusters. It was not exactly alive, but it acted as if it were, in which it was like all the important matter of the cosmos. It was actually a combination of two complicated substances, not too firmly joined together. When one of the parts changed, it became a new molecule. But like the original one, it was still capable of a process called autocatalysis. It practiced that process and catalyzed other molecules into existence, which in each case were duplicates of itself. Then mankind had to take notice Though it ignored flaming suns and monstrous storms and emptiness past belief, men called the new molecule a virus and gave it a name. They called it and its duplicates chlorophage. And chlorophage was, to people, the most terrifying thing in the universe. In a strictly temporary orbit around the planet Altera, the Queen Star floated while lift ships brought passengers and cargo to it. The ship was too large to be landed economically at an unimportant spaceport like Altera. It was a very modern ship, and it made the Regulus to Cassium run, which is 500 light years and only 50 days of Earth time. Now the lift ships were busy. There was an unusual number of passengers to board Queen Star at Altera, and an unusual number of them were women and children. The children tended to pudginess, and the women had a dieted look of the wives of well-to-do men. Most of them looked red-eyed, as if they had been crying. One by one, the lift ships hooked onto the airlock of the Star Queen and delivered passengers and cargo to the ship. Presently, the last of them was hooked on, and the last batch of passengers came through to the liner, and the ship's doctor watched them stream past him. His air was negligent, and he was actually impatient. Like most doctors, Nordenfeld, approved of lean children and weary women. They had fewer things wrong with them, and they responded better to treatment. Well, he was the doctor of the Star Queen, and he had much authority. He'd exerted it back on Regulus to insist that a shipment of botanical specimens for Cassium travel in quarantine. To be exact, in the ship's practically unused hospital compartment, and he was prepared to exercise authority over the passengers. He had a sheaf of health slips from the examiners on the ground below. There was one slip for each passenger. It certified that so-and-so had been examined and could safely be admitted to the Star Queen's air. Her fourth restaurant, her two swimming pools, her recreation areas, and the six levels of passenger cabins the ship contained. He impatiently watched the people go by, health slips or no health slips. He looked them over a characteristic gait, or a typical complexion tint, or even a certain lack of hair luster, could tell him things that ground physicians might miss. In such a case, the passengers would go back down again. It was not desirable to have deaths on a liner in space. Of course, nobody was ever refused passage because of chlorophage. If it were ever discovered, the discovery would already be too late. But the health regulations for space travel were very, very strict. He looked twice at a young woman as she passed. Despite applied complexion, there was a trace of waxiness in her skin. Nordenfeld had never actually seen a case of chlorophage. No doctor alive ever had. The best authorities were those who'd been in patrol ships during the quarantine of Cameroon, when chlorophage was loose on that planet. They'd seen beamed up pictures of patients, but not patients themselves. The patrol ships stayed in orbit while the planet died. Most doctors, and Nordenfeld was among them, had only seen pictures of the screens which showed the patients. He looked sharply at the young woman. Then he glanced at her hands. They were normal. The young woman went on, unaware that for the fraction of an instant, there had been the possibility of the landing of the Star Queen on Altera, and the destruction of her space drive, and the establishment of a quarantine, which, if justified, would mean that nobody could ever leave Altera again but must wait there to die, which would not be a long wait. A fat man puffed past. The gravity on Altera was some 5% under ship normal, and he felt the difference at once. But the veins at his temple were ungorged. 
Nordenfeld let him go by. There appeared a white-haired, space-tanned man with a briefcase under his arm. He saw Nordenfeld and lifted a hand in greeting. The doctor knew him. He stepped aside from the passengers and stood there. His name was Jensen, and he represented a fund which invested the surplus money of insurance companies. He traveled a great deal to check on the business interests of that organization. The doctor grunted, "What are you doing here? I thought you'd be on the far side of the cluster." "Oh, I get about," said Jensen. His manner was not quite normal. He was tense. "I got here two weeks ago on a Q and C tramp from Regulus. We were a shipload of salt meat. That's romance for you, salt meat by the space load." The doctor grunted again. All sorts of things move through space naturally. The Star Queen carried a botanical collection for a museum, and pig beryllium, and furs, and enzymes, and a list of items no man could remember. He watched the passengers go by, automatically counting them against the number of health slips in his hands. Lots of passengers this trip," said Jensen. "Yes," said the doctor, watching a man with a limp. "Why?" Jensen shrugged and did not answer. He was uneasy. The doctor noted. He and Jensen were as much unlike as two men could very well be, but Jensen was good company. A ship's doctor does not have much congenial society. The file of passengers ended abruptly. There was no one on the Star Queen's airlock, but the connected light still burned, and the doctor could look through into the small lift ship from the planet down below. He frowned. He fingered the sheaf of papers. Unless I miscount," he said annoyedly, "there's supposed to be one more passenger. I don't see." A door opened far back in the lift ship. A small figure appeared. It was a little girl, perhaps ten years old. She was very neatly dressed, though not quite the way a mother would have done it. She wore the carefully composed expression of a child with no adult in charge of her. She walked precisely from the lift ship into the Star Queen's lock. The opening closed briskly behind her. There was the rumbling of seals making themselves tight. The lights flickered for disconnect, and then all clear. They went out, and the lift ship had pulled away from the Star Queen. There is my missing passenger," said the doctor. The child looked soberly about. She saw him. "Excuse me," she said very politely. "Is this the way I'm supposed to go?" "Through the door," said the doctor gruffly. "Thank you," said the little girl. She followed his direction. She vanished through the door. It closed. There came a deep droning sound, which was the interplanetary drive of the Star Queen, building up that directional stress in space, which had seemed such a triumph when it was first contrived. The ship swung gently. It would be turning out from orbit around Altera. It swung again. The doctor knew that its astrogators were feeling for the incredibly exact pointing of its nose towards the next port, which modern commercial ship operation required. An error of fractional seconds of arc would mean valuable time lost in making port some ten light years of distance away. The drive droned and droned, building up velocity while the ship's aiming was refined and re-refined. The drive cut off abruptly. Jensen turned white. The doctor said impatiently, "There's nothing wrong. Probably a message or a report should have been beamed down to the planet, and somebody forgot. We'll go on in a minute." But Jensen stood frozen. He was very pale. The interplanetary drive stayed off, thirty seconds, a minute. Jensen swallowed audibly. Two minutes, three. The steady, monotonous drone began again. It continued interminably, as if while it was off, the ship's head had swung wide from its destination, and the whole business of lining up for a jump in overdrive had to be done all over again. Then there came that ping and the sensation of spiral fall, which meant overdrive. The droning ceased. Jensen breathed again. The ship's doctor looked at him sharply. Jensen had been taut. Now the tension had left his body, but he looked as if he were going to shiver. Instead, he mopped a suddenly streaming forehead. I think," said Jensen in a strange voice, "that I'll have a drink, or several. W- will you join me?" Nordenfeld searched his face. A ship's doctor has many duties in space. Passengers can have many things wrong with them. In the absolute isolation of overdrive, they can be remarkably affected by each other. I'll be at the fourth level bar in twenty minutes," said Nordenfeld. "Can you wait that long?" 
I, I probably won't wait to have a drink, said Jensen, but I'll be there. The doctor nodded curtly. He walked away. He made no guesses, though he just observed the new passengers carefully and was fully aware of the strict health regulations that affect space travel. As a physician, he knew that the most deadly thing in the universe was chlorophage, and that the planet Cameroon was only one solar system away. It had been one stop for the Star Queen until four years ago. He puzzled over Jensen's tenseness and the relief he displayed when the overdrive field came on, but he didn't guess. Chlorophage didn't enter his mind. Not until later. He saw the little girl who'd come out of the airlocks last of all the passengers. She sat on a sofa as if someone had told her to wait there until something or other was arranged. Dr. Nordenfeld barely glanced at her. He'd known Jensen for a considerable time. Jensen had been a passenger on the Star Queen half a dozen times, and he shouldn't have been upset by the temporary stoppage of an interplanetary drive. Nordenfeld divided people into two classes, those who were not and those who were worth talking to. There weren't many of the latter. Jensen was. He filed away the health slips, then thinking of Jensen's pallor, he asked what had happened to make the Star Queen interrupt her slow speed drive away from orbit around Altera. The pursuer told him, but the pursuer was fussily concerned because there were so many extra passengers from Altera, he might not be able to take on the expected number of passengers at the next stopover point. It would be bad business to have to refuse passengers. It would give the space line a bad name. Then the air officer stopped Nordenfeld as he was about to join Jensen on the fourth level bar. It was time for a medical inspection of the quarter acre of Banthian jungle which purified and renewed the air of the ship. Nordenfeld was expected to check the complex ecological system of the air room. Specifically, he was expected to look for and identify any patches of colorlessness appearing on the foliage of the jungle plants the Star Queen carries through space. The air officer was discreet, and Nordenfeld was silent about the ultimate reason for the inspection. Nobody liked to think about it, but if a particular kind of bleaching appeared, as if the chlorophyll of the leaves were being devoured by something too small to be seen by an optical microscope, why, that would be chlorophage. It would also be a death sentence for the Star Queen and everybody in her. But the jungle passed medical inspection. The plant grew lusciously in soil which periodically was flushed with hydroponic solution and then drained away again. The UV lamps were properly distributed and the different quarters of the air room were alternately lighted and darkened. And there was no colorless patches. A steady wind blew through the air room and had its excess moisture and unpleasing smells wrung out before it recirculated through the ship. Dr. Nordenfeld authorized the trimming of some liana-like growths which were developing woody tissue at the expense of leaves. The air officer also told him about the reason for the turning off of the interplanetary drive. He considered it a very curious happening. The doctor left the air room and passed the place where the little girl, the last passenger to board the Star Queen, waited patiently for somebody to arrange something. Dr. Nordenfeld took a lift to the fourth level and went into the bar where Jensen should be waiting. He was. He had an empty glass before him. Nordenfeld sat down and dialed for a drink. He had an indefinite feeling that something was wrong, but he couldn't put his finger on it. There was always something going wrong for a ship's doctor, though. There are so many demands on his patience that he is usually short of it. Jensen watched him sip at his drink. A bad day? he asked. He'd gone over his own tension. Nordenfeld shrugged, but his scowl deepened. There are a lot of new passengers. He realized that he was trying to explain his feelings to himself. They'll come to me feeling miserable. I have to tell each one of them that if they feel heavy and depressed, it may be the gravity constant of the ship, which is greater than their home planet. If they feel lightheaded and giddy, it may be because the gravity constant of the ship is less than they're used to. But it doesn't make them feel better, so they come back for a second assurance. I'll be overwhelmed with such complaints within two hours. Jensen waited. Then he said casually, too casually, Does anyone suspect chlorophage? No, said Nordenfeld shortly. Jensen fidgeted. He sipped. And then he said, What's the news from Cameroon, anyhow? There isn't any, said Nordenfeld. Naturally. Why ask? I just wondered, said Jensen. After a moment, what's the latest news? There hasn't been a message from Cameroon in two years, said Nordenfeld curtly. 
There is no sign of anything green anywhere on the planet. It's considered to be uninhabited. Jensen licked his lips. That's what I understood, yes. Nordenfeld drank half his drink and said unpleasantly, There were 30 million people in Cameroon when the chlorophage appeared. At first, it was apparently a virus which fed on the chlorophyll of plants. They died. Then it was discovered that it could also feed on hemoglobin, which is chemically close to chlorophyll. Hemoglobin is the red coloring matter of the blood. When the virus consumed it, people began to die. Cameroon doctors found that the chlorophage virus was transmitted by contact, by inhalation, by ingestion. It traveled as dust particles and on the feet of insects, and it was in drinking water and the air one breathed. The doctor in Cameroon warned spaceships off, and the patrol put a quarantine fleet in orbit around it to keep anyone from leaving. And nobody left. And everybody died. And so did every living thing that had chlorophyll in its leaves or hemoglobin in its blood. Or that needed plant or animal tissue to feed on. There's not a person left alive on Cameroon, nor an animal or bird or insect, nor fish, nor a tree, or plant or weed or blade of grass. There's no longer a quarantine fleet there. Nobody will go there. And there's nobody left to leave. But there are beacon satellites to record any calls and to warn any fool against landing. If the chlorophage got loose and was carried about by spaceships, it could kill the other 40 billion humans in the galaxy, together with every green plant or animal with hemoglobin in its blood. That, said Jensen and tried to smile, sounds final. It isn't, Nordenfeld told him. If there's something in the universe that can kill every living thing except its maker, that something should be killed. There should be research going on about the chlorophage. It would be deadly, dangerous work, but it should be done. A quarantine can't stop contagion. It can only hinder it. That's useful, but not enough. Jensen moistened his lips. Nordenfeld said abruptly, I've answered your question. Now, what's on your mind and what has it to do with chlorophage? Jensen started. He went very pale. It's not too late to do anything about it, said Nordenfeld. It's probably nonsense anyhow, but what is it? Jensen stammered out his story. It explained why there were so many passengers for the Star Queen. It even explained his departure from Altera. It was only a rumor, the kind of rumor that starts up untraceably and then can never be verified. This one was officially denied by the Alterian planetary government, but it was widely believed by the sort of people who usually were well informed, those who could send their families up to the Star Queen. And that was why Jensen had been tense and worried until the liner had actually left Altera behind. Then he felt safe. Nordenfeld's jaw set as Jensen told his tale. He made no comment. But when Jensen was through, he nodded and went away, leaving his drink unfinished. Jensen couldn't see his face. It was hard as granite. At Nordenfeld, the ship's doctor of the Star Queen went into the nearest bathroom and was violently sick. It was a reaction to what he had just learned. There were stars which were so far away that the distance didn't mean anything. There were planets beyond counting in a single star cluster, let alone the galaxy. There were comets and gas clouds in space, and worlds which there was life, and other worlds where life was impossible. The quantity of matter which was associated with life was infinitesimal, and the quantity associated with consciousness, animal life, was so much less that the difference couldn't be expressed. But the amount of animal life which could reason was so minute by comparison that the nearest ratio could be that of a single atom to a sun. Mankind, in fact, was the least impressive fraction of the smallest category of substance in the galaxy. But men did curious things. There was the cutting off of the Star Queen's short distance drive before she'd gotten well away from Altera. There had been a lift ship locked to the liner's passenger airlock. When the last passenger entered the big ship, a little girl, the airlocks disconnected and the lift ship pulled swiftly away. It was not quite two miles from the Star Queen when its emergency airlocks opened and space-suited figures plunged out of it to emptiness. Simultaneously, the ports of the lift ship glowed and almost immediately, the whole plating turned cherry red, crimson, and then orange from unlimited heat developed within it. The lift ship went incandescent and ruptured and there was a spout of hot white air and then it turned blue-white and it puffed itself to nothing. A metallic steam. Where it had been, 
there was only shining gas, which cooled. Beyond it, there were figures in the spacesuit which tried to swim away from it. The Star Queen's control room obviously saw the happening. The lift ship's atomic pile had flared out of control and melted down the ship. It had developed something like 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit where it ceased to flare. It did not blow up, it only vaporized. But the process must have begun within seconds after the ship broke contact with the Star Queen. In automatic reaction, the man in control of the liner cut her drive and offered to turn back and pick up the spacesuited figures in emptiness. The offer was declined with almost hysterical haste. In fact, it was barely made before the other lift ships moved in on rescue missions. They had waited, and they were picking up castaways before the Star Queen resumed its merely interplanetary drive and the process of aiming for a solar system some 30 light years away. When the liner flicked into overdrive, more than half the floating figures had been recovered, which was remarkable. It was almost as remarkable as the flare-up of the lift ship's atomic pile. One has to know exactly what to do to make a properly designed atomic pile vaporized metal. Somebody had known. Somebody had done it. And the other lift ships were waiting to pick up the destroyed lift ship's crew when it happened. The matter of the lift ship's destruction was fresh in Nordenfeld's mind when Jensen had told his story. The two items fit together with an appalling completeness. They left little doubt or hope. Nordenfeld consulted the passenger records and presently was engaged in conversation with a sober-faced, composed little girl on a sofa in one of the cabin levels of the Star Queen. You're Kathy Brand, I believe, he said matter-of-factly. I understand you've been having a rather bad time of it. She seemed to consider. It hasn't been too bad, she assured him. At least I've been seeing new things. I got dreadfully tired of seeing the same thing all the time. What things? asked Nordenfeld. His expression was not stern now, though his inner sensations were not pleasant. He needed to talk to this child, and he had learned how to talk to children. The secret is to talk exactly as to an adult, with respect and interest. There weren't any windows, she explained, and my father couldn't play with me, and all the toys and books were ruined by the water. It was dreadfully tedious. There weren't any other children, you see, and presently there weren't any grown-ups but my father. Nordenfeld only seemed more interested. He'd been almost sure ever since knowing of the lift ship's destruction and listening to Jensen's account of the rumors the government of Volterra denied. He was horribly sure now. How long were you in the place that hadn't any windows? Oh, dreadfully long, she said, since I was only six years old. Almost half my life. She smiled brightly at him. I remember looking out the windows and even playing out of doors, but my father and mother said I had to live in this place. My father talked to me often and often. He was very nice, but he had to wear that funny suit and kept the glass over his face because he didn't live in the room. The glass was because he went under the water, you know. Nordenfeld asked carefully conversational sounding questions. Kathy Bran, now aged 10, had been taken by her father to live in a big room without any window. It hadn't any doors either. There were plants in it, and there were bluish lights to shine on the plants. There was a place in one corner where there was water. When her father came in to talk to her, he came up out of the water wearing the funny suit with glass over his face. He went out the same way. There was a place in the wall where she would look out into another room, and at first her mother used to come and smile at her through the glass, and she talked into something she held in her hand. Her voice came inside. But later, she stopped coming. There was only one possible kind of place which would answer Kathy's description. When she was six years old, she had been put into some university's aseptic environment room, and she stayed there. Such rooms were designed for biological research. They were built and then made sterile of all bacterial life and afterward entered through a tank of antiseptic. Anyone who entered wore a suit which were made germ-free by its passage through the antiseptic and he did not breathe the air of the aseptic room but air which was supplied him through a hose. The exhaled air hose also passed under the antiseptic outside. No germ or microbe or virus could possibly get into such a room without being bathed in corrosive fluid which would kill it. So long as there was someone alive outside to take care of her, a little girl could live there and defy even chlorophage. And Kathy Brand had done it. 
But on the other hand, Cameroon was the only planet where it would be necessary, and it was the only world from which a father would land his small daughter on another planet's spaceport. There was no doubt. Nordenfeld grimly imagined someone. He would have had to be a microbiologist even to attempt it. Fighting to survive and defeat the chlorophage, while he kept his little girl in an aseptic environment room. She explained quite pleasantly as Nordenfeld asked more questions. There had been other people besides her father, but for a long time there had been only him, and Nordenfeld computed that somehow she'd been kept alive on the dead planet Cameroon for four long years. Recently though, very recently, her father told her that they were leaving. Wearing his funny antiseptic wetted suit, he'd enclosed her in a plastic bag with a tank attached to it. Air flowed from the tank into the bag and out through a hose that was all wetted inside. She breathed quite comfortably. It made sense. An air tank could be heated and its contents sterilized to supply germ-free or virus-free air. And Kathy's father took an axe and chopped away a wall of the room. He picked her up, still inside the plastic bag, and carried her out. There was nobody about. There was no grass. There were no trees. Nothing moved. Here, Kathy's account was vague, but Nordenfeld could guess at the strangeness of a dead planet. To the child who barely remembered anything but the walls of an aseptic environment room, her father carried her to a little ship. Said Kathy, and they talked a lot after the ship took off. He told her that he was taking her to a place where she could run about outdoors and play. But he had to go somewhere else. He did mysterious things, which to Nordenfeld meant the most scrupulous decontamination of a small spaceship's interior and its airlock. Its outer surface would reach a temperature at which no organic material would remain uncooked. And finally, said Kathy, her father had opened the door and told her to step out and goodbye, and she did, and the ship went away. Her father, still wearing his funny suit. And people came and asked her questions she did not understand. Kathy's narrative fitted perfectly into the rumor Jensen had circulated among usually well-informed people on the Terra. They believe, said Jensen, that a small spaceship had appeared in the sky above Altera spaceport. It ignored all calls, landed swiftly, opened an airlock, and let someone out, and plunged for the sky again. And the story said that radar telescopes immediately searched for it and found the ship in space. They trailed it, calling vainly for it to identify itself while it drove at top speed for Altera's sun. It reached the sun and dived in. Nordenfeld reached the skipper on intercom vision phone. Jensen had been called there to repeat his tale to the skipper. I've talked to the child, said Nordenfeld grimly, and I'm putting her into isolation quarters in the hospital compartment. She's from Cameroon. She was kept in an aseptic environment room at some university or other. She says her father looked after her. I get an impression of a last-ditch fight by microbiologists against the chlorophage. They lost it. Apparently, her father landed her in Altera and dived into the sun. From her story, he took every possible precaution to keep her from contagion or carrying contagion from her to Altera. Maybe he exceeded. There's no way to tell yet. The skipper listened in silence. Jensen said thinly, "Then the story about the landing was true. Yes, the authorities isolated her and then shipped her off on the Star Queen. Your well-informed friends, Jensen, didn't know what their government was going to do." Nordenfeld paused and said more coldly still, "They didn't handle it right. They should have killed her, painlessly, but at once." Her body should have been immersed with everything that had touched it in full-strength nitric acid. The same acid should have saturated the place where the ship landed, and every place she walked, every room she entered, and every hall she passed through should have been doused with nitric acid and then burned. It would still not have been all one could wish. The air she breathed couldn't be recaptured and heated white hot, but the chances for Altera's population to go on living would be improved. Instead, they isolated her and they shipped her off with us, and thought they were accomplishing something by destroying the lift ship that had had her in an airtight compartment. And thought they were accomplishing something by destroying the lift ship that had had her in an airtight compartment until she walked into the Star Queen's lock. The skipper said heavily, "Do you think 
she brought chlorophage on board? I have no idea, said Nordenfeld. If she did, it's too late to do anything but drive the Star Queen into a nearest sun. No, before that, one should give warning that she was aground on Altera. No ship should land there. No ship should take off. Altera should be blocked off from the rest of the galaxy like Cameroon was, and to the same end result. Jensen said unsteadily, There will be some trouble if it is known on the ship. There will be some unwillingness to sacrifice themselves. Sacrifice? said Nordenfeld. They're dead. Before they lie down, they can keep everybody they care about from dying too. Would you want to land and have your wife and family die of it? The skipper said in the same heavy voice, What are the probabilities? You say there was an effort to keep her from contagion. What are the odds? Bad, said Nordenfeld. The man tried for the child's sake, but I doubt he managed to make a complete aseptic transfer from the room she lived in to the spaceport on Altera. The authorities on their terra should have known it. They should have killed her and destroyed everything she touched, and still the odds would have been bad. Jensen said, But you can't do that, Nordenfeld. Not now. I shall take every measure that seems likely to be useful. Then Nordenfeld snapped. Damnation, man. Do you realize that this chlorophage can wipe out the human race if it really gets loose? Do you think I'll let sentiment keep me from doing what has to be done? He flicked off the vision phone. The Star Queen came out of overdrive. Her skipper arranged it to be done at the time when the largest possible number of her passengers and crew would be asleep. Those who were awake, of course, felt a peculiar inaudible sensation which one subjectively translated into sound. They felt a momentary glidiness which, having no natural parallel, feels like the sensation of treading on a stair step that isn't there. Combined with a twisting sensation, so it is like a spiral fall. The passengers who were awake were mostly in the bars, and the bartenders explained that the ship had shifted overdrive generators, and there was nothing to it. Those who were asleep started awake, but there was nothing in their surrounding to cause alarm. Some blinked in the darkness of their cabin, and perhaps turned on the cabin lights, but everything seemed normal. They turned off the lights again. Some babies cried and had to be soothed. But there was nothing except wakening to alarm anybody. Babies went back to sleep and mothers turned to their beds and, such awakenings were customary, went back to sleep also. It was natural enough. There were vague and commonplace noises, together making an indefinite hum. Fans circulated the ship's purified and reinvigorated air. Service motors turned in remote parts of the hull. Cooks and bakers moved about in the kitchens. Nobody could tell by any physical sensation that the Star Queen was not in overdrive, except in the control room. There the stars could be seen. They were unthinkably remote. The ship was light years from any place where humans lived. She did not drive. Her skipper had a family on Kasim. He would not land a plague ship which might destroy them. The executive officer had a small son. If his return meant that small son's death as well as his own, he would not return. All through the ship, the officers who had known the situation recognized that if Chlorophage had gotten onto Star Queen, the ship must not land anywhere. Nobody could survive. Nobody must attempt it. So the huge liner hung in the emptiness between the stars, waiting until it could be known definitely that Chlorophage was aboard or that with absolute certainty it was absent. The question was up to Dr. Nordenfeld. He had isolated himself with Kathy in the ship's hospital compartment. Since the ship was built, it had been used once by a grown man who developed mumps and once by an adolescent boy who developed a raging fever which antibiotics stopped. Health measures for space travel were strict. The hospital compartment had only been used those two times. On this voyage, it had been used to contain an assortment of botanical specimens from a planet 70 light years beyond Regulus. They were on their way to the botanical research laboratory on Kasim. As a routine precaution, they'd been placed in the hospital, which could be fumigated when they were taken out. Now the doctor had piled them in one side of the compartment, which had been divided in half with a transparent plastic sheet. He stayed in that side. Kathy occupied the other. She had some flowering plants to look at and admire. They'd come from the air room, and she was delighted with their coloring and beauty. But Dr. Nordenfeld had put them there as a continuing test for chlorophage. If Kathy carried that murderous virus on her person, the flowering plants would die of it, 
probably even before she did. It was a scrupulously scientific test for the deadly stuff. Completely sealed off except for a circulator to freshen the air she breathed, Kathy was settled with toys and picture books. It was an improvised but well-designed germ-proof room. The air for Kathy to breathe was sterilized before it reached her. The air she had breathed was sterilized as it left her plastic-sided residence. It should be the perfection of protection for the ship, if it was not already too late. The vision phone buzzed. Dr. Nordenfeld stirred in his chair and flipped the switch. The Star Queen's skipper looked at him out of the screen. I've cut the overdrive, said the skipper. The passengers haven't been told. Very sensible, said the doctor. When will we know? That we can go on living? When the other possibility is exhausted. Then how will we know? Said the skipper stonily. Dr. Nordenfeld ticked off the possibilities. He bent down a finger. One, her father took great pains. Maybe he did manage an aseptic transfer from a germ-free room to Altera. Kathy may not have been exposed to the chlorophage. If she hasn't, no bleached spots will show up on the air room foliage or among the flowering plants in the room with her. Nobody in the crew or among the passengers will die. He bent down a second finger. It is probably more likely that white spots will appear on the plants in the air room and here, and people will start to die. That would mean Kathy brought contagion here the instant she arrived, and almost certainly that Altera will become like Cameroon, uninhabited. In such a case, we are finished. He bent down a third finger. Not so likely, but preferable. White spots may appear on the foliage inside the plastic with Kathy, but not in the ship's air room. In that case, she was exposed, but the virus was incubating when she came on board, and only developed and spread after she was isolated. Possibly, in such a case, we can save the passengers and crew, but the ship will probably have to be melted down in space. It would be tricky, but it might be done. The skipper hesitated. If that last happened, she... I will take whatever measures are necessary, said Dr. Nordenfeld. To save your conscience, we won't discuss them. They should have been taken on Altera. He reached over and flipped off the phone. Then he looked up and into the other part of the ship's hospital space. Kathy came out from behind the screen where she'd made ready for bed. She was beaming. She had a large picture book under one arm and a doll under the other. It's all right for me to have these with me, isn't it, Dr. Nordenfeld? She asked hopefully. I didn't have any picture books but one, and it got worn out, and my doll. It was dreadful how shabby she was. The doctor frowned. She smiled at him. He said, after all, picture books are made to be looked at and dolls to be played with. She skipped to the tiny hospital bed on the far side of the presumably virus-proof partition. She climbed into it and zestfully arranged the doll to share it. She placed the book with an easy reach. She said, I think my father would say you were very nice, Dr. Nordenfeld, to look after me so well. No, said the doctor in a detached voice. I'm just doing what anybody ought to do. She snuggled down under the covers. He looked at his watch and shrugged. It was very easy to confuse the official night with official day in space. Everybody else was asleep. He'd been putting Kathy through tests which had begun with measures of pulse and respiration and temperature and went on from there. Kathy managed them herself, under his direction. He settled down with one of the medical books he'd brought into the isolation section with him. Its title was Decontamination of Infectious Material from Different Planets. He read it grimly. The time came when the Star Queen should have come out of overdrive, with the sun Circe blazing fiercely nearby, and a green planet with ice caps to be approached on interplanetary drive. There should have been droning, comforting drive noises to assure the passengers, who naturally could not see beyond the ship's steel walls, that they were within a mere few million miles of a world where sunshine was normal, and skies were higher than ship ceilings, and there were fascinating things to see and do. Some of the passengers packed their luggage and put it outside the cabins to be picked up for landing, but no stewards came for it. Presently, there was an explanation. The ship had run under maximum speed and the planet fall would be delayed. The passengers were disappointed, but not concerned. The luggage vanished into cabins again. The Star Queen floated in space among a thousand, thousand million stars. 
her astrogators had computed the course to the nearest star into which to drive the Star Queen. But it would not be used unless there was a mutiny among the crew. It would be better to go into remote orbit around Circe 3 and give the news of Chlorophage on the Terra if Dr. Nordenfeld reported it on the ship. Time passed. One day, two, three. Then Jensen called the hospital compartment on vision phone. His expression was dazed. Nordenfeld saw the interior of the control room behind Jensen. He said, You're a passenger, Jensen. How is it you're in the control room? Jensen moistened his lips. The skipper thought I'd better not associate with the other passengers. I've stayed with the officers the past few days. We, the ones who know what's in prospect, were keeping separate from the others, so nobody will let anything out by accident. Very wise. When the skipper comes back on duty, ask him to call me. I have something interesting to tell him. He's checking something now, said Jensen. His voice was thin and reedy. The air officer reports there are white patches on the plants in the air room. They're growing fast, he told me to tell you. He's gone to make sure. No need, said Nordenfeld bitterly. He swung the vision screen. It faced that part of the hospital space beyond the plastic sheeting. There were potted flowering plants there. They had pleased Kathy. They shared her air, and there were white patches on her leaves. I thought, said Nordenfeld with an odd, mirthless levity, that the skipper would be interested. It is of no importance, however, now, but I've accomplished something remarkable. Kathy's father didn't manage in a septic transfer. She brought the chlorophage with her, but I confined it. The plants on the far side of that plastic sheet show the chlorophage patches plainly. I expect Kathy to show signs of anemia shortly. I decided that dramatic measures would have to be taken, and it looked like they might work because I've confined the virus. It's where Kathy is, but it isn't where I am. All the botanical specimens on my side of the sheets are untouched. The phage hasn't hit them. It is remarkable, but it doesn't matter a damn if the air room is infected. But I was so proud. Jensen did not respond. Nordenfeld said ironically, Look what I've accomplished! I protected the air plants on my side. See? They're beautifully green. No signs of infection. It means that a man can work with chlorophage. A laboratory ship could land on Cameroon and keep itself the equivalent of an aseptic environment room while the damned chlorophage was investigated and ultimately whipped. And it doesn't matter. Jensen said numbly, We can't ever make port. We ought, we ought to. We'll take the necessary measures, Nordenfeld told him. Very quietly and very efficiently, with neither the crew nor the passengers knowing that Altera sent the chlorophage on board the Star Queen in hopes of banishing it from there. The passengers won't know that their own officials sent it off with them as they tried to run away. And I was so proud that I'd improvised an aseptic room to keep Kathy in. I sterilized the air that went into her and I sterilized... Then he stopped. He stopped quite short. He stared at the air unit set up and with two pipes passing through the plastic partition which cut the hospital space in half. He turned utterly white. He went through to the air machine. He jerked back its covers. He put his hand inside. Minutes later, he faced back to the vision screen from which Jensen looked apathetically at him. Tell the skipper to call me, he said in a savage tone. Tell him to call me instantly he comes back before he issues any orders at all. He bent over the sterilizing equipment and carefully began to disassemble it. He had it completely apart when Kathy waked. She peered at him through the plastic separation sheet. Good morning, Dr. Nordenfeld, she said cheerfully. The doctor grunted. Kathy smiled at him. She had gotten on very good terms with the doctor since she had been kept in the ship's hospital. She did not feel that she was isolated, and having the doctor where she could talk to him at any time, she had much more company than ever before. She had read her entire picture book to him and discussed her doll at length. She took it for granted that when he did not answer or frown that he was simply busy. But he was company because she could see him. Dr. Nordenfeld put the air apparatus together with an extremely peculiar expression on his face. It had been built for Kathy's special isolation by a ship's mechanic. It should sterilize the used air going into Kathy's part of the compartment and it should sterilize the used air pushed out by the supplied fresh air. The hospital itself was an independent sealed unit with its own chemical air freshener, and it had been divided into two. The air freshener was where Dr. Nordenfeld could attend to it, and the sterilizer pump simply shared the freshener with Kathy. But 
But the pipe that dumped air to Kathy was brown and discolored from having been used for sterilizing, and the pump that brought air back was not. It was cold. It had never been heated. So Dr. Nordenfeld had been exposed to any contagion Kathy could spread. He hadn't been protected at all. Yet the potted plants on Kathy's side of the barrier were marked with great white splotches which grew almost as one looked while the botanical specimens on the doctor's part of the hospital, as much infected as Kathy could have been, by failure of the ship's mechanic to build the sterilizer to work both ways. The stacked plants, the alien plants, the strange plants from 70 light years beyond the regulars, they were vividly green. There was no trace of chlorophage on them, yet they had been as thoroughly exposed as Dr. Nordenfeld himself. The doctor's hands shook. His eyes burned. He took out a surgeon's scalpel and ripped a plastic partition from floor to ceiling. Kathy watched interestedly. Why did you do that, Dr. Nordenfeld? She asked. He said in an emotionless, unnatural voice. I'm going to do something that it was very stupid of me not to do before. It should have been done when you were six years old, Kathy. It should have been done on Cameroon. And after that, on Aterra. Now we're going to do it here. You can help me. The Star Queen had floated out of overdrive long enough to throw all distance computations off. She swung about and swam back, and presently she was not too far from the world where she was now many days overdue. Lift ships started up from the planet's surface, but the Star Queen ordered them back. Get your spaceport health officer on the vision phone, ordered the Star Queen's skipper. We have chlorophage on board. There was panic. Even at a distance of 100,000 miles, Chlorophage could strike stark terror into anybody. But presently, the image of the spaceport health officer appeared on the Star Queen's screen. We're not landing, said Dr. Nordenfeld. There's almost certainly an outbreak of chlorophage on Altera, and we're going back to do something about it. It got on our ship with passengers from there. We've whipped it, but we may need some help. The image of the health officer aground was a mask of horror for seconds after Nordenfeld's last statement. Then, his expression became incredulous, though still horrified. We came on to here, said Dr. Nordenfeld, to get you to send word by the first other ship to the patrol that a quarantine has to be set up on Altera, and we need to be inspected for recovery from chlorophage infection, and we need to pass on, officially, the discovery that whipped the contagion on the ship. We were carrying botanical specimens to Casim, and we discovered that they were immune to chlorophage. That's absurd, of course. Their green coloring is the same substance as in plants under soul type suns anywhere. They couldn't be immune to chlorophage, so there had to be something else. Was, was there? asked the health officer. There was. Those specimens came from somewhere beyond Regulus. They carried, as normal symbiotes under foliage, microorganisms unknown both on Cameroon and Altera. The alien bugs are almost the size of virus particles, feed on virus particles, and are carried by contact, air, and so on as readily as virus particles themselves. We washed them off the leaves of the plant, sprayed them in our air room jungle, and they multiplied faster than the chlorophage. Our whole air supply is now loaded with an airborne anti-chlorophage organism, which has made our crew and passengers immune. We're heading back to Altera to turn loose our merry little bugs on that planet. It appears they grow on certain vegetation, but they'll live anywhere there's phage to eat. We're keeping some chlorophage cultures alive so our microorganisms don't die out for lack of food. The medical officer on the ground gasped. Keeping phage alive? I hope you've recorded this, said Nordenfeld. It's rather important. This trick should be done on Cameroon and Altera, and everywhere else new diseases have turned up. When there's a bug on one planet that's deadly to us, there's bound to be a bug on some other planet that's deadly to it. The same goes for any pest or vermin, the principles of natural enemies. All we have to do is find the enemies. There was more communication between the Star Queen and the spaceport on Circe 3, which the Star Queen would not make other contact with on this trip. And presently, the big liner headed back to Altera. It was necessary for official as well as humanitarian reasons. There would be a health examination of the Star Queen to certify that it was safe for passengers to breathe her air and eat in her restaurants and swim in her swimming pools and occupy the six levels of passenger cabins she contained. This would have to be done by a patrol ship, which would turn up at Altera. The Star Queen skipper would be praised by his owner for not having driven the liner into a star 
and the pursuer will be forgiven for his confusion in his records due to off-schedule operation of the big ship. And Jensen would find in the ending of all terror of chlorophage an excellent reason to look for appreciation in the value of the investments he was checking up. And Dr. Nordenfeld. He talked very gravely to Kathy. I'm afraid, he told her, that your father isn't coming back. What would you like to do? She smiled at him hopefully. Could I be a little girl? She asked. Dr. Nordenfeld grunted. Hmm, I'll think about it. But he smiled at her. She grinned at him. And it was settled. End of Doctor by Murray Leinster Recorded by MJ Mimsy's Joke by Millard Grimes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz Mimsy's Joke by Millard Grimes Nance smiled foolishly. The long trip back to Earth from Mars wouldn't at all be dull. It might well be one long, delicious chuckle over a great, grim, and incredible joke. And wouldn't Nance's little cocker spaniel appreciate it most of all? He was lying in the grass, and his cute little cocker spaniel was nibbling on his ear when the message came. He was breathing the fragrant air of spring and feeling cool spring breeze and the solid earth under the grass beneath him, while the dog with doleful eyes delighted him with her tricks. His name was Oscar Nance, and he was the world's top archaeologist. That's why the message came to him when the UN began selecting a crew for Earth's first expedition to Mars. We want you, the message read. It was an invitation that was difficult to refuse. He cuffed the cocker on the ear. She barked softly and let her tongue hang out at the cutest angle. Goodbye, Mimsy, he said. The dog was all he had on this world. I'll miss you, lady, Nance told the dog. She licked his hand. Then Nance raised his six-three form from the soft grass and started with a careless gait toward the boarding house where he lived during infrequent visits to his hometown. Usually he took Mimsy with him on his trips, but he knew this trip would not be available for pets. He stopped at the house and told his landlady to be sure and take care of the dog while he was gone. I sure will, the landlady told him. She already had Mimsy's supper of liver and dog biscuits waiting on the hearth. A day later, Oscar Nance became a part of man's greatest adventure. The place where the first Earth ship to Mars landed was very cold and very dead. The commander of the expedition was a gruff, retired army general, who had a smattering of science and a great deal of command. His crew, with the exception of two handymen, was composed of the leading persons in all branches of Terran science. None of them were women, and most of them were young. Oscar Nance was thirty-four. He had been around the world ten times, with particular emphasis on Easter Island and the Antarctica. The ship had taken two weeks to bridge the gap between Earth and Mars. The voyage had been smooth. Every man aboard knew his job, and they were following a plan that the UN had worked on for twenty years. Boone, the commander, had been a top general in World War III. He was efficient, stern, colorless to the point that he was almost colorful. Immediately upon landing, Boone had dispatched two cats to take the first steps onto Mars. The cats suffered no ill effects, and now the commander was preparing for the crew to explore the new world. He pointed to Nance and zoologist Braun. You, Nance, and Braun, and myself will form one group, he said. He quickly divided the remaining twelve men into three groups. One was to stay at the ship, the other two would be exploring units. When the small group of Earthmen descended from the ship to alien soil, Commander Boone's businesslike manner seemed to take much of the glamour from the moment. No heroics, Commander? Physicist Allgood asked. Boone was not a man for ceremony. We're here, he said. We must see what is here. We must get back. What was there was not a great deal. 
Some vegetation did exist, and there was a thin coat of snow spread over the few scraggly trees. Commander Boone surveyed the surrounding land through his spyglass, then suddenly lowered it with a set expression on his face. There's a city to the north, he announced. He checked the group's immediate enthusiasm with a harsh bellow. There's no movement there, he barked. And from the looks of the buildings, there's been no life there for centuries. However, if there is intelligent life, we will find it there. But it may not be friendly. Boone studied the buildings to the north for another moment, then turned to Nance and Braun. We three will explore the city, he rasped into the thin air. You others will fan out in other directions and meet back here in an hour. He paused emphatically. If we do not come back, bring every weapon in the ship when you come to get us. I repeat, life here, if any, may not be friendly. That is why we can't afford to risk the whole party on an expedition to the city. Nance and Braun followed the stern old general as he set out on foot in a northward direction. The other parties went their own way. The three men spoke sparingly during the hour's walk to the buildings. Mars was too quiet, almost like a funeral parlor, Nance thought, and perhaps the corpses were waiting on their slabs in the city now rising before them. The air was tolerable but cold, and the sun was fighting a losing battle with a heavy fog. Nance finally made out the form of the structures when they were only a mile away. As they drew nearer, he noticed that the buildings were made of solid stone, apparently, and rivaled the pyramids in height. There were gigantic cracks in the walls of many, and a few had crumbled to the ground. As the three entered the city, Nance dropped to his knees and examined the stone closely. Good lord, he gasped. Mars must have been deserted for thousands of years. It would require that long for stone like this to deteriorate. Boone stared at the winding street between the fallen buildings. Then no intelligent life exists here, he said. Braun looked up from a small flower which he'd found. I challenge that statement, Commander, he said. Life could exist here today. Perhaps the life that is here just doesn't know how to keep house very well, and let the work of its ancestors go to ruin. Well then, let's investigate, Boone ordered. He led the way into the nearest structure, a gnarled hand falling close to the automatic which hung at its side. But there was nothing in the building save the rubble of a dead civilization and rusted machines which once must have given life and meaning to Mars. They left and went on to the second building. Here they found life. Life was in a back room that had one small window to admit light. Nance entered. The light was so dim that he did not see it at first. He saw it when it moved slowly, clumsily in a far corner, as if awakening from a long sleep. Nance quickly shone his flashlight over the room and on to the life. Commander Boone, Braun, come here, he shouted. The other two men were at his side almost instantly. Nance directed his beam of light to the face of the creature in the corner. The creature looked remarkably like a man. He had huge jowls and long overlapping ears and was somewhat fat. He blinked tiny eyes at the light for a moment and finally managed to get a look at his visitors. In English, he growled, So you've come at last. The flash quivered in Nance's hand. He remembered his first trip into the pyramids, and suddenly he knew how he would have felt if King Tut's mummy had spoken to him in English. Boone's voice quavered. It speaks English. That's not possible. It was gruff, drawling English, sometimes not plain, but it was English, and it kept coming. I've waited so long, the creature said. He lifted an arm in welcome. Nance noted the fingers were joined together. I've waited and paid with each moment for an error my ancestors made. He moved his shaggy head and surveyed the crumbled room. Now my abode is not fit to receive guests, he rumbled. Who 
What are you? Commander Boone managed, making a gallant effort to sound authoritative. Braun suddenly laughed. He looks like a comic strip St. Bernard, he roared, and then laughed some more at the thought. Boone glared at him, obviously not sharing his mirth. The creature laughed also. He leaned his head back and laughed uproariously. My name is Stang, he said. I am a Martian, naturally, in your language. And I am something more than a Martian, in your language. A new wave of laughter shook the creature. Are there any more here like you? Commander Boone demanded. A few, just a few, Stang said. But won't you sit down? There's not much to offer you in the way of comfort, but the floor will do. There must be things you'd like to ask me. Stang rose to his feet with evident effort. Moving, he grunted. How I detest moving. He took a box from an indenture in the wall and began eating the contents, apparently a type of meat. He ate the bone and all. Stang glared at his guests through shaggy eyebrows and smiled. You're puzzled, he said. You don't understand my knowing about you, do you? He seemed extremely pleased with himself. Nance began doing the talking. Do you mean Martians have visited the Earth, he asked. Stang chuckled loudly. Yes, yes, I do mean that. Come, let me tell you a story, my friends. I am sure you will find it most interesting. Wait a minute, Boone barked, his hand now touching his gun. We're here for facts. You're coming back to our ship, peacefully or by force. Peacefully, I assure you, Commander, Stang said. But my story... Let him tell it, Braun said. Maybe it will explain things. And a lot needs explaining. He seems to have been expecting us. I have, I have, the Martian muttered, disposing of the last of his food. He threw the box into a corner already piled high with rubble. You saw the buildings here in this, what was once a great city. These buildings are a few which are left of a civilization which grew weary. "'Twas not a young race as the one which fostered your world, "'but an old race which tired of working, even of thinking. "'The civilization went untended, "'until finally my ancestors decided they would have to invade another world "'to find servants to relieve Martians of the work and the thinking, "'which they had grown to dislike so much. They reasoned that with proper servants they would have nothing to do but eat and sleep as they wanted. So my people invaded another planet. You had space travel then, Boone demanded? How long ago was this? Three thousand, maybe four thousand years ago, as you count time. But with space travel four thousand years ago, Nance stammered, it seems the first planet you would have visited would have been ours. Earth. Stang laughed again. Perhaps it was, he said. But let me finish my story. As I said, my people were fat and lazy as I am now. Thus, open fighting as a means of bringing another race to be our slaves was out of the question. They had to find another way. And they did. Our first troops were sent to Agar, and they reported very satisfactory results. Soon, practically the whole population migrated to Agar, and the Agarians became our slaves. A few Martians, such as my ancestors, remained here. They kept the record of this invasion and also recorded all correspondence between this planet and Agar. Oh, would they had gone also so that today I would have nothing to do but eat and sleep as most of my race does, on Agar. He yawned at the thought. Do not think badly of my race, he implored suddenly. Some day your people will also grow old and tired. Boone grabbed Stang by the arm and shook him firmly. But where does Earth come in, he demanded. 
Stang gazed at the stern old general, and then once again burst into peals of laughter. You see, he giggled, we Martians have another name for your Earth. We call it Agar. Your world is the one my ancestors invaded thousands of years ago. Your people are my people's slaves until today. Wha what is he saying? Nance stammered. You're crazy, Boone bellowed. Now I know that you are crazy. That was the nice thing about our invasion, Stang explained patiently. The Earthmen did not even realize that they were being invaded, do not even realize today that they are slaves. My people in their long stay on Earth have grown even lazier, and particularly their brains have become sluggish during the long years of inaction. Also, there have been slight handicaps incurred because of conditions on your world. For thousands of years, there was regular communication between this planet and our invaders on Earth. The records were kept faithfully by the few Martians remaining here, and in my long years of almost complete solitude, I learned your language and the history of my people on your world. I knew that perhaps in my lifetime Earth men would reach this planet. One of my people predicted in 1396 that your world would attain space travel in the latter part of the 20th century. Nance stumbled for words. What creatures of Earth could this being be speaking of that had such power and progress? But Stang was talking again in his gruff tones. Correspondence ceased before my birth. I suppose my people grew too lazy but the main objective had been reached. There is no work for the higher-class Martians on your world, only an easy life with servants plenteous. Wait, spoke up Braun. You said higher-class Martian. Are there different breeds? Oh, there are many breeds of Martians. Naturally, we had a slave type here in the height of our civilization, and these slaves were worked into your scheme of things to continue being slaves. They aid you, Earthmen, so that you may better serve the aristocrat Martians. But why haven't we seen the Martians, Braun exclaimed? I've seen nothing on Earth like you. No, said Stang. Our records say you Earthmen love us and are happy to serve. Nance began studying Stang's features with a practiced eye, the incredibility of his thoughts silencing his tongue. But suddenly he realized that the creature was telling the truth, to a point. He knew that Martians had invaded Earth. Look at him, Commander, Nance said. Don't you see the resemblance? Martians are on Earth, but we call them... Good grief, exclaimed Commander Boone. Stang snickered. You call us man's best friend, I believe, he offered. Braun gasped. Dogs. Of course, Nance said. Notice Stang's droopy ears, the long nose, his hands and feet resemble paws, and since Earth's gravity is greater than Mars's, wouldn't that tend to pull a person's arms toward the ground? making them essentially four-footed instead of two-armed and two-legged as Stang still is? That's what happened to the Martians when they came to Earth, but I don't suppose they cared. It probably made it easier to walk, and they got what they wanted. After all, don't we feed the dogs, provide them a place to sleep? They have no real work to do, and only a few are mistreated. Hounds and others of that type must be the slaves Stang is speaking of. The poodles, terriers, and cockers, those strictly pets, must be the higher type. He almost choked when he got to Cocker. He tried not to think of Mimsy as an invader, with him as her slave, but he realized that it amounted to that. Now the landlady was being her slave. Braun couldn't restrain another wild laugh as he stared at Stang. Why, he is a St. Bernard, he roared. A bewildered expression covered Boone's stern face. The irony, he gasped. 
But you're right. The dogs do lead the kind of life on Earth that would be desirable to creatures grown too lazy to even think. But to imagine that the ancestors of our dogs once built this city. It's incredible. Good Lord, Braun remarked. Here we have been expecting and talking about invasions from Mars for years, and we'd already been invaded centuries ago. What a laugh they must have had. Stang was listening in in obvious amusement. Our invasion was logical, he said. Done in a way so as not to offend anyone. Although one creature has resented our invasion and fought it continuously. It is called a flea, I believe. But the records say men have done everything possible to rid us of this pest. Even the great rulers of your land, who are waited on hand and foot, are servants of we Martians. Boone raised his hand for silence. His features were crestfallen. His expedition had not uncovered what Earth would be glad to hear. We must go, he said, but the old authority was gone from his voice. Stang raised himself to elbows. Wait, will you not take me with you? Boone paused and looked back at the shaggy figure in the gloom. He could see Stang trudging a snowy path with a keg of brandy around his neck. Almost instinctively, he patted Stang on the head. No, old boy, he said. You stay here and put this in the record. Braun whispered to Nance. Evidently, the commander has a dog to whom he's not so stern. They left Stang to his food and sleep. There was nothing much of interest on Mars except the old, old cities so long deserted. So the great expedition departed to go back to Earth to see the invaders. The Martians they had traveled thirty-eight million miles to see on another world. They wanted to tell Earth of the grim and incredible joke that had been played on her. And Nance meant to have a long talk with Mimsy. End of Mimsy's Joke by Millard Grimes The Sound of Terror by Don Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Angelisi. The Sound of Terror by Don Barry. The day was still no more than a ragged streak of red in the east. The pre-dawn air was sharply cold, making Johnny Young Bear's face feel slightly brittle as he dressed quietly in the gray bedroom. He sat down on the bed, pulling on his boots, and felt his wife stir sleepily beneath the covers. Suddenly she stiffened, sat upright in the bed, startled into wakefulness. Johnny put one dark, bony hand on her white shoulder, gently, reassuring. After a moment, finding herself, she turned away and lit a cigarette. Johnny finished pulling on his boots and stood, his hawk-like face unreadable in the cold gray light streaming through the huge picture window. Johnny, said his wife hesitantly. He murmured an acknowledgment, watching the bright flare of color as she drew on the cigarette. Her soft, dark hair was coiled loosely around her shoulders, very black against the pale skin. Her eyes were invisible in shadow, and Johnny could not read their expression. He turned away, knowing she was watching him. Be careful, she said simply. Try, he said. Then he shrugged. Not my day, anyway. I know, she said, but be careful. He left the house and walked out into the chill desert dawn. He turned his face to the brightness in the east, trying to catch a little warmth, but could not. He warmed up the jeep, listening to the engine grumble protest until it settled to a flat, banging roar. He swerved out of the driveway with the screaming of tires. Reaching the long ribbon of concrete that led out into the desert, he settled down hard on the accelerator, indifferent to the whining complaint of the jeep's motor. It was eight miles from his sprawling house to the Mesa Dry Lake launching site, due east, into the sun. He pulled to the top of Six Mile Hill and stopped in the middle of the highway. Two miles ahead was launching base one, throwing long, sharp shadows at him in the rosy dawn light. 
a cluster of squat, gray blockhouses, a long runway tapering into the distance with an Air Force B-52 motionless at the near end. That was all. Except the ship. The ship towered high, dominating the desert like a pinnacle of bright silver. Even silhouetted against the eastern sky, it sparkled and glistened. Impassive it stood, graceful, seeming to strain into the sky, anxious to be off and gone. The loading gantry was a dark, spidery framework beside the ship, leaning against it, drawing strength from its sleek beauty. Johnny watched it in silence for a moment, then turned his eyes up to the sky. Somewhere up there, a tiny satellite spun wildly about the Earth, a little silver ball in some celestial roulette wheel. Gradually, it would spiral closer and closer, caught by the planet's implacable grasp, until it flared brightly like a cigarette in the heavens before dissolving into drops of molten metal. But it would have served its purpose. In its short life, it would have given man knowledge. Knowledge of space. Knowledge enough that he could go himself, knowing what he would find in the emptiness between the Earth and the Moon. Or knowing merely. What's it like out there? The satellite answered partly. The ship would answer more. Johnny slammed the jeep into gear, hurtled down the other side of Six Mile Hill. Through his mind ran the insistent repetition of an old song he knew, and he hummed it tunelessly through closed teeth. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. The jeep skidded to a halt beside control. Mitch Campbell's green station wagon was already there, creaking and settling as the motor cooled. Control was full of people. Air Force brass, technicians, observers, enlisted men of indiscernible purpose. The room hummed with the muted buzz of low, serious conversation. Mitch Campbell sat in one corner, apparently forgotten in the confusion. He had nothing to do, not yet. He was already in flight dress, holding the massive helmet in his hands morosely, turning it over and over, staring at it as though he thought he might find his head inside if he looked carefully enough. "'Morning, Colonel,' said Johnny, forcing his voice to be casual and cheerful. "'You're up early this morning.' "'Morning, Colonel, yourself,' said Mitch, looking up. "'Big date today?' "'Well, yeah, you might say so,' Mitch said, smiling faintly but with obvious effort. "'Thought I might go once around lightly,' he said, hooking his thumb upwards. Upwards through the concrete ceiling, into the air, through the air, up where there was no air for a man to breathe, once around lightly around the world, lightly. Tell you what, Mitch. Okay, tell me what, he said. You like movies? Johnny asked. You like to get a little adventure in your soul? You like a little vicarious thrill now and then? Yeah, I like that. Tell you what, we'll go. No, don't thank me. We'll go. Tonight, eight o'clock. You come by. Wives and everybody? Mitch asked. Why not? Johnny said. They're cooped up in the house all day. They both knew the wives would be in control in an hour, listening to the radio chatter, waiting, eyes wide, shoulders stiff and tight. Fine, said Mitch. Fine. A crew chief came up and touched Johnny's shoulder. Colonel Youngbear, he said, observation is going up. Johnny stood and looked out the tiny window at the red-painted B-52. See you tonight, Mitch. Eight o'clock? Don't forget. Westerns. See you, said Mitch. He looked back down at the helmet and was turning it over and over again when Johnny left. The observation B-52 climbed, screaming. Johnny lit a cigarette and watched out the port at the contrails rolling straight and white behind the jets. He sat by the radioman, a sergeant, ignoring the rest of the officers in the converted bomb bay. Hope he makes it, Colonel, said the sergeant. He'll make it, John said flatly, irritated. Relenting, he added in a gentler tone. The pilot section breaks away. If he gets in serious trouble, he can dump it and ride the nose down like a bird. He'll make it. There was a racious buzz and a squawk box said, On my mark, it will be zero minus four minutes. Mark, the voice of control, 35,000 feet below. The B-52 swung ponderously onto the base leg of its circle, and there was a creaking of stretching metal inside. Minus two minutes. Not my day anyway, Johnny thought. He lit another cigarette. Control, said a new voice. This is Red Leader. Red Leader. Red Flight is in position. Rog, Red Leader, Control acknowledged. The observation flight of jet fighters was waiting, too. Minus five, four, three, two, 
one mark silence i had a true wife but i left her oh 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 there was another rattle of the speaker and mitch's voice came through grunting heavy as the acceleration of the ship laid a heavy hand on his chest acceleration 8g controls respond silence there he is someone said the wavering trail of smoke was barely visible below a thread of white coming up fast, blown erratically by winds into a distorted tiny snake. Altitude, said Mitch's voice. Forty thousand. Acceleration. Dropping. The white snake wriggled up to their level, rose above them. Johnny could not see the silver head. Altitude. Sixty-five thousand. I have a loud, very high buzz in my headphones. I'm going to... There. It's gone now. Went out of my range. His voice sounded wrong to Johnny, but he couldn't pin it down. Altitude, 105,000. Beginning orbital correction. Beginning, beginning. I can't, I'm, I'm... The voice became unintelligible. It was pitched very high, like a woman's, and it sounded as if his teeth were chattering. Mitch, John pleaded softly. Mitch, baby, dump it, boy. Come on home now. Dump it. There was no more from the speaker. A confused babble broke out in the bomb bay. The sergeant fiddled with his dials frantically, spinning across wavelengths, trying to find a word. The confusion ceased when the speaker rattled again, seeming hours later. Uh, hello, Control? This is Red 3. Do you read me? One of the fight or flight. Rog, Red 3, go ahead, came Control's voice from below. Uh, Control, I have a flash and smoke cloud on the bearing of 3-7 degrees. Red 3, what altitude? What altitude? None, said the fighter pilot, on the deck. After a moment, Johnny climbed unsteadily to his feet in the midst of a booming silence. He made his way back along the catwalk to the head, where he retched violently until the tears came to his eyes. Three weeks later, Johnny sat in Dr. Lambert's office. He watched the lean, graying psychologist turn off the tape recorder, watched him methodically tamp tobacco in his pipe. That's all she wrote, Johnny, said Lambert finally. That recording of Mitch's voice is just about all we have. The ship was under full power when it hit. There wasn't much left. Johnny looked absently out the window at the gleaming needle of Ship 2 beside the flimsy-looking gantry. Full power was a lot of power. The psychologist followed Johnny's eyes. Beautiful, he said, and the word brought to Johnny's mind the wide-eyed pale face of Mitch's wife staring at him. That ship is the best we can make her, Lambert said. Engineering is as certain as they can be that there was no structural failure on ship one. So, Johnny said, still staring at the ship. Even at this distance, he could almost believe he could see his own lean face reflected in the shiny metal. So we look somewhere else for the cause of failure, said Lambert. Where, said Johnny. He turned back, saw that the psychologist was putting a new reel on the tape recorder. The weak link in the control system, Lambert said. There weren't any. One. What? Mitch Campbell. Johnny stood, angry. Mitch was good. Damn good. The psychologist looked up, and his eyes were tired. I know it, he said calmly. Listen to this. He started the machine playing the new tape. Johnny listened to it through. The voice that came out was high and wavering. It shook. It chattered. Words were indistinguishable. It was thin with tension, and it rang in Johnny's ears with unwanted familiarity. What's it sound like to you? Lambert asked when it had finished. Like Mitch's voice, Johnny admitted reluctantly. It did to me, too. What do you think it is? Don't know, said Johnny shortly. Might be a pilot whose plane is shaking apart. No. I don't know. Lambert sat back down behind his desk and sucked on his pipe stem. He regarded Johnny impassively, seeming to consider some problem remote from the room. Abruptly, he stood again and went to the window, watching the ant-like activity around the base of Ship 2. That was a madman's voice, he said. I made the recording while I was interning at a state institution. So? Mad with fear, Lambert said. Pure, simple, unadulterated. That was the sound of terror you heard, Johnny. Terror such as few humans have ever known. That man knew such fear he could not remain sane and live with it. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. You think, Mitch, you said yourself the voices were alike, Lambert pointed out. I don't believe it, 
Don't have to, said Lambert, turning from the window. But I'll tell you something, Johnny. That ship, he hooked his thumb out the window, is a very big toy. Maybe too big. Meaning? Meaning it's possible we've reached beyond man's limitations. Meaning it's possible we've built something too big for a man to handle and stay sane. Maybe we've finally gone too far. Maybe. I don't insist it's true, said the psychologist. It's an idea. Fear. Fear of the unknown, maybe. Too much fear to hold. You think I'll crack? asked Johnny. The psychologist didn't answer directly. It's an idea, as I said. I just want you to think it over. I will, said Johnny. He stood again, his jaw held tight. Is that all? Yes, Colonel, that's all, said Lambert. When Johnny left, the psychologist sat in brooding silence, staring morosely at the trail of blue smoke rising from his pipe bowl. He sat there until the afternoon light faded from the desert base. Then he stood in the darkened office, sighed, lit his pipe, and went home. He was very tired. Six weeks later, Johnny Youngbear walked out of the control blockhouse into the cold desert morning, carrying his helmet under his arm. He ran his eyes swiftly up the length of Ship 2, trying to forget those other eyes staring at his back from the blockhouse. The ship rippled and gleamed, alive, eager, the thundering power in her belly waiting to be born. Oh, you bitch. You beautiful bitch, Johnny thought, pregnant with power like a goddess with a god's child. Bitch, 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 I love you. I hate you. You kill me. The crew chief walked by his side. Nice morning, Colonel, he said. Very, said Johnny. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, 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 for you, you beautiful bitch. Say something, Colonel, asked the crew chief. No. Song running through my head, he explained. Yeah, the other man chuckled. I know how it is. They strapped him into the padded control chair, the controls arranged around him in a neat semicircle, easy to reach. This is my day. They left him, alone, once around lightly. The loneliness was in his belly, aching like a tumor. Read me, Control's voice in his earphones. Loud and clear, he said absently. Minus two minutes, Mark. A different voice. So many different voices. They knew him. They talked to him. But he was alone with his bitch. I had a true wife, but... Minus one minute, Mark. This is my day. I had a true wife. Three, two, one, Mark. There was the sound of a world dying in his mind, the sound of thunder, the sound of a sun splitting, the sound of a goddess giving birth, with pain, with agony, and loneliness. A giant's fist came out from nothingness and smashed into his body. His chest was compressed, his face was flattened, he could not get enough air to breathe. The heavy sludge of acceleration crushed him back into the padded chair, inexorable, implacable, relentless, heavy. His vision clouded in red and he thought he would die. Instead, he spoke into the lip mic, resenting it bitterly. Acceleration 9G. He looked at the gauge that shimmered redly before him, disbelieving. Altitude 20,000. He blacked out, sinking helplessly into the plush black night of unawareness. I had a true, I had, I had. Awakening to pain, he glanced at the gauges. He had been gone only a split second. Altitude, 28,000. Acceleration pressure dropping. His face began to resume its normal shape as the acceleration dropped. 6G, he said, and breathing was easier. The giant reluctantly began to withdraw his massive fist from Johnny's face. He tipped a lever, watching the artificial horizon tilt slightly. Air control surfaces respond, he said. But soon there would be no air for the surfaces to move against, and then he would control by flickering the power that rumbled behind him. Altitude 40,000. 85,000. 100,000. The sky was glistening black. He was passing from the Earth's envelope of air into nothingness that was space. Now. Now. Now it was time to change angle, flatten the ship out, bring it into position to run around the Earth, once around lightly. There was a high-pitched scream in his earphones. He remembered it had been there for long and wondered if he had told control. 
He flicked the switch that ignited the powerful steering rockets, and the whine grew louder, unbearably loud. It sang to him, his bitch sang, I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. He began to feel a light tingle over his body, tiny needles delicately jabbing every inch. His face became wooden, felt prickly. He tried to lick his lips and could feel no sensation there. His vision fogged again, and he knew it was not from acceleration this time. It was something else. Something else. What's it like out there? His belly told him. Fear. He reached out his hand to touch the control panel, and his arm did not respond. It was shaking, uncontrollably, and moved off to the right of where he wanted it to go. When he tried to correct, it swung too far to the left, waving as if it were alive. It hung there before him as in a dream, oscillating back and forth. He could not control his body, and the realization nurtured the tiny seed of panic that lay heavily in his belly. Dump it. What did that mean, dump it? Go home now, baby. I had a true decision. There was a decision he had to make, but he was too frightened to know what it was. He had been born in fear and lived in fear, and his body was full of it, quivering to the lover's touch of fear. Falling, darkness, the fear of dying, the unknown, the unimaginable always lurking just out of the corner of his eye. He wanted to scream, and the fear choked it off. His hands were at his sides, limply useless, dangling at the seat. He had to hang on to something. His hand found a projection at the side of the seat. He clutched it desperately. He knew he would fall, down, spiraling, weightless, off the cliff as in a dream, off the ladder, the tree. He was a child and his toes were tingling as he stood too near the edge of the cliff, knowing he might fall. He clutched tightly, putting every ounce of his strength into holding on to the lever, the single solid reality in a world of shifting unreality. He was going to fall. He was falling. I love you. I hate you. I had a true wife. There was a softness beneath his back, and he moved his hands, feeling the crispness of sheets. There was a low murmur of voices. He raised his hands to his eyes, and the voices stopped. There were heavy bandages on his eyes. Colonel, came a questing voice, and Johnny realized it was Dr. Lambert. Awake? I can't see. Why can't I see? You'll be all right. It's all right. What happened? How much do you remember? Asked the voice. The blast off. Yes. Yes, I remember that. The orbit? The landing? No, he said. Not that. You did it, said the voice. You made it. This is my day. Once around lightly. Johnny, said the voice. I don't know just how to say this. We know what was wrong with Ship One and why it killed Mitch. We know, hell, we don't even begin to realize what we have at our fingertips now. It's so big, it's impossible to evaluate. What? I don't sound, Johnny. Sound. Or rather, vibration. It's something we are just beginning to learn about. We know a few things. We know you can boil water with sound if the frequency is high enough. And you can drill metal with it. And it does things to the human body. There are frequencies of sound which can act directly on human nerves, directly on the human brain. It means if we know the right frequency, we'll be able to produce any state we want in a man, any emotion, fear, anguish, anything. When the steering rockets were cut in, the ship began to vibrate. It generated frequencies so high the ordinary human senses couldn't detect them. And when your nerves were exposed to those vibrations, it produced fear. Pure and absolute fear. Motor controls went. Rational processes went. All the nervous functions of the body went out of control. Your body became a giant tuning fork, and the frequency to which it vibrated was fear. I can't remember. Sanity went too, Johnny, said the man softly. You could not stand that fear and remain sane, so something cut off. That was what happened to Mitch. How did I get back? We don't know. The films show your face suddenly going blank. Then you flew, that's all. We hoped you could tell us. No, no, I don't remember. There was something in you so strong it overrided everything else, even the fear. We'd like to know what it is. We'll find out, Johnny. 
and it will mean a lot to the human race when we do. This is my day. Is my wife here? There was a cold hand on his forehead. Yes, Johnny. Well, he said helplessly. Well, how are you? I'm fine, Johnny, she whispered, and there was the sound of tears in her voice. I'm just fine. He felt the warm softness of her lips on his. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. And then he came home again. End of The Sound of Terror by Don Barry Recording by Sarah Angelisi The Luminous Blonde by Hayden Howard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Some dames are bright, some brighter. Like the gorgeous wife of the playboy Kamish, who combined all the stellar attributes necessary to slice in two parts an ultra-modern spaceship and a marriage with one swoop of a clock hand. The Luminous Blonde by Hayden Howard as the frilly bloused Rocket bent over him to unbuckle his safety corset, newly appointed Commissioner for Economics for Mars, J. Edwin Elbert peeked. But her fingernails tatted so hastily at the buckle that he raised his surprisingly useful blue eyes to her face. She was blushing there, too. A pretty little baby face. Skillfully, he swallowed a rising belch that was a natural consequence of the cessation of gravity upon a paunch overbloated with farewell champagne, Venus dipped cold crab, and two sweet apricot bread. Director Huggins is to be congratulated upon his choice of rockets, he rumbled, sneaking his fat, grossly manicured fingers about her wrist. The click of the powder room door would warn him of his wife's return. Just the other day I was saying to him that the new Bolo II should have only the best. I see he has exceeded even my hopeful expectations. Tell me, my dear, when does the Bolo go into Huggins' celebrated centigrave? This weightlessness is rather unsettling to one's stomach. Can I get you a Dramamine pill, sir? No, thank you. When does... Oh, at nineteen hundred hours, she gushed. The ship splits in half, she added helpfully, and dimpled in the winning way of little girls who will never grow up. Remarkable. They tell me some sort of cable will tie us together. Yes, sir, when we are far enough out in space so that there isn't any air friction. Mr. Webley, the pilot, pulls a little lever and the nose flies off. He'll be all alone out there for 42 days. And only a thin cable connects our passenger section to his control section? He was quite familiar with the details, since he had lobbied for the initial appropriation. Her forearm had a nice, warm, smooth feeling. Oh, you understand it perfectly, sir. When we're a mile apart, the little rocket at the side makes us spin around and around. Then I could take off these old iron shoes. She followed his gaze to her legs and tittered. He speculated that similar magnets must be holding down the hem of her nylon skirt. And does the spinning about a common access continue until we're near Mars? Yes, sir, for forty-two days. Excuse me, sir, I think null gravity is making that lady ill. After carefully wiping his palm on his coat sleeve, he replaced his unlit cigar in his broad, gleaming face. He was in the smiling sensuality of a daydream when the powder room door clicked. His wife was beautiful. Untilting his cigar, he watched her drift down the aisle. With one scarlet-tipped finger, she prevented her diaphanous skirt from floating very high above her knees. A lovely lady. He clamped on the cigar. It's not every man whose wife is a natural blonde, ex-starlet, young enough to be his daughter. But a little discipline was in order. 
Landa, I wish you had remembered to have Hikato pack my golf things. Edwin, please, this null gravity is upsetting my tummy. Well, it's the least you could have done. And how would we have gotten on the ship? Her voice shrilled unexpectedly. You embarrass me enough as it was. Listen, I'm the commissioner. No two-bit pilot is going to tell me what I can't take. The luggage limit is ridiculous. What are you complaining about? He let you take everything, didn't he? After you smiled at him. I was only trying to be pleasant. Pleasant, is it? Last time you said it was to influence him to take all my luggage. Yeah, and you got sore because you weren't a big enough shot to swing the deal alone. Her voice rasped through its ladylike veneer. That's a lie. Furthermore, I don't want to catch you smiling at him again. I give up, she exclaimed, and reached for a telemag. But he wouldn't drop it there. I don't like that fellow's looks. Pads in his shoulders, little waxed mustache. Who does he think he is, Captain Future? Oh, don't be funny. Just think what he thinks of you after what you said to him in front of all the other passengers and crew. Taking his side now? I am not. She gave a little sniff and fumbled for her handkerchief. You're so mean and masterful, I'm surprised you don't make me go up front and tell him what a sap he is. He was a sap, smiling at my wife, all right. He uplifted his cigar with a modified grin. He wasted a smile there. Two-bit pilot. Who does he think he is? He did smile at me, though, she appended in a small voice. His voice snapped out again. And you smiled back. He ground his unlit cigar into the ashtray. I think you were just now trying to flatter me. I think you were trying to turn me off the track when you said you'd go up and tell him what a sap he is. I was not. Don't try to wiggle out of it. That's what you said. All right, if you think I should, I will. Well, now. He paused, smiling, and carefully trimmed the crushed end of his cigar with a gold-plated cigar cutter before he continued. If you insist, go ahead. There's not much time left, she said pointing at the neon dial clock above the powder room door beneath it hung an orange luminescent sign u.s eastern standard earth time equivalent 1850 hours he snorted don't try to wiggle out on that account you have a half an hour okay if you say so she shrugged and chewed the inside of her cheek this isn't very nice let's not get that way you coolly slipped the shaft in me enough and stop powdering your nose without another word she rose and floated down the aisle taking little care to suppress her skirt somebody whistled and the commissioner angrily craned his thick neck around he couldn't see who had done it but he suspected the three grinning cadet astronauts in the last row of seats she rose and floated down the aisle taking little care to suppress her rising, diaphanous skirt. As the door to the control room clanged shut, the powder room door clicked open, and the rocket tapped out on her iron shoe soles. Commissioner Elbert rolled his eyes and smiled, but she seemed preoccupied with a smaller female with pigtails and hiccups. Guess I'll have to look forward myself, he thought, just like a woman to go up there wait in the hall a minute and come back rising he floated past the rocket toward the control room door don't open that sir the ship's about to separate what it's only 1855 hours that is eastern standard time sir the clock at the other end of the aisle over the men's room gives the standard star time our ship schedule operates on those neon hands pointed to 1900 with a strangled yell he lunged for the door but as his hands closed around the handle something clicked and it resisted his straining and then his pounding fists 
A buzzer sounded, and a cheery, masculine voice spoke over the intercom. Hello again, passengers. This is your pilot, Hugh Webley, wishing you a pleasant crossing. Please re-enter your safety corsets. The Bolo two will now separate. Intercom, the commissioner shouted. Shoving past the slack-jawed rocket, he literally swam down the gravityless aisle to the engineering hatchway. It opened to his shouts. Yeah, a giant with a handlebar mustache peered at him. I'm Commissioner Elbert. Call your pilot at once. I ordered the ship not to separate. Hastily, the giant lifted the phone. Commissioner Elbert could hear the steady buzz. Sorry, sir. Webley's cut us off. He does that so no one will interrupt him while he's setting the auto controls. Get him somehow. My wife's up there. The giant coughed and strangled and turned his face away. I'll keep trying, sir, he gasped. But sometimes he cuts us off for days. He sleeps a lot. Forehatch, the commissioner shouted suddenly. Unlock the forehatch. Wearily, the giant clambered up. He towered over Elbert. Didn't you hear what I said, the commissioner yelled. Unlock the door to the control room. Sorry, sir, the lock's automatic. Well, damn it, blast it down. Noisily, the giant scratched his crew cut. Maybe I could crowbar it. Quick, you fool. No, I can't. I can't, sir. The ship might separate while the hatch was open, and our own air pressure would blow us all into the vacuum. I can't risk the lives of the passengers, sir. I'm Commissioner Elbert. Give me that crowbar. The giant held it behind him. That's an order. Sorry, sir. Better reclaim your seat before the jolt. The giant signaled with his fingers at the rocket. Elbert snatched at the crowbar. As the two men grappled for it, whirling like fighting cocks in the air, a tremendous surge hurled them the length of the aisle. Another slammed them against the powder room door. When the giant helped the bleeding commissioner to his feet, artificial gravity held them down. Emitting motherly sounds, the rocket tried to wipe the blood from his forehead, but he shoved her aside. I'll sue. I'll have your transportation license revoked. Please, sir, the rocket squealed. I'll bring you a sedative. Huggins will hear about this, he shouted, writhing at the engineer's brawny arms. But then he sobbed. I sent her up there. My fault. My idea. She didn't want to go. She was worried about the time, and I told her there was plenty of time. As he gulped the sedative, he looked like a punctured balloon. I don't want a sedative, he shouted. But he had just swallowed it. He sagged again. My fault. I told her there was plenty of time. He rubbed his sleeve across his nose. After they had settled him groggily in his seat, the rocket drew the engineer aside. Her pretty little brow wrinkled. Dan, I can't figure it. Why does he think it's his fault? Gee, when we were in the powder room together, she asked me about why the clocks told different times. And I explained how we figure time by position of the stars, instead of Earth and Sun and all that stuff. You'd think she understood. She talked bright enough. The giant squeezed her arm affectionately. Lucky Webley, sap commissioner, bright dame. Forty-two days and an alibi. He chuckled and walked his finger up her arm. Carol, you can't even tell. All dames don't have the same amount of brightness you do. She giggled and shivered a little at his hand. We learned all about time in Rocket School. The End of the Luminous Blonde by Hayden Howard The Burnt Planet by William Britton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Paul Harvey. The Burnt Planet by William Britton. Mad with despair, they fought back from the ruins. Whoever these invaders were, they should not have a world which its defenders themselves had destroyed. The land was dark in the softly falling rain, and the smell of green things was in the air. The crew huddled in their cloaks and peered into the approaching dusk as they unloaded the great silver spaceship. They were apprehensive of the stark ruins that began barely a mile from the ship, the ruins that seemed to sprawl interminably across the flat land beside the broad river. In the metal headquarters hut, the commander glanced nervously at his chronometer. The astrogator looked up from his interminable reckonings and smiled. Don't worry, Captain, he said. They'll be all right. After all, we haven't seen any life but a few small animals, and they ran from us. The commander nodded absently, but went to the open door and stared out into the rain. It made a musical tinkling on the thin metallic dome of the hut. I know, he said. Perhaps that's why I'm worried. It's the feeling of death here, as though it might spring at us from some corner in those ruins. I should have sent out a stronger scout party. The astrogator shrugged and returned to his log. If anything had gone wrong, they would have messaged us. The commander smiled in unwilling agreement, but he stayed in the open door, searching the gathering darkness toward the city. He could not shake loose from the feeling of doom that had settled on him as soon as they had made their landfall and clambered from the airlocks of the spaceship. This was a strange world, the commander thought to himself. It seemed to have everything, everything but intelligent inhabitants. They had circled it for two days before they had chosen this wide green valley for their landfall. They had seen cities, many of them, great cities along sea coasts and in rich plains, cities in mountains and in valleys, but nowhere had they seen life. The first cautious explorations after the landing that morning had shown that there was plenty of good water. The soil seemed rich, and vegetation grew in profusion, even among the ruins they had warily skirted. The atmosphere was perfect. It was what they had searched for throughout the long, bitter years, this stable atmosphere with its abundance of life-giving oxygen, and minerals aplenty. The burned and blasted metal skeletons of the ruined city showed that. The commander told himself that he was a fool for worrying, when he should be shouting with joy at his luck. There was a shout from the outpost, a laugh, and then his second-in-command loped through the rain, smiling broadly. Behind him were the others, laughing and joking, shrugging their packs to the ground. Gladness and wonder were in their faces and their voices, and the commander knew that this was the world they had sought for so long. The lieutenant ducked into the doorway and paused to warm himself at the little thermal unit. He wiped the rain from his face, reached for the wine bottle beside the astrogator's workboard, and tilted it. This is it, sir, he said. He was young, and fate had been good to him, and he was exulting in it. It's everything we ever dared dream about. It will support the whole race, every one of us, I think, if the rest of this world is anything like what we've seen this day. The commander grinned back at him, relief plain in his face. He was phrasing the message that he would send home across the void, the message they had waited for down through the weary years, the years that had rolled by while the land burned up under a blazing sun, while the water disappeared and the atmosphere became thin. But there was still in him the doubt, the remnant of fear. Did you, he spaced the words carefully, find any sign of intelligent life? The lieutenant's smile faded. He glanced quickly out at the men, breaking out their rations, resting from the labor, and looked back at his captain. He nodded. Tracks, he said. We came across them leading out of the deserted city. Many? I don't think so. Five or six, perhaps. And we found where they had killed one of the small animals and eaten it. Did they seem intelligent? Really, I mean? The lieutenant shrugged. Who knows? 
Their bipeds, at any rate. We followed the tracks, but they had taken to a small stream bed, and we lost them. The commander pondered. Then he made his decision. In a country as large as this, he said, five or six can't make any difference to us, not even to a small party like our own, and certainly not when the ships begin arriving from home. The lieutenant leaned back on his pack, his face content. The commander sat at a field desk and started writing, carefully, knowing that what he wrote would someday be in every textbook. The message was not difficult, really. Thousands of space captains had phrased the message in their minds down through the years of the search. So had he, time and again, as he lay in his bunk, or watched the wheeling stars from the bridge, in the glow of the thermal unit, his stern face glowed with pride and the certainty that it was his ship that had saved a world. In another hut, the scholar stared thoughtfully at the thing he had found in the old house where they had discovered the tracks. There had been a language on this dead world, and in his hand he held some of the brown, moldering pages upon which the language had been written. He applied his scholar's mind to the puzzle. The city crouched grimly above them, even though they had neither seen nor heard any life in these streets save a few small animals who had fled their coming, they gripped their projectors at the ready. Almost every structure had been damaged. Many were mere twisted heaps of debris, timbers and girders thrusting insanely at a sky that today was blue and benign. The taller, sturdier buildings still stood, but their walls were cracked and their windows gaping hollow eyes in the blank faces. Rubble clogged the streets, and grass had split the pavements. Here and there among the ruins, a sapling stood bravely, its roots grasping in the shattered masonry. In the streets, rusting and ancient, were objects which they surmised must have been vehicles. In some of them they found fragments of bone and shreds of clothing. They had seen other bones, in doorways, on the ground floors of the few buildings they had penetrated. Whatever it was, the second-in-command said, it struck them swiftly. Some sickness, a virus perhaps, the astrogator suggested. The commander shook his head. War, he said. Only war could do this to a city. The lieutenant said admiringly, whoever they were, they certainly developed some pretty terrific weapons. The commander had smiled patted his projector. No more terrific than these, he said. Our own people developed weapons, too. Thank the stars that we have learned not to use them on each other. The scholar looked up from the inscription he had found on the side of a building. And thank the stars, he said, that we learned in time. The people of this world apparently did not. It was then, while they spoke, that from somewhere in the ruins, there was a sharp crack, and one of the crew spun around and fell in the street. In the shattered silence of the city, the sound echoed crazily. Take cover, the captain shouted, and he plunged into a huge doorway, peering around the protecting portal. There was another crack, and something whined by him. Projectile weapon, whispered the lieutenant behind him. He was prone, sighting his projector at a half-ruined four-story house at the corner. He pressed the control switch once, and a section of the second floor seemed to explode into hurtling gray dust and shrieking steel. Other projectors were spitting from doorways and from behind piles of brick and debris in the streets. The captain, watching the building from which the answering fire seemed to come, thought he saw movement behind one of the blank windows. Before he could take aim, there was a ripping series of shots and the masonry of the portal flew into dust. He heard the low, flat whine of ricochets and he withdrew deeper into the dimness of the great entranceway. Up the street, he heard a crew member cry out in pain. The second floor, he cried, and a hurricane of electron bolts ripped into the building at the corner. The building seemed to rip apart under the impact, and there was the roar of falling bricks and timber as the floor gave way with a crash. 
They dashed out of cover, crouching, firing as they went. They found three bodies in the ruin, bipeds, pale pasty flesh, faces half hidden by tangled hair. The bodies were only partially clad in faded, tattered clothes, and the feet were encased in what appeared to be the tanned hide of an animal. The flesh and the clothing were filthy, and they stank. The bodies were huddled around their weapon. A metallic-looking projectile thrower mounted on three legs. Its barrel was still hot. A little later, they flushed another of the creatures in a narrow street. It howled gibberish at them and fled, but they cornered the thing against a heap of rubble. It mouthed things at them and hurled bits of brick. Its eyes were wild and staring, and spittle trickled down the face into the sodden, filthy rags at war. They had to kill it, finally. The commander turned the dead thing over with his projector stock and stared at it. Mad, he said. There are only a few of them, and they are mad. The scholar nodded. He had found many of the writings, and they were stuffed in his pack and in his pockets, and he held one while he talked. They are mad, he said, and there cannot be many of them, certainly not enough to halt the advance of civilization. It was as if he saw already the soaring towers of the cities that would build here over the pitiful ruins, as though the busy highways already spanned this rich new world. We have won our bridgehead here, he said. Soon we will have won the world. The world, he looked down at the carcass at his feet, that these poor fools threw away. The scholar made his greatest find late that afternoon on the street-level floor of an almost intact building. It must have been the place where writings had been stored or perhaps sold. The brown, rotting pages were everywhere, and the moldering covers in which the writings had been bound. The scholar cried out with pleasure, and the commander was forced to delay their trip to the ship so that the crew could carry part of the loot with them for further study. The scholar was squatting in the corner of the room, poring over one of the ancient records, when he looked up and shouted, I think I've got it! I think I've got it! I think I've found the key to their language! The commander had smiled indulgently, for though he believed in action, he had respect for the scholar, and knew that the things the scholar might discover in the old writings might help him in his own task as leader of the expedition. It was then that the creatures attacked for the last time. They must have crept into the building and gathered there in the dimness, waiting their opportunity. There were six of them. They poured through a rear door into the room of writings, howling, their projectile throwers barking. Their wild ululations were the screams of the demented. The commander could see the madness in their eyes, and he knew why he had been afraid. The astrogator was down before they could return the fire, and then the projectors cracked out their blue flame doom. The lieutenant cursed as he was hit. He dropped to one knee, firing swiftly, and then the creatures were down, and it was over. The wild, bearded faces were charred and blackened, and in the sudden silence was the crackle of the little blue flames as they danced over the filthy, ragged clothing of the dead. The commander let his breath go at last in a long, gasping sigh. He started to walk toward the bodies, knowing that they were the last, knowing that if there had been any more, they would have waited, gathering strength, and they would not have made the crazy, suicidal attack. The fighting was over. The savage creatures, unbalanced by their miserable existence among the ruins of the glory that had been theirs, would never again threaten the bridgehead he had carved on this world. It was his world now. There was a frantic tugging at his sleeve, and he shook the battle fog from his eyes and grinned at the scholar. The commander remembered that even while the fight had roared hot and sharp, the scholar had not moved from his corner, nor taken his eyes from the pages he was studying, and now the scholar was fairly dancing with excitement. I've got it, he said, almost chortling. It wasn't hard with the key, and I found the key. 
He gestured toward the little tangle of bodies, silent in the room of writings. They called themselves men, he said. The commander shrugged. End of The Burnt Planet by William Britton Recording by Paul Harvey Guest Expert by Alan K. Lang This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Earth had a problem, and the Martian visitor had a very deadly means of solving it. Guest Expert by Alan K. Lang I'm only here to help you, said the man from Mars. You proved that, the secretary admitted. In the six weeks you've been here, you've wiped out rabies, measles, and the common cold. But, sir, this latest proposal of yours is blasphemous. The man from Mars waved an appendage in the direction of the secretary's desk, atop which a newspaper was lying open. After reading what the paper has said, can you still doubt that what I propose is necessary? The young man in uniform crossed the room and picked up the newspaper. He read the headlines aloud, bitterly. Indian famine, army storms New Delhi. Tasman Republic bids for place in sun. Plague decimates Lower Nile. You could end that plague, the assistant's voice was accusing. I could, of course. The battles and the starvation would still be with you, though. Why do you persist in treating the symptoms instead of the sickness? I am an objective observer, far enough away from your problems to see them clearly, something which no human can ever hope to do. You earthlings suffer war and famine and plague for one reason only, that there are four and eight-tenths billion of you living on an earth that can feed only about two and a half billion of you well. Gentlemen, the population of your planet must be reduced by one half if your race is to survive. Can't we send our surplus population to Mars or Venus? the assistant asked. The man from Mars winced. The sands of Mars can't support cactuses, much less fields of wheat and rice and corn. Venus is a solid sea of formaldehyde solution. He glanced around to each of the three men in the room. To you, my scheme may seem heartless. But would it be more cruel to kill millions now than to allow billions to die in continual war in the next thousand years? Do you remember your last such war? The Ukrainian wheatlands scorched to desert by the thermonuclears. New England, swept by epidemics of anthrax and tolerima. All China tortured by starvation and the hundred nagging sicknesses that follow hunger. Yes, I remember, the secretary rolled his pen between his fingers, staring at it. How do you intend to liquidate the excess two billions? I can't explain it to you. You lack the basic knowledge. It will be quick and painless, though, I promise. Then Earth will see peace and hope. A new start. I can't take all the responsibility for this decision upon myself, the secretary said. He glanced hopefully at the assistant and the young man in uniform. Their eyes flinched away. You might take a vote, suggested the man from Mars. He picked up the secretary's scratch pad and ripped off three sheets of paper. Just mark yes or no. I will respect your decision. After all, I'm only here to help you. The secretary stared at the slip of paper lying on his desk. He glanced toward the other two humans for encouragement. But the assistant was staring at the wall across the room, and the young man in uniform was silently contemplating the carpet at his feet. Convulsively, the secretary scrooched the paper toward him and scribbled his vote. Folding the paper, he looked demandingly toward his two companions. 
The young man in uniform looked up, then turned to hold his paper against the wall as he wrote his decision. The assistant remained seated, holding the paper on top of a book, while he lettered out his vote. The man from Mars collected the three ballots, unfolded them, and read the three votes. It's two to one, he announced. He crushed the papers into small white pellets and tossed them out the open window. What I have to do will be finished by noon tomorrow. The man from Mars left the room, closing the door very softly behind him. The other three sat silent a moment and then got up and left without looking one another in the face. The next day the secretary and the assistant sat in the office, staring at the clock above the door. At 12.07 the door slammed open to the young man in uniform. Is it done? the assistant asked. Done? Of course it's done! The young man in uniform leaned against the door and shook with spasmodic laughter. Now there's food enough and room enough for everyone. The man from Mars promised to solve our population problem. He did. At 12 noon, Eastern Daylight Savings Time, every woman and girl on Earth dropped dead. The End of Guest Expert by Alan K. Lang The Little Red Bag by Jerry Soule. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Little Red Bag by Jerry Soule. About an hour out of San Francisco on the flight to Los Angeles, I made the discovery. I had finished reading the Chronicle, folded and put it beside me turned and looked out the window, expecting to see the San Joaquin Valley, but finding only a sea of clouds instead. So I returned my attention to the inside of the plane, to the overstuffed, gray-haired woman asleep beside me, to the backs of heads and seats before me, across the aisle to other heads, and down to the blonde. I had seen her in the concourse and at the gate, a shapely thing. Now she had crossed her legs, and I was privileged to view a trim ankle and calf, and her profile, as she stared moodily across the aisle and out a window, where there was nothing to see. I slid my eyes past her to others, a crossword puzzle worker, a togetherness-type magazine reader. Inventory completed, I went back to looking at the clouds, knowing I should be thinking about the printing order I was going to Los Angeles for, and not wanting to. So I started going through the purse of the woman next to me. Perhaps that sounds bad. It wasn't. I'd been doing it for years, and nobody ever complained. It started when I was a kid, this business of being able to explore the insides of things like purses and sealed boxes and locked drawers and, well, human beings. But human beings aren't worth the trouble. It's like swimming through spaghetti. And I've got to stay away from electric wires. They hurt. Now, don't ask me how they hurt. Maybe you think it's fun. For the most part, it really isn't. I always knew what was in Christmas presents before I unwrapped them, and therefore Christmas was always spoiled for me as a kid. I can't feel the color of anything, just its consistency. An apple senses about the same as a potato, except for the core and the stem. I can't even tell if there's writing on a piece of paper. So you see, it isn't much, just the feel of shapes, the hardnesses and softnesses. But I've learned to become pretty good at guessing. Like this woman next to me. She had a short cylindrical metal object in her purse with wax-like stuff inside, a lipstick, a round hard object with dust inside, a compact, handkerchief, chewing gum, a small book, probably an address book, money in a change purse, a few bills and coins, not much else. I was a little disappointed. I've run across a gun or two in my time, but I never say anything. I learned the wisdom of keeping my mouth shut in the fourth grade when Miss Winters, a stern, white-haired disciplinarian, ordered me to eat my sack lunch in the classroom with her instead of outside with some of the other kids. This was the punishment for some minor infraction. Lunchtime was nearly over, and we'd both finished eating. 
She said she'd be gone for a few moments and that I was to erase the blackboard during her absence, which I dutifully did. Class had hardly resumed when she started looking around the desk for her favorite mechanical pencil, asking if any of us had seen it, and looking straight at me. I didn't want her to think I had taken it while she was out of the room, so I probed the contents of her purse, which she always kept in the upper right drawer of her desk. It's in your purse, I blurted out. I was sent home with a stinging note. Since then, I've kept quiet. At one time, I assumed everybody was able to sense. I've known better for years. Still, I wonder how many other people are as close-mouthed about their special gift as I am about mine. I used to think that someday I'd make a lot of money out of it, but how? I can't read thoughts. I can't even be sure what some of the things I sense in probing really are. But I've learned to move things, ever so little. A piece of paper, a feather. Once I stopped one of those little glass-enclosed, lighter heat-powered devices with veins you see now and then in a jeweler's window, and I can stop clocks. Take this morning, for example. I had set my alarm for 5.30 because I had to catch the 7 o'clock plane at San Francisco International Airport. This being earlier than I usually get up, it seems all I did during the night was feel my way past the escapement and balance wheel to see where the notch for the alarm was. The last time I did it, there was just the merest fraction of an inch between the pawl and the notch. So I sighed and moved to the balance wheel and its delicate ribbon of spiraling steel. I hung on to the wheel, exerting influence to decrease the restoring torque. The wheel slowed down until there was no more ticking. It took quite a bit of effort, as it always does, but I did it, as I usually do. I can't stand the alarm. When I first learned to do this, I thought I had it made. I even went to Las Vegas to try my hand, so to speak, with the ratchets and poles and cams and springs on the slot machines. But there's nothing delicate about a slot machine, and the spring tensions are too strong. I dropped quite a lot of nickels before I finally gave up. So I'm stuck with a talent I found little real use for, except that it amuses me. Sometimes. Not like this time on the plane. The woman beside me stirred, sat up suddenly, and looked across me out the window. Where are we? she asked in a surprised voice. I told her we were probably a little north of Bakersfield. She said, oh, glanced at her wristwatch, and sank back again. Soon the stewardesses would bring coffee and donuts around, so I contented myself with looking at the clouds and trying to think about Amos McGaffey, who was purchasing agent for a Los Angeles amusement chain and how I was going to convince him our printing prices were maybe a little higher, but the quality and service were better. My mind wandered below where I was sitting, idly moving from one piece of luggage to another, looking for my beat-up suitcase. I went through slips and slippers, lingerie and laundry, a jigsaw puzzle, and a ukulele. I never did find my suitcase, because I found the bomb first. The bomb was in a small bag, a woman's bag, judging by the soft, flimsy things you'd never find in a man's, and I didn't know it was a bomb right away. I thought it was just a clock, one of those small, quiet alarms. I was going to pass it by and go on, but what held me was that something was taped to it. By the feel, I knew it must be electrician's tape. Interested and curious, I explored the clock more closely, found two wires. One went to a battery and the other to hard, round cylinders, taped together. The hairs stood up at the base of my neck when I suddenly realized what it was. The clock's balance wheel was rocking merrily. Quickly, I went up past the train of gears to the alarm wheel. If this was anything like my own alarm clock, this one had something like 10 minutes to go. It was 40 minutes to Burbank and Lockheed Air Terminal. My mind was churning when I turned from the window to look around at the unconcerned passengers, the woman at my side asleep again. I thought, which one of these? No, none of them would know it was there. I glanced out the window again. Clouds were still in the way. We'd be leaving the valley for the mountain range north of Los Angeles soon if we hadn't left it already. No place to land the plane there. But of course, that had been the plan. My heart was beating in jackhammer rhythm. My mouth was dry and my mind was numb. Tell somebody about the bomb before it's too late. No, they'd think I put it there. Besides, what good would it do? There'd be panic and they'd never get the plane down in time if they believed me. Sir, my head jerked around. 
The stewardess stood in the aisle, smiling, extending a tray to me, a brown plastic tray bearing a small paper cup of tomato juice, a cup of coffee, a cellophane-wrapped donut, paper spoon, sugar and dehydrated cream envelopes, and a napkin. I goggled at her, managed to croak, no thanks. She gave me an odd look and moved along. My seatmate had accepted hers and was tearing at the cellophane. I couldn't bear to watch her. I closed my eyes, forced my mind back to the luggage compartment, spent a frantic moment before I found the bag again. I had to stop that balance wheel, just as I stopped my alarm clock every morning. I tried to close everything off, the throb of engines, the rush of air, the woman sipping coffee noisily beside me, and I went into the clock and surrounded the seesawing wheel. When it went forward, I pulled it back. When it went back, I pulled it forward. I struggled with it, and it was like trying to work with greasy hands, and I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to stop it. Then, little by little, it began to slow its beat, but I could not afford to relax. I pushed and pulled and didn't dare release my hold until it came to a dead stop. Anything the matter? My eyelids flew open and I looked into the eyes of the woman next to me. There was sugar from the donut around her mouth and she was still chewing. No, I said, letting out my breath. I'm all right. You were moaning, it sounded like, and you kept moving your head back and forth. Must have been dreaming, I said as I rang for the stewardess. When she came, I told her I'd take some of that coffee now. No, nothing else, just coffee. I didn't tell her how much I needed it. I sat there, clammy with sweat, until she returned. Coffee never tasted so good. All right, so I had stopped the bomb's timer. My mind raced ahead to the landing. When they unloaded the luggage, the balance wheel would start again. I wouldn't be able to stay with it, keeping it still. I considered telling the authorities as soon as we landed, or maybe calling in ahead. But wouldn't that just bring suspicion, questions? Maybe I could convince them I could stop a clock, but not before the bomb exploded. And then what? My secret would be out, and my life would be changed. I'd be a man not to be trusted, a prying man, a man literally with gimlet eyes. Mountain crags jutted through the clouds. We were in the range north of the city. Here and there were clear spots and I could see roads below, but there were also clouds far above us. It was very beautiful, but it was also very bumpy, and we started to slip and slide. To my horror, I found that the balance wheel was rocking again. Closing my eyes and gritting my teeth, I forced my senses to the wheel, tugging and pulling, shoving and pushing, until it finally stopped. A jab in the shoulder. I jumped, startled. Your cup, my seat partner said, pointing. I looked down at the coffee cup I had crushed in my hands. Then I looked up into the eyes of the stewardess. I handed it to her. She took it without a word and went away. Were you really asleep that time? Not really, I said. I was tempted to tell the woman I was subject to fits, but I didn't. It was only a few minutes to landing, but they became the longest minutes of my life as time after time I stopped the rocking wheel when the plane dipped and bumped to a landing. Leaving the apron with the other passengers, I tried to walk as unconcernedly as they through the exit gate. I would have liked walking through the terminal and out the entrance in a way, but I could not. I had my suitcase to get for one thing. The damned bomb was the other. So I strolled out into the concourse again to look at the plane and watch the baggagemen at work transferring the luggage to two airfield carts. They weren't as careful as I would have been. It was impossible to tell from this distance just which bag contained the bomb. I could hardly identify my own scarred suitcase. The assortment of bags, a strange conglomeration of sizes and colors, was packed in some places six deep, and it rolled toward the gate where I was standing. I didn't know whether to stay or run, imagining the balance wheel now happily rocking again. The load went past me down a ramp to the front of the air terminal where the luggage was unloaded and placed in a long rack. I went with it. There was a flurry of ticket matching, hands grabbing for suitcases, and a general exodus on the part of my fellow passengers, too fast to determine who had got the one with the bomb. Now all that was left was the attendant, and I had two bags, my own battered veteran of years, and a fine new red overnight case, small enough to be the one. I lit a cigarette, reached out. Inside were women's things and a clock. The escapement was clicking vigorously. I didn't moan this time. 
I just closed my eyes, stretched toward, and grabbed the balance wheel I was getting to know like my own. I entered into a union with it so strong that after I had reduced it to immobility, it was like waking when I opened my eyes. The baggage claim attendant was staring at me. For only a moment I stared back. Then I quickly reached for my baggage check and presented it to him. His hand hovered over the handle of the little red bag and I was ready to yell at him. But then, matching numbers on the tags with his eyes, he grasped the handle of my own suitcase and pushed it toward me. Thanks, I said, taking it. I glanced ever so casually toward the remaining bag. One left over, huh? Yeah. He was so bored I was tempted to tell him what was in it, but he was eyeing me with a, well, why don't you get along look. I said, what happens if nobody claims it? Take it inside? Why? He was getting too curious. Oh, I just wondered, that's all. I stepped on my cigarette and walked toward the air terminal entrance and put my suitcase on the stone steps there. A red cap came hurrying over. Cab? I shook my head. Just waiting. Just waiting for somebody to pick up a bomb. I lit another cigarette and glanced now and then toward the baggage claim area. The red bag was still there. All sorts of theories ran through my head as to why it should still be there, and none satisfied me. I should not have been there, that much I knew. I should be with a man named Amos McGaffey on 6th Street at 10 o'clock, discussing something very mundane, the matter of a printing order. But what could I do? If I left the airport, the attendant would eventually take the bag inside, and there would be an explosion, and I wouldn't be able to live with myself. No, I had to stay to keep the balance wheel stationary until... Until what? A man in tan gabardine, wearing a police cap and badge, walked out of the entrance to stand on the stone steps beside me while he put on a pair of dark glasses. A member of the airport police detail. I could tell him. I could take him down to the little red bag and explain the whole thing. Then it would be his baby, and I would be off on my own business. But he moved on down the steps, nodded at the red cap, and started across the street to the parking area. I could have called to him. Hey, officer, let me tell you about a bomb in a little red bag. But I didn't. I didn't because I caught a movement at the baggage claim counter out of the side of my eye. The attendant had picked up the bag and was walking with it up the ramp to the rear of the air terminal. Picking up my own suitcase, I went inside in time to see him enter through a side door and deposit the bag on the scales at the airline desk and say something to the clerk. The clerk nodded and moved the bag to the rear room. I could visualize the balance wheel once again rocking like crazy. How many minutes or seconds were left? I was sweating when I moved to the counter, and it wasn't because of the sunshine I'd been soaking in. I had to get as close to the bag as I could if I was going to stop the clock again. Can I help you? The clerk asked. No, I'm waiting for someone. I turned my back to him, put down my suitcase, leaned against the counter, and reached out for the wheel. I found I could reach the device, but it was far away. When I tried to dampen it, the wheel escaped my grasp. Do you have my suitcase? I blinked my eyes open and looked around. The blonde in the plane stood there, looking very fresh and bright and unconcerned. In her right hand, she had a green baggage claim check. The clerk took it, nodded, and in a moment brought out the overnight case and set it on the scales. The girl thanked him, picked it up, glanced at me indifferently, and then started for the entrance with it. Just a moment. I found myself saying, grabbing my bag and hurrying after her. At her side and a little ahead of her, I said, listen to me. She looked annoyed and increased her stride toward the door. It's a matter of life or death, I said. I wanted to wrest the bag from her and hurl it out through the doorway into the street, but I restrained myself. She stopped and stared. I noticed a short, fat man in a rumpled suit coat and unpressed pants staring too. Ignoring him, I said, Please put the bag down, over there. I indicated a spot beside a telephone booth where it would be out of the way. She didn't move. She just said, why? For God's sake, I took the case. She offered no resistance. I put her bag and mine next to the booth. When I turned around, she was standing there looking at me, as if I'd gone out of my mind. Her eyes were blue and brown-flecked, very pretty eyes. And my thought at the moment was, I'm glad the bomb didn't go off. These eyes wouldn't be looking at me or anything else right now if it had. I've got to talk to you. It's very important. The girl said, why? I was beginning to think it was the only word she knew. At the same time, I was wondering why anyone would want to kill someone so lovely. I'll explain in a moment. 
Please stand right here while I make a telephone call. I moved toward the phone booth, paused and said, and don't ask me why. She gave me a speculative look. I must not have seemed a complete idiot because she said, all right, but... I didn't listen for the rest. I went into the booth, closed the door, pretended to drop a coin and dial a number. But all the time I was in there, I was reaching out through the glass for the clock. At this range, it wasn't difficult to stop the balance wheel. Just the same, when I came out, I was wringing wet. Now, will you please tell me what this is all about, she said stiffly. Gladly. Let me buy you a cup of coffee and I'll explain. She glanced at the bags. I told her they'd be all right. We followed the short fat man into the coffee shop. Over coffee, I explained it all to her, how I had this extrasensory ability, how she was the first person I'd ever revealed it to, and how I had discovered what was in her overnight bag. During the telling, her untouched coffee grew a skin, her face grew pale, her eyes grew less curious and more troubled. There were tears there when I finished. I asked her who put the bomb in her bag. Joe did, she said in a toneless voice, not looking at me anymore, but staring vacantly across the room. Joe put it there. Behind her eyes, she was reliving some recent scene. Who is Joe? My husband. I thought she was going to really ball, but she got control again. This trip was his idea, my coming down here to visit my sister. Her smile was bleak. I see now why he wanted to put in those books. I'd finished packing and was in the bathroom. He said he'd put in some books we'd both finished reading, for my sister. That's when he must have put the, put it in there. I said gently, why would he want to do a thing like that? I don't know, she shook her head. I, I just don't know. And she was close to bawling again. Then she recovered and said, I'm not sure I want to know. I admired her for saying it. Joe must have been crazy. It's all right now, she asked. I nodded, as long as we don't move it. I told her I didn't know how much more time there was, that I'd been thinking it over, and the only way out seemed to be to tell the airport policeman. After I explained it to her, the girl, she said her name was Julia Claremont, agreed to tell him she thought there was a bomb in her bag, that she had noticed a ticking, and had become worried because she knew she hadn't packed a clock. It wasn't good, but it would have to do. We've got to get it deactivated, I said, watching the fat man pay for his coffee and leave. The sooner, the better. I finished my coffee in one gulp and went to pay the bill with her. I asked her why she didn't claim the bag at the same time the other people had. She said she had called her sister and the phone was busy for a long while. She was supposed to meet me, and when she wasn't here, I got worried. She said she isn't feeling well and asked me to take a cab. She smiled a little. It was a bright, cheery thing. I had the feeling it was all for me. That's where I was going when you caught up with me. It had become a very nice day. But the bottom dropped out of it again when we reached the lobby. The two bags weren't there. I ran to the entrance and nearly collided with the red cab. See anybody go out of here with a little red bag and an old battered suitcase? Bag? A suitcase? He mumbled. Then he became excited. Why, a man just stepped out of here. He turned to look down the street. Oh, that's him. The dumpy man I'd seen was walking off, Julia's bag in his right hand, mine in his left. He seemed in no hurry. Hey, I shouted, starting toward him. The man turned, took one look at me, and started to run. He came abreast an old, gray, mud-spattered coupe, ran around, opened the door, and threw both bags into the rear seat as he got in. The car was a hundred feet away and gathering speed by the time I reached where it had been parked. I watched it for a moment, then walked back to the entrance where Julia was standing with the red cap, who said, That man steal them suitcases? That he did, I said. Just then, the airport policeman started across the street from the parking lot. Red cap said, Better tell him about it. The policeman was sympathetic and concerned. He said, We better get over to the office. But we never left the spot, because an explosion some blocks distant shattered the air. Julia's hand grasped my arm, hard. Jets, the red cap said, eyeing the sky. I don't know, the policeman said. Didn't sound much like a jet to me. We stood there. I could visualize the wreckage of an old gray coupe in the middle of the street, but I couldn't visualize the driver. That was all right. I didn't want to see him. I didn't know what Julia was thinking. She said, about those bags, and looked at me. The officer said, Yes, miss? I, I don't care about mine. I didn't have much of anything in it. I feel the same way, I said, 
Would it be all right if we didn't bother to report it? Well, the policeman said, I can't make you report it. I'd rather not, then, Julia said. She turned to me. I'd like some air. Can't we walk a little? Sure, I said. We started down the street, her arm in mine, as the air began to fill with the distant sounds of sirens. End of The Little Red Bag by Jerry Saul Recording by Colleen McMahon The Wheel is Death by Roger D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The little world was quiet at last. Only one thing remained to be done. Gore Zan must be slain quickly. The Wheel is Death by Roger D. His thin scream keened away in the distance. He was too late to stop them. Old Khaled's dropped his upraised arm, and at his signal the four naked underpriests flung the bound body of Gorzan over the precipice. Ortho heard his friend's thin scream keening away until it dwindled in the distance and the muted roar of the falls boiling over the cliff's bottom floated upward and drowned it he turned to run but the horror of what he had seen numbed his limbs to nightmare slowness khalids and the four underpriests caught him before he had taken a dozen steps you are still a neophyte old khalid said gently you have only begun to learn, and so you cannot understand why Gore Zan had to die. The answer lies there. He pointed a wrinkled hand at the valley below. Over the heads of the four priests who squatted on the ledge outside the priest cave, Ortho looked down into the valley, the lush green miles of its even floor, clothed in a faint rosy haze of vapor. The sun sat red upon the western wall. Above the eastern rim, the rising moon hung warm and turquoise blue, its great encircling ring pulsing like an aura of living light. Under its glow the valley haze turned violet, and then blue, and on the heels of its rising came the faint elfin voices of the people, leaving their caves to play in the meadow. Ortho sat back upon his polished sitting stone and met the high priest's eyes defiantly. There is no reason down there, he said sullenly. It's only the people coming out to play under the moon. You killed Gorzan because he was wiser than you, because he talked to the people and made clear to them things they did not understand before. You were jealous of him, and you killed him, lest he make your own wisdom seem small in the eyes of the people. Callus sighed and seated himself stiffly on his own sitting stone. The young do not learn easily, he said, but believe this, Ortho. Your friend Gorzan was a snare to the people and a deadly menace to their way of life. We took him from them reluctantly and only as a last resort before he could start the people again on the bloody path of ambition progress and the machine ortho cupped his still beardless chin in his hands and stared disconsolately down into the blue hazed valley where the people played empty talk he said contemptuously priest talk ambition progress the machine i do not know the words there is nothing but the valley and the people who have always been and who will always be your words have no meaning i have taught these others callus murmured the blue moonlight pulsed warmly across his wrinkled face made his hooded eyes pools of reflected light i can teach you too you would know these things soon because you are almost ready to read the books but I shall tell you now that you may not be rebellious for lack of understanding he pointed again this time at the moon with its restless blue halo 
It was not always so, he said. His voice softened as his memory drifted back across the ages. Once it was yellow, pitted and airless and dead, shining only with the light reflected from the sun. Men changed that as they changed the face of their world by the power of their science, which in the end defeated the aims they strove for and destroyed them almost utterly. The handful that remained of them found haven in the valley and began a new civilization, which is today the people. This time, being wiser, they outlawed the practice of science. Under Kala's calm assurance, Ortho's resentment dwindled, and his loathing of the high priest gave way to bewilderment. Science, he repeated, it is another strange word. I do not understand. In another age, Gorazan would have been a scientist, Kallus said. I have seen them with my own eyes in the ancient days, puttering in tomb-like shops that shut other men away from them, denying all pleasure while they spent their lives improving what other scientists had already discovered. They were never satisfied, and in the end it was their insatiable lust for perfection that killed them, that set the very moon aflame, and flung mankind back into the savagery from which it had risen. For there was a time, he went on somberly, shifting his sitting stone to follow Ortho's troubled gaze down into the blue depths of the valley. Long before my own, when men lived as simply as we, but without our peace and security. The world then was a savage place, full of frightful beasts that killed men for food, because they were no more than weak animals. Men being weak and soft, sought communal safety in numbers, and gained an advantage over the beasts because they developed intelligence and logic by exchanging ideas and experiences. They learned to use this intelligence to develop weapons which eventually wiped out the dangerous beasts and made the world safe. But they were not content with safety and fought savagely among themselves. Nations numbering millions of men came into being and warred with each other, and with each war their ingenuity grew, and the deadliness of their weapons kept pace with their ingenuity. Callas was quiet for a moment, listening to the faint laughter of the people that drifted up faintly from the valley floor. Men were not happy then as they are now, he said. I remember them, Ortho, because I was one of them and by a miracle escaped the great holocaust that destroyed mankind. Man had developed a weapon whose destructiveness was beyond the power of the mind to conceive, and it escaped control. Nation after nation died in a breath. Whole continents vanished under the impact of the robot missiles, whose explosions destroyed matter itself. One of these, perhaps by intent, struck the moon, and its reaction under the moon's light gravity set up a conflagration which never went out. Those of us who survived the Holocaust were greatly changed by the radiations of the explosions, and most of us soon died. I alone, by chance, was rendered deathless. More ages have passed than I can remember, but I live on, perhaps eternally, to see that the people do not err and fall again into the trap which science, with its machines, would place in their way. Gorzon was a throwback to my own savage days, a natural scientist who believed nothing he was told, and reasoned with a deadly logic that nothing created by nature can be perfect, but must be improved by the thought and effort of man. Today we slew him reluctantly, because he had taken the final irrevocable step that branded him a heretic and an outlaw. Gorzon made a machine. He stretched out a hand to Ortho, and they rose together, the abashed eyes of the neophyte not meeting those of the high priest. Come, Khaled said, and behold the thing with your own eyes. I have kept it intact to convince you beyond doubt of Gorzon's heresy. 
they went back to the priest cave past the long tiers of books crumbling and yellow with age to stand in awed silence over the thing gorzan had made ortho stared shivered feeling a cold aura of unsentient alien power that radiated from the machine it was a crude affair built upon two wooden shafts that slanted upward to end in a pair of rough handles across them were lashed shorter sticks that supported a woven basket a little wooden axle running through the center and holding the disc upright between the joined ends of the shafts gorazan tired of making two trips to his cave with firewood and fruit old Kalis said somberly so he created a machine which would carry a greater load than his shoulders would bear in my own age the thing was called a wheelbarrow but the name of it is not important now because there will never be another we will destroy it now and with its destruction we will forget what gorzan had rediscovered which is the first principle of the machine that enslaved and then destroyed mankind the wheel the end of the Wheel is Death by Roger D. Freeway by Bryce Walton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins. Freeway by Bryce Walton. The Morrisons didn't lose their freedom. They were merely sentenced to the highways for life. Never stopping anywhere, going no place, just driving, driving, driving. Some people had disagreed with him. They were influential people. He was put on the road. Stan wanted to scream at the big 16-cylinder special to go faster. But Salt Lake City, where they would allow him to stop over for the maximum eight hours, was a long way off, and anyway, he couldn't go over a hundred. The special had an automatic cutoff. He stared down the super ten-lane freeway, down the glassy river, plunging straight across the early desert morning into nowhere. That was Anna's trouble. His wife couldn't just keep traveling, knowing there was no place to go. No one could do that. I can't do it much longer either, Stan thought. The two of us, with no place to go, but back and forth, across and over, retracing the same thoroughways, highways, freeways, a thousand times round and round like mobile bugs caught in a gigantic concrete net. He kept watching his wife's white face in the rearview mirror. Now there was this bitter veil of resignation painted on it. He didn't know when the hysteria would scream through again, what she would try next or when. She had always been highly emotional, vital, active, a fighter. The special kept moving, but it was still a suffocating cage. She needed to stop over somewhere, longer, much longer than the maximum eight hours. She needed treatment, a good long rest, a doctor's care. She might need more than that. Complete freedom, perhaps. She had always been an all-or-nothing gal, but he couldn't give her that. Shimmering up ahead, he saw the shack about fifty feet off the freeway, saw the fluttering of colorful hand-woven rugs and blankets covered with ancient Indian symbols. It wasn't an authorized stop, but he stopped. The car swayed slightly as he pressed the hydraulic. From the bluish haze of the desert's tranquil breath, a jackrabbit hopped onto the freeway's fringe. It froze. Then with a squeal, it scrambled back into the dust to escape the thing hurtling toward it out of the rising sun. Stan jumped out. The dust burned. There was a flat, heavy violence to the blast of morning sun on his face. He looked in through the rear window of the car. You'll be okay, honey. Her face was feverish. Sweat stood out on her forehead. She didn't look at him. It's too late, she said. We're dead, Stan. Moving all the time, but not alive. He turned. The pressure, the suppression, the helpless anger was in him, meeting the heavy hand of the sun. An old Indian, wearing dirty Levi's and a denim shirt and a beaded belt, was standing near him. His face was angled. 
so dark it had a bluish tinge. Blanket? Rugs? Handmade? Real Indian stuff? My wife's sick, Stan said. She needs a doctor. I want to use your phone to call a doctor. I can't leave the freeway. This was the fourth unauthorized stop he had made since Anna tried to jump out of the car back there, when it was going a hundred miles an hour. The Indian saw the special's license. He shrugged, then shook his head. For God's sake, don't shake your head, Stan yelled. Just let me use your phone. The Indian kept on shaking his head. There was no emotion, only a fatalistic acceptance of the overly complex world he and many of his kind had rejected long ago. You're a crackpot. But what's that to you when I just want to use your phone? If I can get a doctor's affidavit, if I help you, then the law comes down on my neck. But I only want to use the phone. I cannot risk it. You drive on now. He felt it, the thing that was slowly dying in Anna's eyes. The need to strike out, strike out hard and murderously, at something real. The suppressed feeling had been growing in him now for too many miles to remember. He started forward, but the Indian slid the knife from his beaded belt. I'm sorry, and that's the honest truth, the Indian said. But you have to move on now. The Indian stepped back toward the ancient symbols of his kind. We've stopped moving. We stay here now, no matter what. Now, white doctor, it's your turn to move on. He put his hand over his eyes as though to push something down. One act of violence and the questionable freedom would be ended. That would be an admission of defeat. His hand still over his eyes, he backed away. Then he turned, choking and half-blinded with smoldering rage. Keep moving. Nothing else to do with them but put them on the road and keep them moving never letting them stop long enough to cause trouble, to stir up any wrong ideas. Hit the road, crackpot. Head on down the super ten-lane freeway into the second middle age lit with neon. Then he was running, yelling at Anna. She was past the shack and stumbling through and toward the mountains. He coaxed her back into the car, sickness gorging his throat as she kicked and screamed at him, and he forced her into the corner of the back seat. Stan, we could run to the mountains! The law wouldn't let us get very far. Remember, the special's remotely controlled. If we leave the freeway, they'd be on us in no time. They know when we stop, where we stop. They know if we leave the freeway. But we would have tried. They're just waiting for us to do something legally wrong so they can put us away, honey. We can't let ourselves be goaded into doing anything legally wrong. Stan. She was shaking her head and her eyes were wet. Can't you see... Can't you see? What they do to us doesn't matter. It's what we do or don't do. When she quieted down a little, he got back under the wheel. Within a hundred feet, the special was going 85 miles an hour. The thing he had to hold on to hard was the fact that they had never really done anything wrong. Anna needed a good long rest so she could regain the proper perspective. The high court itself had said they hadn't done anything wrong. There were thousands now on the freeways. None of them had any real criminal labels on them. They were risks. They might be dangerous. Attitudes not quite right. A little off-center one way or another at the wrong time. Some personal indiscretion in the past. A thought not quite orthodox in the present. A possible future threat. A threat to total security. Be careful. Easy does it. Too many black marks on his road record and the freedom of the road would go. Then he would be a criminal in fact, instead of a vague criminal possibility, and put behind bars. Or worse. To hell with him. To hell with it all. He pulled over onto an emergency siding and stopped. Not authorized. A good long rest and talk with Anna. Then he saw it. Suddenly. Frantically. He wanted to move on. But now he couldn't. He kept seeing the light of defiance fading from Anna's eyes. The patrol car was there the way it always was there, suddenly materializing out of the desert or out of a mountain or a side street. Sometimes it was a halo dropping out of the sky. Sometimes it was a light flashing in the darkness. Every official of the law, city, county, state, or federal had a full record on every special. They could control them at will, stop them, start them, keep them moving down the line. Jails of the open road, mobility leading to incarceration, a mock illusion of freedom. Open sky, open prairie, the freeway stretching ahead, and the patrol car coming up behind. The 
patrol car stopped. Two patrolmen in black and gold uniforms looked in at Stan. Well, Egghead, the older, beefier one said, it was nice of you to stop without being asked. A fellow named Freddy back at Snap Service Number 7 said you might be a troublemaker. We thought we ought to check up. Stan said, I wanted to use his phone to try and get a doctor to examine my wife. She's ill. She needs help, and I've been trying. Without turning, the older patrolman interrupted. Larry, what you got on the philosopher here? The young patrolman, who had a shy, almost embarrassed air about him, looked into his black notebook. He isn't a philosopher, not officially, Leland. Every crackpot we stop, you figure him to be a philosopher. You just hate philosophers, that's all. Well, that's a fact, boy. When he took the scar out of his mouth, the corners of his mouth were stained brown. My kid got loused up plenty by a philosopher in high school last year. I raised a squawk and got the crackpot kicked out. I also got three others booted out for hiring him in the first place. I found out he was a lousy atheist. The patrolman put the cigar back in his mouth. What have you got on him, Lieutenant? Stanley, L. Morrison, B.A., Drake University, Class of 55. Doctor of Philosophy, Drake University, 1957. Federal Employee, 1957-59. to Dropped from the Federal Employment, January 1959. What for, Lieutenant? For excessive political enthusiasm for the preceding political party in office. Lieutenant looked up almost apologetic. Looks like he was unfortunate enough to have been on the wrong side of the fence when the independents were elected. These guys are dangerous no matter what side they're on. A crackpot shouldn't be on either side. Well, Lieutenant, what else? Professor of Nuclear Physics, Drake University. 1960 to 62. Dismissed by Board of Regents, May 31. Charged with private thought inconsistent with the policies of the university. Special Inquiry, August 5th. Dismissal sustained. Was put on the road as a permanent risk to security, February 3rd, 1963. He's been on the road for a year and three months. Stan forced quiet into his voice. My wife's sick. If I could get a doctor to examine her, I'm sure I could get a permit to lay over somewhere so she can get rest and proper treatment. Only eight hours, the beefy one said. That's the limit, and you're not supposed to have stopped here at all, or back at the Indians. I know, Stan said, but this is an emergency. If you could help me. The beefy one grinned into the back seat. That might be all that's bothering the Mrs. Egghead. She ain't getting the proper treatment, maybe. Easy does it. In the rearview mirror, he could see what the patrolman said had brought a flush of life to her face. She was rigid now, and then suddenly she screamed, Stan! For God's sake, Stan! Don't take any more from this simian! Let's go, the young lieutenant said quickly. We've got the report, and we'll forward it. There's no call to bait them. Shut up, the beefy one said. Don't tell me to shut up, the lieutenant said. He put his notebook away. This man's never committed any crime. That's why he's here on the road. They didn't know what else to do with him. We're supposed to keep them moving, that's all. Not to hold him up because of personal vindictiveness. Beefy One's face was getting red. Don't use your big words on me, boy. I'll send you back to college. He's getting punishment enough. You've got nothing against him or the woman. The Beefy One took a deep breath. Okay, Lieutenant, but I'm going to drop a few words in the right place. I guess you know how the Commissioner feels about crackpots. I don't give a damn. Come on, let's get out of here. The lieutenant looked at Stan a moment. You better move on, Doctor. Thanks, Stan said. At the next snappy service, maybe you can phone. That's an hour's authorized stop for specials. There's a government project in the hills nearby. You might be able to contact a doctor there. The sage spread out to a blur. Heat wavered up from the freeway. In the rearview mirror, he saw Anna leaning back, her legs stretched out, her arms limp at her side. She wasn't thinking about this with a historical perspective. That was the trouble. She had lost the saving sense of continuity. With generations gone, which stretched like a lifeline across the fright and present. Keep the perspective. Wait it out. That was the only way. This was a historical phase, part of a cycle. Stan couldn't blame anyone. Anxiety, suspicion of intellectuals and men of science, as though they had been more responsible really than anyone else. Suspicion and fear. There always had to be a whipping boys. In one form or another, he knew it. It had happened many times before. 
another time of change and danger. It was a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning. When things were better, they hadn't remained better. When they were bad, they couldn't stay bad. Wait it out. One thing he knew, neither he or any other scientist could detach himself from life. The frightened policemen of the public conscious had made the mistake of thinking they could detach the scientist. I'll not withdraw from it. All of it represents a necessary change. If not for the immediate better, then I'll be here for the immediate worst, which will someday change into something better than ever. But Anna's tired voice was whispering in his ear, First of all, we're individuals. Men, women, we've got to fight. Fight back. At what? Ourselves? A sign said, Howl's snappy service, 27 miles. She's right, he thought, and started slowing down. This is it. He wasn't going any farther until Anna was examined, and he was given an okay to stop somewhere she could rest. It was a dusty oasis, an arid anachronism on the desert's edge. Beyond it, the mountains blundered up like giants from a purplish haze, brooding and somehow threatening. Groves of cottonwoods could be seen far ahead and sprinklings of green reaching into the thinning sage. The old man shuffled out of the shade by the coke machine. Behind him, through dusty glasses, Stan saw the blurred faces staring with curiosity. The old man hesitated, then came around between the pumps to the driver's side. He was all stooped, bone and leathery skin. His face, Stan thought beneath the rising desperation, resembled an African ceremonial mask. To the left, a 62 Forgester was cranked up for a grease job, but the only life around it was a scrawny dog laying out flat to get all the air possible on its ribby body, its tongue hanging out in the black grease. The car's okay, Stan said. I just want to use your telephone. Dr. Morrison, you'd better go on Salt Lake City. There's an eight-hour stopover. My wife needs a doctor's okay for a long rest. I can't take a chance on going clear to Salt Lake City. But this is only an hour stop. Stan got out and shoved past the old man. Heat waves shivered up out of the concrete and through the soles of his shoes. The heat seared his dry throat and burned his lungs. Anna wasn't even looking. She seemed to have forgotten him. Almost everyone had forgotten him by now, he thought. Forgotten Dr. Stanley Morrison. The man who had never been afraid to speak out and say what he thought and think what he wanted to think. Fifteen months with never more than an eight-hour stopover. Thought and self-regard froze by perpetual motion and shriveled by consequent neglect. Only the old man remembered. That was odd. A man stepped into the doorway. He was lean and powerful, with a long, gaunt, chewing jaw like that of a horse. His eyes were small and black, and he was grinning with anticipation. Stan felt his stomach muscles tighten. Behind the man, Stan saw the kid, almost as tall as the man who was obviously his father, but rail thin, like an emaciated duplicate of the man, a starved, frustrated shadow, grinning and feverishly picking at a pimple under his left ear. He carried a grease gun cradled in his left arm as though it were a machine gun. I'd like to use your phone, please, Stan said. My wife's ill. I want to phone the government project and see if I can get a doctor over here to look at her. What seems to be troubling the missus? I don't know. Then how do you know it's a serious sickness, crackpot? Just let me use the phone. Will you do that? They phoned in ahead, Crackpot. Said you might be a troublemaker. I don't want to make any trouble. I just want to use the phone. Why? Even if the doc came over, you wouldn't be here. He can't get here inside of an hour. And that's all the longer you can stay here. you got to move on. I'm coming in to use the phone, Stan heard himself saying. He fought to keep the breathiness out of his voice, the trembling out of his throat. I don't guess I'd want to have it said I was coddling a Crackpot. I never caused you any trouble. You helped build them hell bombs, the man said. He took his toothpick out of his mouth. You crazy bastards got to be kept moving along the road. How do you know what I did or didn't do? You're a crackpot. I never helped build any kind of bomb, Stan whispered. But even if I did, you're one of them nuclear physicists. I was an instructor at a university. I taught at a government school once, too, for a while. He stopped himself realizing he was defending himself as though somehow he suspected his own guilt. You taught other guys how to build hell bombs. Who needs you and your kind crockpot? We need your brains like we need a knife in the back. 
Stan lunged forward. The kid yelled something in a high-cracked voice as Stan lashed out again. He felt his knuckles scraping across hard teeth. Blood leaped from the man's upper lip in a thin, crimson slash. His eyes widened with a grudging respect. Then he snarled through the blood as he stumbled backward and off balance. He fell against the window and, trying to regain his balance, reeled and went down in a welter of empty gallon oil cans. He gathered himself for an upward lunge. Through the blood staining his teeth, he muttered, By God, crackpot, I didn't think you had the guts. Stan glanced out of the window and saw that Anna was gone from the car. Dimly, he heard the man saying he was going to beat hell out of the crackpot, going to beat the crackpot over the head, and then the crackpot wouldn't be able to cook up any more dangerous ideas in it for a long, long time. Anna may die now, Stan thought, as he stood there, bent over a little, feeling his wet fist tightening. She may die now, because of a frustrated fool, who doesn't know what else to do with himself on a hot, dull, and empty afternoon. Stan suddenly caught the flash of color out of the corner of his eye. He twisted, not thinking at all, and felt his fist sink into the kid's stomach. The kid fell, curling up among the empty oil cans. He writhed and moaned and held his stomach. Get up, Stan yelled in the man's face. Get up! The man came up all at once, and his weight hurled Stan clear across the room. He felt the gum machine shatter under him, and the metal grinding into his side as he rolled. Stan felt the grease gun in his hand as he saw the man lifting the tire tool, and then Stan swung the grease gun into his face, seeing the terrible grin, the blood-stained white smile. Unrecognizable as it was, the man's face wouldn't go away. Stan swung at it again. Then he heard her voice, Anna's voice, intense and alive, and there was a flash of Anna the way he remembered her a thousand years ago before they were put on the road. She was tearing at the man's face with her fingernails and kicking him savagely. Stan had the man's shirt collar and was ripping under his fingers as he slammed the head against the concrete floor. The thudding rhythm was coming up to his arms and throbbing behind his eyes. Like drums, he thought, as a sickening light flashed in the dusty glass, like primitive war drums beating out a dance of tribal doom. Suddenly, feeling sick and weak, he stood up and walked stiffly out into the sun. He leaned against the side of the building, trying to keep from retching. Anna touched his arm, and he looked up, half blinded by the glare of the sun. Her face was flushed and alive. She seemed ten years younger. Don't be sorry, she said. Be glad, Stan. They broke us, he whispered. We've crawled into the cage. It doesn't matter, Stan. It doesn't matter what they do to us now. It is something to admit you're human, isn't it? She was partly right, at least. He felt both glad and sad. But in either case, it was the end of the road. He saw the old man lowering the hood of the special. He ran back between the pumps, carrying a metal toolbox. I've fixed it, he said, breathing heavily. Now get out of here. Push it to the limit. I broke the cut off too. Hurry it up. But what's the use, Stan said. They'll get us sooner or later. They're not going to get you now, not if you stop reasoning everything out as though it were a problem in calculus. I've cut the remote control off and the radar and the radio. They won't know where you are. I've changed the license plate too, but hurry out of here before Haller or his kids start phoning. But being on the freeway, Stan said, they'll catch up with us. What's the use? Stan, Anna said sharply. Can't you see? We're getting away. I don't want to run away from it, Stan said. You're not running away from anything, the old man said. You'll find out. Follow my directions and you'll find out. You're not running away. You can get out of the flood water for a while, sit back on the bank until the water drops and clears a little. Stan looked into the old man's face for a long moment. Who the hell are you, anyway? That doesn't matter, Dr. Morrison. Now will you get out of here? Move on down the road. Stan finally nodded and took Anna's arm and they started towards the special. All right, but what about you, he asked the old man. I'll make out. You just be concerned about yourself, Dr. Morrison. This isn't the first time I've helped someone off the road. It won't be the last time either, I hope. He waved to them as the special, without any limit to its speed, now except the limitations of a driver's nerve, roared away towards the mountains. Now the special became anonymous on the freeway, one of countless cars hurtling down the super ten-lane freeway, its license changed, its controls and checkers cut off, 
its sovereignty returned to it by a nameless old man, a box of wrenches, and a roll of wire. Three hundred miles farther on, the freeway began a long, banked curve. A thick wall of cottonwoods, willows, and small brush lined the side where a creek rushed out of a cleft into the lower hills and ran along the freeway's edge. Stan started to slow down. There, that's it, Anna said, pointing excitedly. The big rock, the three tall trees, there, between the rock and the trees. Turn, Stan, turn! But there isn't any road, there isn't... Turn! Stan turned. He blinked as the special roared off the freeway and smashed through a solid wall of leaves, branches, and brush. They were on a narrow, winding dirt road, dipping down into the stream where a foot of water ran over the stones to create a ford. It twisted up the other side, around the creek's edge, over stones and gravel, twisting tortuously upward and out of sight like a coiled rope. Go on, Stan, keep going. Stan kept going, demanded all of his powers of concentration just to stay on the road, which was hardly more than a pathway through the rising mountains. He had no time to think, and very little to say. Some hundred and fifty miles farther into the mountains, at an altitude that bit into their lungs, they saw the markers, almost buried in rocks on the left side of the road, a place where the old man had told them to stop and wait. But they didn't have to wait. A man, lean and healthy for his age, which must have been at least sixty, Stan thought, stepped from behind a rock and came towards the special. He was smiling, and he extended his hand. Dr. and Mrs. Morrison, he said. Anna was already out of the car, shaking his hand. Stan got out. He took a second look, then whispered, Dr. Benjamin? The man wore Levi's and a Mackinac, and he carried a rifle slung under one arm. I wasn't expecting you to recognize me, he said as they shook hands. I've lost about 35 pounds, he smiled again. It's healthier up here. He walked around to the driver's side and opened the door. The motor was still running. Stan realized then what Benjamin was doing, and for some reason, without definition, he started to protest. Benjamin was setting the automatic clutch and releasing the brake. The special started moving up the road, but there was no one inside to turn the wheel when it reached the hairpin turn about 50 feet ahead. Stan watched the car gaining speed, its left door swinging like the door of a vacant house. He thought of stories he had heard about convicts, finally released after many years, stunned, frightened by reality, begging to be returned to the restricted but understandable cell. Then he smiled. Anna smiled. The special, once you push the right button, could do almost anything by itself. Feed itself gas, gain speed, shift its gears. But it didn't know when to turn to avoid self-destruction. Stan went slightly as the car lurched a little and then leaped out into space. He felt the black void opening under him as though he were still in the special fifteen months. His ears were filled with the sudden screeching whine of the wheels against the unresisting air. Then the world seemed to burst with a thundering series of solid, smashing roars, which were quickly dissipated into the high mountain air. Dr. Benjamin went over to the edge and looked down. That's the tenth one, he said. We're going to send a work team down there in a few days to cover it all over with rocks. Still, I doubt if we have to worry about them spotting the wreckage. He turned. Well, let's start hiking. It's still a few miles. Where? Stan asked. I've gone this far. I had no choice. But now, what's it all about? Didn't the old man tell you? No. Just remember, Morrison, we're not running away. This is an old Mormon trail. A lot of the old pioneers took it. The marker says that the williams Connor party camped here and was massacred by Indians in 1867. There's an old Indian city at about 3,000 feet. I guess we're the first ones to use it for maybe a thousand years. We've got an archaeologist up there, Michael Hillard, who's been going slightly crazy. Anyway, we've got books up there. We raise most of our own food, and we've got plenty of time to study and try and figure out where we've made the big mistakes. We're really doing very well. But what about the old man, Anna asked. Benjamin chuckled. Arch has turned into a regular man of a thousand faces. He works along the freeways and watches for those who are at the breaking point and can't stay on the road any longer. Some of those condemned to the freeway are criminals. Others are fools or misguided zealots. And we've got to be careful not to wise those birds up by mistake. 
Arch has an unerring instinct, and sending our people to us is his job. The three of them started walking up the old pioneer trail. We've made a lot of mistakes, Benjamin said. All of us, some more than others. You can't blame people for being afraid, suspicious of us. We did unleash the potentialities for total destruction without ever thinking about the social implications or ever bothering to wonder about how our contributions would be used and controlled. So we're off there waiting now, waiting and studying. Someday they'll need us again, and we'll be ready. But who was the old man, Anna asked. Benjamin laughed. Only the greatest physicist of the age. Remember Arch Hoffenstein? Stan put his arm over Anna's shoulder, and they walked on and up. He had almost forgotten, but now he never would. Somewhere, Arch Hoffenstein was hitchhiking along the freeway with the ghost of Galileo. End of Freeway by Bryce Walton Recording by James Jenkins Accidental Death by Peter Bailey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Penny Witt. Accidental Death by Peter Bailey The most dangerous of weapons is the one you don't know is loaded. The wind howled out of the northwest, blind with snow and barbed with ice crystals. All the way up the half-mile precipice, it fingered and wrenched away at groaning ice slabs. It screamed over the top, whirled snow in a dervish dance around the hollow there, piled snow into the long, furrow, plowed ruler straight through streamlined hummocks of snow. The sun glinted on black rock glazed by ice, chasms and ridges and bridges of ice. It lit the snow slope to a frozen glare, penciled black shadow down the long furrow, and flashed at the furrow's end on a thing of metal and plastics, an artifact thrown down in the dead wilderness. Nothing grew, nothing flew, nothing walked, nothing talked. But the thing in the hollow was stirring in stiff jerks like a snake with its back broken or a clockwork toy running down. When the movement stopped, there was a click and a strange sound began, thin, scratchy, inaudible more than a yard away, Weary, but still cocky, there leaked from the shape in the hollow the sound of a human voice. I've tried my hands and arms, and they seem to work, it began. I've wiggled my toes with entire success. It's well on the cards that I'm all in one piece and not broken up at all, though I don't see how it could happen. Right now, I don't feel like struggling up and finding out. I'm fine where I am. I'll just lie here for a while and relax, and get some of the story on tape. This suit's got a built-in recorder. I might as well use it. That way, even if I'm not as well as I feel, I'll leave a message. You probably know we're back and wonder what went wrong. I suppose I'm in a state of shock. That's why I can't seem to get up. Who wouldn't be shocked after luck like that? I've always been lucky, I guess. Luck got me a place on the whale. Sure, I'm a good astronomer, but so are lots of other guys. If I were ten years older, it would have been an honor being picked for the first long jump in the first starship ever. At my age, it was luck. You'll want to know if the ship worked. Well, she did. Went like a bomb. We got lined up between Earth and Mars, you'll remember, and James pushed the button marked jump. 
took his finger off the button, and there we were, Alpha Centauri. Two months later, your time, one second later by us. We covered our whole survey assignment like that, smooth as a pint of old and mild, which right now I could certainly use. Better yet would be a pint of hot black coffee with sugar in it. Failing that, I could even go for a long drink of cold water. There was never anything wrong with the whale till right at the end. And even then I doubt if it was the ship itself that fouled things up. That was some survey assignment. We astronomers really lived. Wait till you see. But of course you won't. I could weep when I think of those miles of lovely color film, all gone up in smoke. I'm shocked, all right. I never said who I was. Matt Hennessy from Farside Observatory, back of the moon, just back from a proving flight, come astronomical survey in the starship whale. Whoever you are who finds this tape, you're made. Take it to any radio station or newspaper office. You'll find you can name your price and don't take any wooden nickels. Where had I got to? I told you how we happened to find Chang, hadn't I? That's what the natives called it. Walking, talking natives on a blue sky planet with 1.1 g gravity and a 20% oxygen atmosphere at 15 psi. The odds against finding Chang on a six-sun survey on the first star jump ever must be up in the Googles. We certainly were lucky. The Chang natives aren't very technical, haven't got space travel, for instance. They're good astronomers, though. We were able to show them our sun in their telescopes. In their way, they're a highly civilized people. Look more like cats than people, but they're people, all right. If you doubt it, chew these facts over. One, they learned our language in four weeks. When I say they, I mean a ten-man team of them. Two, they brew a near beer. That's a lot nearer than the canned stuff we had on board the whale. Three, they've a great sense of humor. Ran rather to silly practical jokes, but still. Can't say I care for that hot foot and belly laugh stuff myself. But tastes differ. Four, the ten-man language team also learned chess and table tennis. But why go on? People who talk English, drink beer, like jokes, and beat me at chess or table tennis are people for my money, even if they look like tigers in trousers. It was funny the way they won all the time at table tennis. They certainly weren't so hot at it. Maybe that 10% extra gravity put us off our strokes. As for chess, Sevenloff was our champion. He won sometimes. The rest of us seemed to lose whichever Ching Sai we played. There again, it wasn't so much that they were good. How could they be in the time? It was more that we all seemed to make silly mistakes when we played them, and that's fatal in chess. Of course, it's a screwy situation. Playing chess with something that grows its own fur coat, has yellow eyes an inch and a half long and long white whiskers. Could you have kept your mind on the game? And don't think I fell victim to their feline charm. The children were pets, but you didn't feel like patting the adults on their big grinning heads. Personally, I didn't like the one I knew best. He was called, well, we called him Charlie, and he was the ethnologist, ambassador, contact man, or whatever you like to call him, who came back with us. Why I disliked him was because he was always trying to get the edge on you. All the time he had to be top. 
great sense of humor, of course. I nearly broke my neck on that butter slide he fixed up in the metal alleyway to the whale's engine room. Charlie laughed fit to bust. Everyone laughed. I even laughed myself, though doing it hurt me more than the tumble had. Yes, life and soul of the party, old Charlie. My last sight of the minnow was a cabin full of dead and dying men, the Swedish stink of burned flesh and the choking reek of scorching insulation, the boat jolting and shuddering and beginning to break up, and in the middle of the flames, still unhurt, was Charlie. He was laughing. My God, it's dark out here. Wonder how high I am. Must be all of 50 miles, and doing 800 miles an hour at least. I'll be doing more than that when I land. What's final velocity for a 50-mile fall? Same as a 50,000-mile fall, I suppose. Same as escape. 24,000 miles an hour. I'll make a mess. That's better. Why didn't I close my eyes before? Those star streaks made me dizzy. I'll make a nice shooting star when I hit air. Come to think of it, I must be deep in air now. Let's take a look. It's getting lighter. Look at those peaks down there, like great knives. I don't seem to be falling as fast as I expected, though almost seem to be floating. Let's switch on the radio and tell the world hello. Hello, Earth. Hello, again. And goodbye. Sorry about that. I passed out. I don't know what I said, if anything, and the suit recorder has no playback or eraser. What must have happened is that the suit ran out of oxygen. And I lost consciousness due to anoxia. I dreamed I switched on the radio, but I actually switched on the emergency tank, thank the Lord, and that brought me round. Come to think of it, why not crack the suit and breathe fresh air instead of bottled? No, I'd have to get up to do that. I think I'll just lie here a little bit longer and get properly rested up before I try to do anything big like standing up. I was telling about the return journey, wasn't I? The long jump back home, which should have dumped us between the orbits of Earth and Mars, instead of which, when James took his finger off the button, the mass detector showed nothing except the noise level of the universe. We were out in that no place for a day. We astronomers had to establish our exact position relative to the solar system. The crew had to find out exactly what went wrong. The physicist had to make mystic passes in front of meters and mutter about residual folds in the stress-free space. Our task was easy because we were about half a light year from the sun. The crew's job was also easy. They found what went wrong in less than half an hour. It still seems incredible. To program the ship for a star jump, you merely told it where you were and where you wanted to go. In practical terms, that entailed first a series of exact measurements, which had to be translated into the somewhat obtruse coordinate system we used based on the topological order of mass points in the galaxy. Then you cut a tape on the computer and hit the button. Nothing was wrong with the computer. Nothing was wrong with the engines. We'd hit the right button, and we'd gone to the place we'd aimed for. All we'd done was aim for the wrong place. It hurts me to tell you this, and I'm just attached personnel with no spaceflight tradition. In practical terms, one highly trained crew member had punched a wrong pattern of holes on the tape. 
Another equally skilled had failed to notice this when reading back. A childish error, highly improbable, twice repeated, thus squaring the improbability. Incredible. But that's what happened. Anyway, we took good care with the next lot of measurements. That's why we were out there so long. They were cross-checked about five times. I got sick, so I climbed into a spacesuit and went outside and took some photographs of the sun, which I hoped would help to determine hydrogen density in the outer regions. When I got back, everything was ready. We disposed ourselves about the control room and relaxed for all we were worth. We were all praying that this time nothing would go wrong and all looking forward to seeing Earth again after four months' subjective time away, except for Charlie, who was still chuckling and shaking his head, and Captain James, who was glaring at Charlie and obviously wishing human dignity permitted him to tear Charlie limb from limb. Then James pressed the button. Everything twanged like a bowstring. I felt myself turned inside out, passed through a small sieve, and poured back into shape. The entire bow wall screen was full of earth. Something was wrong, all right, and this time it was much, much worse. We'd come out of the jump about 200 miles above the Pacific, pointed straight down, traveling at a relative speed of about 2,000 miles an hour. It was a fantastic situation. Here was the whale, the most powerful ship ever built, which could cover 50 light years in a subjective time of one second, and it was helpless. For as, of course you know, the star drive couldn't be used again for at least two hours. The whale also had ion rockets, of course, the standard deuterium fusion thing with direct conversion. As again you know, this is good for interplanetary flight because you can run it continuously, and it has extremely high exhaust velocity. But in our situation, it was no good, because it has rather a low thrust. It would have taken more time than we had to deflect us enough to avoid a smash. We had five minutes to abandon ship. James got us all out into the minnow at a dead run. There was no time to take anything at all except the clothes we stood in. The minnow was meant for short, heavy hops, to planets or asteroids. In addition to the ion drive, it had emergency atomic rockets using steam for reaction mass. We thanked God for that when Casaman canceled our downward velocity with them in a few seconds. We curved our way up over China, and from about 50 miles high, we saw the whale hit the Pacific. 600 tons of mass at well over 2,000 miles an hour, makes an almighty splash. By now you'll have divers down, but I doubt they'll salvage much you can use. I wondered why James went down with the ship, as the saying is. Not that it made any difference. It must have broken his heart to know that his lovely ship was getting the chopper. Or did he suspect another human error? We didn't have time to think about that, or even to get the radio working. The steam rockets blew up. Poor Casimir was burnt to a crisp. Only thing that saved me was the spacesuit I was still wearing. I snapped the faceplate down because the cabin was filling with fumes. I saw Charlie coming out of the toilet. That's how he'd escaped and I saw him beginning to laugh. Then the port side collapsed, and I fell out. I saw the launch spinning away, glowing red against the purplish black sky. I tumbled head over heels toward the huge curved shield of earth 
fifty miles below. I shut my eyes, and that's about all I remember. I don't see how any of us could have survived. I think we're all dead. I'll have to get up and crack this suit and let some air in, but I can't. I fell fifty miles without a parachute. I'm dead, so I can't stand up. There was silence for a while, except for the vicious howl of the wind. Then snow began to shift on the ledge. A man crawled stiffly out and came shakily to his feet. He moved slowly around for some time. After about two hours, he returned to the hollow, squatted down, and switched on the recorder. The voice began again, considerably wearier. Hello there. I'm in the bleakest wilderness I've ever seen. This place makes the moon look cozy. There's precipice around me every way but one, and that's up. So it's up I'll have to go till I find a way to go down. I've been chewing snow to quench my thirst, but I could eat a horse. I picked up a shortwave broadcast on my suit, but couldn't understand a word. Not English, not French. And there I stick. Listen to it for about 15 minutes, just to hear a human voice again. I haven't much hope of reaching anyone with my five milliwatt suit transmitter, but I'll keep trying. Just before I start the climb, there are two things I want to get on tape. The first is how I got here. I've remembered something from my military training when I did some parachute jumps. Terminal velocity for a human body falling through air is about 120 mph. Falling 50 miles is no worse than falling 500 feet. You'd be lucky to live through a 500-foot fall, true, but I've been lucky. The suit is bulky, but light, and probably slowed my fall. I hit a 60-mile-an-hour updraft this side of the mountain, skidded downhill through about a half a mile of snow, and fetched up in a drift. The suit is part worn, but still operational. I'm fine. The second thing I want to say is about the Changzai, and here it is. Watch out for them. Those jokers are dangerous. I'm not telling how, because I've got a scientific reputation to watch. You'll have to figure it out yourselves. Here are the clues. 1. The Changzai talk and laugh, but after all, they aren't human. On an alien world a hundred light years away, why shouldn't alien talents develop? A talent that's so uncertain and rudimentary here that most people don't believe it might be highly developed out there. Two, the whale expedition did find till it found Chang. Then it hit a stream of bad luck. Real stinking bad luck that went on and on till it looks fishy. We lost the ship. We lost the launch. All but one of us lost our lives. We couldn't even win a game of ping pong. So what is luck, good or bad? Scientifically speaking, future chance events are by definition chance. They can turn out favorable or not. When a preponderance of chance events has occurred unfavorably, you've got bad luck. It's a fancy name for a lot of chance results that didn't go your way. But the gambler defines it differently. For him, luck refers to the future. And you've got bad luck when future chance events won't go your way. Scientific investigations into this have been inconclusive. But everyone knows that some people are lucky and others aren't. All we've got are hints and glimmers. 
the fumbling touch of a rudimentary talent. There's the evil eye legend in the Jonah bad luck bingers. Superstition? Maybe. But ask the insurance companies about accident prones. What's in a name? Call a man unlucky and you're superstitious. Call him accident prone and that's sound business sense. I've said enough. All the same, search the space flight records. Talk to the actuaries. When a ship is working perfectly and is operated by a hand-picked crew of highly trained men in perfect condition, how often is it wrecked by a series of silly airs happening one after another in defiance of probability? I'll sign off with two thoughts, one depressing and one cheering. A single Changzai wrecked our ship and our launch. What could a whole planet full of them do? On the other hand, a talent that manipulates chance events is bound to be chancy. No matter how highly developed, it can't be surefire. The proof is that I've survived to tell the tale. At 20 below zero and 50 miles an hour, the wind ravaged the mountain. Peering through his polarized visor at the white waste and the snow-filled air howling over it, sliding and stumbling with every step on a slope that got gradually steeper and seemed to go on forever. Matt Hennessy began to inch his way up the north face of Mount Everest. End of Accidental Death by Peter Bailey Recording by Penny Witt VoiceOver with P.com